Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Well, today we have a video about the Spartan army. Perhaps you have some preconceived notions of what it was like to be a Spartan soldier. Or perhaps you've gotten some ideas from film or other media that has led you to some kind of picture of the Spartan lifestyle. Well, as always on this channel, it's all about the bare reality of the situation. So, if you would like to get relaxed, perhaps close your eyes, but most importantly, get comfortable, we can begin to talk about what it was like to be in the Spartan army. In the heart of the Peloponnesian Peninsula lay the city-state of Sparta, renowned for its unique culture and most notably its formidable soldiers. Unlike many of its contemporaries, Sparta's entire society was oriented towards warfare, making military excellence not just an ambition, but the very fabric of Spartan life. This dedication to martial prowess certainly set Sparta apart, creating a legacy that endures in history and popular culture alike. Sparta's military ethos was born out of a necessity and honed by centuries of continuous brutal warfare. Situated in the region known as Laconia, Sparta was relatively isolated at least by Greek standards, bordered by formidable mountains on one side and the sea on the other. Now this geographical seclusion fostered a society that was very insular, very disciplined, and fiercely independent. The Spartan state was not just a city, but a military camp, where every aspect of life was geared towards strengthening the body and sharpening the mind for the purpose of war. From a young age, Spartan citizens, known as Spartiates, were imbued with the ethos of endurance, discipline, and, of course, loyalty, unquestionable loyalty to the state. These values were not mere abstract ideals, but they were lived daily and shaped the life of every Spartan from the cradle to the grave. The Spartan army thus was not just a fighting force, it was the culmination of a Spartan society's entire way of life, a perfect expression of its values and ideals. The roots of Spartan society and its military system can be traced all the way back to the Greek Dark Ages, following the fall of the Mycenaean civilization. It was during this tumultuous period that the foundations of what would become the Spartan state were laid. Central to Spartan society's development was the legendary lawgiver Lycurgus whose reforms in the 8th century BCE transformed Sparta into a unique polis focused on military training and communal living. 
The reforms of Lycurgus were comprehensive, and touched every aspect of Spartan life. The land was redistributed among the citizens, to prevent wealth disparities from undermining the importance of social cohesion. The famous Agoge, a rigorous education and training program, was established to mold Spartan boys into warriors, and not just normal warriors. Sparta had its mind set on creating warriors of unparalleled discipline and never-before-seen resilience. They wanted to be the best. Well, these reforms of Lycurgus were designed not just to create an efficient soldiery, but to forge a society where individual interests were subsumed under the collective good of the state. Doesn't sound very fun, doesn't it? Well, regardless, let's continue. Under the system put forth by Lycurgus, the Spartan military became a model of efficiency, discipline, and strength. The hoplite phalanx, a tightly organized infantry formation, became the hallmark of Spartan military power. I'm sure you've seen that one before. In this formation, each soldier, or as we can call them, hoplite, was equipped with a long spear and a shield, and stood shoulder to shoulder with his comrades, creating a formidable wall of shields and spears. Now this military innovation was not just a tactic, but a physical manifestation of Spartan society's core values, that being unity, discipline, and collective strength. The importance of the phalanx was the cohesion of all the people within it. If one soldier dropped his shield or spear, it could threaten the entire formation. Everyone was protecting the man next to him, and the man next to him was protecting the other man next to him. This is a play about Spartan society as a whole. Well, as Sparta evolved, its military system became increasingly sophisticated. This led to its allowance to dominate its neighbors, and eventually become a leading power in Greece. Of course, back then Greece was not just a country like we know it today, but rather a very large collection of individual city-states, each with their own cultures, some even with their own spiritual beliefs, and of course their own festivals. Notably, they would war among each other, but generally hostilities were put on hold so that everybody could enjoy the Olympic Games. But that's for another video. Well, the Spartan army's reputation was such that even the mere mention of its approach could compel adversaries to reconsider their positions. This period of Spartan ascendancy saw the city-state at the height of its power, revered and feared for its military might and the unwavering discipline of its soldiers. Now, I suppose we can look at two different kinds 
of Greek states. We can think about what we've just mentioned in Sparta. Then we can think about Athens. Now Athens were seen as a little bit more of the artistic type of Greeks. The Greeks who were into poetry and storytelling, and of course the very poignant philosophy that we have to owe to many of the ancient Greeks that we still may enjoy today. Well, while Sparta was not just a rabble of meatheads, as we can put it, they were certainly versed in intellectual things, but they had a different sense of priorities. Well, speaking of these priorities, central to understanding the composition of the Spartan army is grasping the unique social structure of Sparta itself. The society was divided into three main classes, the Spartiates, Perioke, and the Helots. The Spartiates, or full Spartan citizens, were of course right at the top of this hierarchy, and were the only members of society who were full-time soldiers, enjoying rights and privileges in return for their military service. These individuals were the heart of Spartan military power, dedicated from birth to the service of the state. The Perioke, whose name means dwellers around, were free but non-citizen inhabitants of Sparta. They lived in the surrounding regions of Laconia, and were primarily responsible for various trades and manufacturing. You know, the dirty jobs that no one really wanted to do. They were vital to the Spartan economy, of course, producing goods and conducting commerce on behalf of the Spartans, who of course were way too busy, extensively focused on military training and their own governance. And of course, we reach the bottom of the social ladder, where we meet the Helots, a class of state-owned serfs, primarily of Messenian origin, who were bound to the land and forced to work on the farms of the Spartiates. The Helots' labor provided necessary food and resources, allowing the Spartiates to dedicate their lives to military service, without having to worry about the concern for daily sustenance. Well, it was, of course, not ideal to be a Helot. Of course, you'd rather be a Spartiate, the helots were treated harshly, and of course they lived under constant surveillance and the threat of violence, a testament to the Spartans' fear of rebellion and the brutal measures they took to prevent it. Of course, you'd have to be very, very brave to rebel against the Spartans. Think about a colony of mice rebelling against a group of elephants. Hmm. It would not go as planned. This three-part social structure supported the military machinery of Sparta in several ways. The Spartiates could devote themselves entirely to warfare because the Perioke and the Helots took care of economic production 
and agriculture. This system was creating a society where every aspect, from social hierarchy to economic activity, was oriented towards maintaining and enhancing military capabilities. Now, it wasn't like you would go through your schooling and then choose to become a soldier. No, no, it all started very early. In fact, from the age of seven, that's right, seven years old, Spartan males were enrolled in the Agoge, the state-sponsored education and training regimen designed to produce physically and mentally tough super-soldiers. This system emphasized endurance, discipline, and martial prowess, stripping away individuality to forge a collective identity among the Spartan warriors. The Agoge was not merely a military boot camp, but a comprehensive program that included education in music, dance, and the Spartan values of loyalty, frugality, and of course, succinctness of speech. Of course, you know, we could not always just be fighting. They were Greeks. Yes, they were Spartans, but they were still Greeks. And Greeks had to be intelligent, not just beefcakes. Well, this does not mean that life in the Agoge was not harsh and competitive. Of course it was. Boys were grouped into agalai, or herds, and were encouraged to compete against each other in various physical and intellectual contests. They were subjected to rigorous physical training, learned survival skills out in the wilderness, and were taught to endure pain and hardship without complaint. This training also included the cryptea, a secret rite of passage that involved stealth and survival skills, reinforcing the importance of cunning and resilience. Of course, there has to be winners and losers, but it's not like our modern day where everyone gets a trophy. No, if you lost, you were a loser. And if you won, well, good job. See if you can do it again tomorrow. The lifestyle of a Spartan warrior was marked by simplicity and discipline. Spartan soldiers ate at common messes known as sisitia to foster camaraderie and equality among the soldiers. The diet was frugal, intended only to maintain physical fitness and harden the body against deprivation. Of course, the Spartans in the majority would eat something called Spartan black broth, a kind of porridge or gruel, I think the Americans call it, made from God knows what. But I can only imagine that something called Spartan black broth was not very appetizing. Luxury and personal wealth were also discouraged, as the emphasis was always on the collective well-being and readiness of the army. Military training and lifestyle were designed to eliminate weakness and to cultivate the ultimate warrior ethos, and there were no days off from that. 
Of course, this system produced soldiers who were renowned all over Greece for their discipline, loyalty, combat effectiveness, capable of facing overwhelming odds with a stoic determination. The Spartan phalanx, with its highly trained warriors, was just another testament to the effectiveness of this rigorous lifestyle and training regime. The Spartan soldiers could form up in a phalanx at the click of their fingers, and the phalanx was like the flamethrower of the ancient world, a one-stop shop for wiping the floor with your enemy. Well, this all showcases the unparalleled military might of Sparta at its zenith. The military machine was not just a testament to the power and discipline of training, but also a reflection on Sparta's strategic acumen and, of course, adaptability in the face of varied threats. It was not a one-size-fits-all. Of course, the phalanx was the revolutionary approach to battlefield tactics, while well, the Spartans were taught to mix it up. The Hoplites were equipped with a panoply that included a heavy shield called an aspis and a spear called a dory. They also received training and equipped themselves with a short sword, ideal for fighting in tight formations. This was called a xephos. The aspis, the shield, was not merely a defensive tool, but an integral part of the offensive capabilities of the phalanx. It was used to push against enemy lines and create openings for the spears. They were shaped in a certain way that, when lined up in a particular fashion, the spears could slip through and pierce the mid-rib of the enemy. Oof. Certainly do not want to be on the receiving end of that. Well, they got their chance to really prove their worth. The Peloponnesian War further highlighted Sparta's military prowess. Initially, Sparta struggled to counter the Athenian navy's dominance and the latter's strategic raiding of the Peloponnesian coastline. I mean, the Spartans were great in a phalanx, but you can't load up ships in a phalanx formation now, can't you? However, despite all of this, the Spartan resilience and strategic evolution became very apparent as they shifted their focus, securing alliances and resources to bolster their naval capabilities, while simultaneously searching, finding, and exploiting Athenian weaknesses through raids and sieges on land. That's right. All-out guerrilla warfare. The victory was made by any means necessary, as long as you were victorious. That was the Spartan way. Spartan victories such as the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC, where a Greek coalition led by Sparta decisively defeated the Persians, cemented its reputation for military excellence. These victories were not just triumphs of brute force, but of strategic insight, leveraging Spartan strengths against enemy vulnerabilities. Well, while the Spartan army's exploits are well documented, 
the evolution of its navy represents a fascinating aspect of Spartan military history that is often overlooked. The necessity for a strong naval force became apparent to Sparta during the difficulties in the Peloponnesian War, as Athenian naval supremacy allowed for effective control over the Aegean Sea and the ability to supply and reinforce distant territories. And just look at Greece. You definitely need a boat. The Greeks in those times needed a boat as much as you need a car if you want to live in rural Texas or Alabama. It's the same thing. Well, recognizing the limitations of their primarily land-based strategies, the Spartans embarked on an ambitious program to build a fleet capable of challenging Athens on its own terms. Of course, Athens were counting on facing Sparta in naval engagements as much as they could, because they had the advantage. Well, the Spartans were aiming to change that. This endeavor n required not only significant resources, but a complete shift in Spartan military culture, which had always been focused on land warfare. The Spartans, however, rose to the challenge and demonstrated captivating adaptability. So proud of them, you should have seen them. The transformation of the Spartan navy was marked by several key developments. The influx of Persian gold facilitated by the diplomacy of Lysander was instrumental in expanding the fleet. Spartan shipbuilding efforts were also intensified, and training programs were established to create a cadre of skilled sailors and commanders. The Spartans' navy's growing prowess was demonstrated in a series of engagements where they employed innovative tactics, such as the use of lighter and more maneuverable ships, and the implementation of night attacks and blockades, as we said, by any means necessary. The climax of Spartan naval strategy came at the Battle of Aegos Potami, where the Spartan fleet, under the great Lysander's command, executed a surprise attack on the Athenian fleet, anchored off the coast of Aegos Potami. The destruction of the Athenian fleet in this battle was a master stroke of military strategy, effectively ending Athenian naval power and securing Spartan dominance in the war. Better luck next time, Athens. This expanded focus on the Spartan army and navy reveals a more complex picture of Spartan military history, showcasing that, while deeply rooted in tradition, it was capable of remarkable flexibility and innovation when faced with new challenges. Let's not just think of Spartans as staying in their phalanxes for the whole time. Give them a little more credit than that. The Spartan military for centuries a symbol of unparalleled discipline and effectiveness, began to see its dominance wane in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War, a very short-lived celebration. This decline was not the result of a single event, but a gradual erosion 
of the societal and military structures that had made Sparta a superpower. While well, several factors contributed to this decline, including demographic crises, economic stagnation, and the rigid adherence to traditional ways that hindered adaptation to the changing geopolitical realities. Sure, Sparta was great in the 500 BC, the 400 BCs, but the world was changing, and Sparta had to change too. Well, one of the critical blows to Spartan supremacy was the Battle of Lycra in 371 BC, where the Thebans of all people, under the command of Epaminondas, decisively defeated the Spartans. Yikes! The innovative use of a deepened phalanx and tactical maneuvers outflanked the Spartan army, illustrating that Spartan military tactics had become rather predictable and could be countered. Of course, the Thebans were most likely thinking, poor Spartans, always using the phalanx, while the Spartans were thinking, good old phalanx, nothing beats that. You must comment if you get the reference. Well, this defeat, of course, broke the morale of the Spartans. It's not easy losing, and it shattered the myth of Spartan invincibility. This was, of course, a PR nightmare for the Spartans, and it marked the beginning of the end of Spartan dominance in Greece. I dare say that when this news received the Helots, there was perhaps some conversations in the slave quarters deep into the night. The decline of Sparta was also hastened by internal challenges. The rigid social system, which had been the backbone of the Spartan military machine, began to crumble as the number of full citizens dwindled due to constant warfare and very strict citizenship requirements. Economic difficulties were exacerbated by the loss of helot labor and the inability to adapt to a changing economic landscape. Additionally, the Spartan refusal to innovate or adopt new military tactics on land rendered them increasingly ineffective in a world where warfare was always evolving. It was past the point where the Spartans could outmuscle everybody, and it had arrived at the point where the Spartans were being outsmarted. While well, during its decline, the legacy of the Spartan army remains deeply ingrained, especially in our Western culture. The Spartans are celebrated for their contributions to military strategy, discipline, and the concept of civic duty. Their ethos and way of life continue to be studied and admired, with the very term Spartan becoming synonymous with austerity, resilience, strength, and courage. The story of the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, in particular, has become a symbol of heroic resistance against overwhelming odds. And I may just say, because I know you've seen the movie, we've all 
seen the movie, and it was great. But it has to be mentioned that there were actually around 7,000 Greeks. Yes, there was a close personal guard of King Leonidas, the Spartan commander of around 300 of his bravest soldiers, who chose to stay behind and make a brave sacrifice at the hot gates, but there were many other Greeks who were involved in that battle. In fact, the film that you are no doubt familiar with of 300 and its somewhat ghastly sequel was based around a graphic novel. I can't remember the author off the top of my head. You will have to look it up yourself. My apologies. The fascination with Sparta and its military extends far beyond the ancient world, resonating through the ages as a testament to human strength and discipline. The Spartan army, with its rigorous training, communal ethos, and formidable battlefield tactics, offers a unique study in the extremes of military and social engineering. So, upon reflecting on Sparta's history, don't you think it's very clear that its military achievements were as much of a product of its societal structure as it was its tactics and strategies, hmm? Don't you think? The decline of Sparta, however, teaches valuable lessons about the importance of adaptability and the dangers of over-reliance on traditional methods in the face of changing circumstances. Perhaps we can all engage in some introspection about our own personal circumstances on those days when brute force will simply not be enough. Today, the story of Sparta challenges us to reconsider the balance between the demands of security and the values of freedom and individuality. It invites us to reflect on the costs and benefits of a society oriented towards a singular purpose, and the complexities of maintaining such a system over time. Well, in the end, the Spartan army remains a powerful symbol of what humans are capable of achieving when they unite with a common purpose. Its story is a reminder of the heights to which discipline and dedication can elevate us, and the depths to which adherence to outdated principles can lead us. As we continue to navigate the challenges of the modern world, the lessons of Sparta remain relevant as ever, inspiring us to strive for excellence while reminding us to have that need for flexibility and innovation in the face of our ever-changing world. Now, the vast majority of my viewers are from the United States. Good day to all of you from Australia. I would like to put it to you that the Spartan emphasis on this collective identity rather flies in the face of the American ideal of individuality. In fact, we may say that the American ideal of individuality is somewhat a militant force. I do believe that the way that I view American culture is that the concept of the individual within the society is a hill that the American person is willing to die on. I do think it's very important for us to have a cohesive society. But do not lose yourself in the binds that society has set for you. 
and perhaps we may remind ourselves that those in ancient times, thousands of years ago, well, they wanted to live their best lives as well. Unfortunately, many of them did not have a choice. Finally, we reflect on the Spartans, and I'd like to ask you all to appreciate the chance that you have for individuality, but take from the Spartans their discipline, their honor, and their commitment to never giving up. Look at your own challenges in life. Perhaps every now and then it's okay to go Spartan. Thank you for listening. I'm the ASMR Historian. It's once again been a pleasure. I hope you enjoy the new video format, find it relaxing and entertaining. I will see you in the next video. Good night everyone. Look after each other. The Pythia The high priestess of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi stands as a fascinating figure in ancient Greece, embodying the role of the Oracle of Delphi, also historically known as the Pythoness. Her title, Pythia, is derived from Pytho, the mythological name of Delphi, which itself is etymologically linked to the verb Puthien, meaning to rot. This nomenclature refers to the decaying body of the python, a monstrous serpent slain by Apollo himself, from which Delphi's name and Pythia's title draws its origins. Established no later than the 8th century BC, with some estimates suggesting the shrine's presence as early as 1400 BC, the Pythia emerged as the most distinguished and authoritative oracle among the Greeks by the end of the 7th century BC, maintaining her significance into the decline of paganism around the late 4th century AD. Hello everyone and welcome back to ASMR Historian. If you'd like to support the channel, head on over to my Patreon. Or, alternatively, bump me up in the algorithm with a like and a comment down below. Today's topic is the Oracle of Delphi. Without further ado, let us begin. The Delphic Oracle, under the Pythia's auspices, was celebrated as the pinnacle of religious authority, offering divine guidance and prophecies credited to Apollo's direct possession of the priestess. This possession in Greek was known as enthusiasmos. This institution not only played a pivotal role in the spiritual and political spheres of Greek society, but also underscored the Pythia's status as one of the classical world's most influential women. The oracle's operation intricately linked to the rituals and beliefs of the time, is extensively documented by a wide array of classical authors, including Aeschylus, Plato, Aristotle, and many more, highlighting its integral role in the Greek cultural landscape. 
However, despite the extensive references to the Delphic Oracle across classical literature, specific details about the Pythia's prophetic process still remain elusive. With later sources from the 1st century BC all the way to the 4th century AD, providing varied but sometimes conflicting accounts. One of the most enduring tales about the Pythia's methodology involves her entering a frenzied state, supposedly induced by mysterious vapors emanating from a chasm within the temple, during which she would utter prophecies in an ecstatic trance. These prophecies, often said to be incoherent or gibberish upon delivery, were then interpreted by the Delphic priests, who translated the oracular messages into the poetic form of dactylic hexameters, a meter often used in Greek epic poetry and associated with divine communication. This narrative of trance-induced prophecies has of course been subject to scrutiny and debate among scholars. Some critics argue against the depiction of Pythia speaking in unintelligible tongues, pointing out that the ancient sources consistently betray her as delivering prophecies in a coherent and intelligible manner, directly in her own voice. Supporting this view, Herodotus, the 5th century BC historian, describes the Pythia's prophecies being articulated in clear dactylic hexameters, suggesting a more structured and understandable process of oracular divination than the popular myth of vapors and ecstatic utterances might apply. Well, it all comes down to how much you want to believe Herodotus. The Pythia's role as the Oracle of Delphi represents a complex interplay of myth, religion, and politics. Encapsulating the profound influence of oracular divination on ancient Greek society. Her position as a revered conduit of divine wisdom underscores the sophisticated religious practices of the Greeks. While the debates surrounding her methods of prophecy highlight the evolving interpretations and understandings of one of antiquity's most enigmatic religious figures. So, how did it all begin? Where do we get this idea of the Delphic Oracle, this Pythia? Let's go all the way back to the very earliest beginning. The origins of the Delphic Oracle trace back to as early as 1400 BC, during Mycenaean Greece's Middle Period. The transformation of Delphi into a sanctuary dedicated to Apollo is believed to have occurred around the 8th century BC, marking a significant shift from its earlier worship of Gaia. This transition is closely linked with the increasing prominence of Corinth and strategic locations along the Corinthian Gulf, suggesting a broader cultural and political realignment in the region at this time. 
The most detailed early account of Delphi's inception as Apollo's shrine is found in the Homeric Hymn to Delphic Apollo, dated to roughly between 580 and 570. This narrative vividly describes Apollo's selection of his first priests from among Cretan sailors journeying to Pylos. Appearing as a dolphin, Apollo guides them to Delphi, promising a sight of abundant offerings. The sailors, transformed into his priests, follow him, their journey immortalized in song and dance, celebrating Apollo under the name Paean, a term of reverence that harks back to the early Mycenaean times. Some scholars highlight the hymn's suggestion of Cretan origins for Delphi's priesthood, a notion supported by archaeological finds of Cretan dedictions at Delphi, dating from the 8th century BC, and continuing until around 620 to 600 BC. Such evidence, alongside the hymn, suggests a significant Cretan influence on Delphi's early religious practices. Hesiod, another ancient visitor, further cements Delphi's early importance through his encounter with the site's omphalos, symbolizing its navel or center. Beyond these ancient accounts, various tales exist regarding Delphi's founding. One story, recounted by Diodorus Sicilus in the 1st century BC, tells of a goat herder named Coritas, discovering the prophetic power of a chasm into which one of his goats had unfortunately fallen into. This discovery led to the site becoming a focal point for divine inspiration, initially experienced by many, but later channeled exclusively through a designated young woman who spoke on behalf of the gods themselves. Initially, Delphi was considered sacred to earth deities like Gaia, Themis, and Phoebe, before transitioning to a sanctuary under Poseidon's Aegis, the earthquake god. The advent of Apollo as a deity of prophecy is described as a dramatic takeover with Apollo defeating Gaia's guardian serpents and then claiming Delphi for himself. This mythological narrative justifies Apollo's control over the site, suggesting a blending of old and new religious practices through the retention of Gaia's priestesses, even as Apollo's worship took precedence. The complex layering of myths and archaeological evidence paints a picture of Delphi's evolution from an earth-centered worship site to the famed Oracle of Apollo, reflecting the dynamic and multifaceted nature of ancient Greek spirituality. Especially in those early days, do remember that before the Greek Dark Ages, and for some time after, for Greek spirituality there was no one-size-fits-all. In the early traditions of the Delphic Oracle, the Pythia was a young virgin, embodying the virtues of chastity and purity, 
which were deemed essential for her sacred communion with Apollo. However, a turning point in the ritual observance occurred following a distressing incident reported by Diodorus. Echocrates, a Thessalian visitor, overcome by the beauty of the virgin oracle, abducted her and, well, did things he should not have done. This grave violation led the Delphians to revise the criteria for the Pythia's selection, stipulating henceforth that the role would be filled by an older woman, around fifty years old. Nevertheless, to maintain a connection to the tradition's origins, the woman would don the attire of a virgin, symbolizing a continuous link to the oracle's ancestral past. The role and practices of the Pythia also bear striking resemblances to shamanistic traditions. Despite the absence of direct evidence linking Delphic practices to Central Asian shamanism at the time, similarities such as the Pythia sitting atop a tripod in a cauldron, entering an ecstatic trance-like state, and producing unintelligible utterances strongly suggest a shamanic influence or parallel. Some describe a dramatic physical transformation as she inhaled intoxicating vapors through a perforated tripod. This process allegedly caused her figure to appear enlarged, her hair to stand on end, and her complexion to alter dramatically. Additionally, her physiological remains reactions included rapid heartbeats and the swelling of the bosom, culminating in a voice that transcended its human origins further deepening the enigma of the Delphic Oracle's prophetic sessions. The Oracle of Delphi was organized around that figure of the Pythia, the temple's high priestess, the boss of the whole place. From its inception, Divination at Delphi was intertwined with the natural world, initially thought to be communicated through the rustling leaves of the laurel. That was Apollo's sacred plant, by the way. The art of prophecy was attributed to the teachings of the Thrae, the winged sisters who practiced divination by lot near Parnassus suggesting an evolution from these early methods to more direct oracular pronouncements of the Pythia. Delphi hosted three sequential forms of oracles, the Chtonion, which involved receiving visions through dreams, the Cleromantion, or Oracle by Lot, and finally, the Apollonian Oracle, characterized by the Pythia's trances induced by the ethereal fumes. The introduction of Dionysian worship that's the worship of Dionysus, emphasized ecstasy and frenzy, and marked a shift towards the Pythia delivering prophecies in this brand new fashion, this trance-like state. Of course, she couldn't go into this state without breathing in the 
vapors from the chasm within the temple. Selection of the Pythia was a rather solemn affair, likely from a guild of priestesses native to Delphi, chosen for their sober life and good character. While early Pythias may have come from influential or perhaps educated backgrounds, capable of articulating prophecies in poetic form. Later selections included uneducated women, leading to simpler prose responses often reformulated by priests into hexameter. Serving as the Pythia was highly respected, offering women unprecedented social privileges, such as exemption from taxes, the right to own property, and state-provided salary and housing. At the height of its influence, Delphi might employ up to three Pythias, serving in rotation, with consultations limited to one day per month. The role of Pythia, while esteemed, was physically demanding, and believed by some, including Plutarch, to shorten a woman's life due to the intense physical and spiritual exertion required during the oracular sessions. This sacred duty placed by the Pythia at the heart of Greek religious life, and acted as a conduit between the divine and the mortal, in a role that was both revered and fraught with personal sacrifice. In the intricate hierarchy of the Delphic Oracle, several key figures played pivotal roles alongside the Pythia. Post-200 BC, the sanctuary was overseen by two priests of Apollo, responsible for more or less the entire operation. A notable figure among them was Plutarch, serving in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries CE, who provides a detailed account of the oracle's organization during his tenure. Initially, before the temple's dedication to Apollo, it is likely that there was only one single priest. These priests, selected from Delphi's leading citizens and serving for life, managed not only the oracle but also performed sacrifices during Apollo's festivals, and oversaw the Pythian games. Other important roles within the oracle include the Hosioi, the Holy Ones, and the Prophetai, the Prophet. Of course, that's where we get the English term prophet from which means one who foretells. The specific duties of the prophetai remain somewhat ambiguous. They may have interpreted or even converted the Pythia's prophecies into verse. Alternatively, it's suggested that the prophetes may might refer more broadly to any of the sanctuary's cult officials, encompassing the Pythia herself. After all, she foretells as much as anybody. The Hosioi, those holy ones, numbering five, had functions that, while not explicitly documented, were likely crucial to the oracle's operations potentially engaging in activities related to the management and execution of the oracle's divinatory practices. 
the Delphic Oracle operated under a highly structured system that bridged the divine and the mortal. The Oracle's activities were concentrated during the nine warmer months, reflecting a belief in Apollo's seasonal presence at the temple, with Dionysus taking over management during the winter months. This cycle not only highlighted the temple's dedication to both gods, but also suggests an intertwining of various ancient rituals and divine worships within the temple's practices. Before commencing her duties, the Pythia underwent significant purification rituals, including fasting, and bathing in the sacred Castalian spring, followed by drinking from the Cassatus spring, believed to enhance her connection to the divine. These were preparatory rites, culminating on the seventh day of each month, a day sacred to Apollo, and they were crucial for ensuring the Pythia was spiritually ready to serve as Apollo's vessel. Petitioners approached the temple with offerings and sacrifices, which often included a goat that was examined for auspicious signs. If deemed favorable, the consultation process moved forward with the Pythia donning a purple veil and later a white dress, symbolizing her purity and readiness to receive Apollo's messages atop a gilded tripod. The Omphala stone and golden eagles nearby signified Zeus's authority and the sacred nature of the oracle's pronouncements. The prioritization of the petitioners was determined by lot, with special considerations given to representatives from city-states or those offering significant donations. Money talks. In cases where direct communication with the Pythia was not feasible, simpler inquiries could be addressed through a system of colored beans, indicating yes or no answers. Imagine traveling all the way to Delphi, and all you got was some green beans for yes and no beans for no, red beans for no rather. My goodness, how disappointing. Throughout this process, the Delphic Oracle maintained a complex ritualistic and administrative structure that facilitated the flow of divine guidance to the Greek world. From personal advice to critical state decisions, the Oracle's influence was pervasive, underscored by deeply ingrained belief in the gods' direct involvement in human affairs. The Pythia's role, supported by a hierarchy of priests and rituals, exemplified the ancient Greek's sophisticated approach to divination, and their enduring quest for knowledge and guidance from the realm of the divine. In ancient times, individuals or groups seeking guidance from the Delphic Oracle were known as consultants, embarking on what can be likened to a four-stage shamanic journey for counsel. The Journey to Delphi The initial step involved to seek out the decision of the oracle 
often prompted by significant needs or questions. This decision set in motion the journey to Delphi, fueled by both the recognition of the oracle's ability to provide crucial insights and the accumulation of information about the process itself. Now this journey itself was not an easy one. It required considerable effort, which of course reflects the supplicant's commitment and belief to seeking the divine guidance. Well, preparation of the supplicant would come next. Upon arrival, supplicants underwent a preliminary screening by the temple priests, who determined the sincerity and the seriousness of their inquiries. This stage included rituals to frame their questions properly, offerings to the oracle, and a ceremonial procession along the sacred way, carrying laurel leaves as a symbol of their quest. Once again, the sacred plant of Apollo. This preparation aimed to refine the supplicant's inquiry and ensure a state of readiness for the divine encounter. Next up was the visit to the oracle. The core of the experience was the consultation with the Pythia herself, where supplicants entered the temple's inner sanctum, the Aditon to pose their questions. The intense preparation leading up to this moment placed the supplicant in a heightened state of awareness, conducive to receiving the prophetic revelations. While well, the final stage involved taking the oracle's advice back to the supplicant's community, or just mulling it over yourself, where it was to be enacted. The success and relevance of the oracle's guidance were ultimately judged by its applicability and the outcomes of following the divine counsel received. The Temple of Delphi, whose ruins captivate visitors today, represents a remarkable architectural lineage dating back to the 4th century BC. It is a peripteral Doric structure, renowned for its historical and spiritual significance. It stands on the foundations that trace the evolution of Delphic worship through centuries. Initially, the site hosted a 7th century BC construction, credited to the legendary architects Trophonios and Agamedes, laying the groundwork for the enduring legacy. The subsequent 6th century BC temple, known as the Temple of Alcmaeonidae, honored in Athenian family responsible for its funding after a rather devastating fire. This iteration was a Doric hexastyle edifice, featuring a 6 by 15 column arrangement that became a hallmark of its design, influencing much of what came after it. However, this temple met its demise in 373, not because of a fire, but due to a rather unfortunate earthquake, leading to its reconstruction, however, which preserved the original column pattern. Now, within the temple resided that Aditon, the sacred heart of the Delphic Oracle, where the Pythia herself delivered the prophecies. Inscribed on the temple was the maxim, 
know thyself. A philosophical command attributed to Apollo, and possibly linked to the wisdom of the seven sages of Greece. This inscription underscored the temple's role not just as a religious center, but also as a beacon of ancient wisdom and introspection. The temple's destruction in AD 390 by Emperor Theodosius I in his campaign to extinguish pagan practices marked the end for the Delphic Oracle. Don't you think it's sad? Theodosius's actions sought to erase the physical and cultural remnants of paganism, leaving the ruins of the Temple of Delphi as a silent witness to a once thriving spiritual epicenter. But was it all real? Was she really getting these divine inspirations? Well, probably not. The enigmatic inspiration of the Pythia at Delphi has indeed spurred numerous scientific inquiries. I'm sure it's raised a few eyebrows over the centuries particularly around Plutarch's observations of vapours from the Kerner spring beneath the temple, potentially influencing the Pythia's oracular state. The hypothesis that these vapours contained hallucinogenic gases, such as ethylene, has gained quite a bit of traction due to ethylene's anaesthetic properties and historical accounts describing the chamber's scent. However, the presence of ethylene, while supported by some findings, remains debated, with alternative suggestions, including methane or carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide emissions from geological chasms. Could be. The theory that the Pythia chewed oleander leaves, inhaling their smoke for prophetic trance induction, aligns with symptoms of oleander toxicity resembling those of the Pythia's divine possession. This theory is further supported by archaeological findings of an underground chamber, suggesting a method for the oleander's fumes accumulation and interaction with the Pythia. The seasonal operation of the oracle, with a hiatus during winter months, possibly due to reduced gas emissions, and the once a month consultation limit, are thought to mitigate the health impacts of the toxic gases on the Pythia. French archaeological excavations in the late 19th century, however, found no evidence of a chasm or gas-emitting fissure, challenging ancient accounts of vaporous inspirations. Subsequent studies, however, have revisited these findings, identifying geological fault lines beneath Delphi that could facilitate hydrocarbon emissions into the temple. This geological activity, alongside evidence of underground chambers and fissures, suggests a plausible mechanism for the presence of intoxicating vapors, possibly including ethylene, contributing to the Pythia's trance-like states. Well, despite the varying theories on the specific gases involved, the consensus leans towards natural geological phenomena, playing a role in the Delphic Oracle's prophetic processes. 
This intersection of geology, chemistry, and ancient ritual, well, it all culminates in a complex interplay between the natural environment and the strange spiritual practices of our ancient ancestors. Well, what do you think? Do you think that the Oracle of Delphi was really speaking with the gods? Do you really think that? Or do you think perhaps that she was simply just getting high off some fumes? I have my own opinions on it. But I don't want to ruin anybody's fun. Once again, thank you for listening. It's been such a pleasure to guide you back to the ancient world again. This evening, this morning, this afternoon, whenever it is, in your little corner of the world. I will see you in the next video. Wishing you all the best. Good night. Welcome to the channel. I'm the ASMR historian, and once again we are going to be journeying back into deep antiquity. This time we will be looking at the Greco Persian Wars. Certainly a grand conflict worthy of remembering. So please relax, sit down. Close your eyes, and we may begin. The Greco-Persian Wars, a series of conflicts that unfolded between the Greek city-states and the mighty Persian Empire, represent a watershed moment in ancient history. Spanning from 492 to 449 BC, these wars were not just battle over territory, but clashes of cultures, ideologies, and political systems. The Greek city-states, with their nascent democratic ideals and fiercely independent spirit, found themselves pitted against the vast autocratic Persian Empire, the superpower of its age which sought to bring the troublesome and fragmented region of Greece under its sway. These wars are often divided into two main phases. The first Persian invasion, which culminated in the Battle of Marathon, and the second, more ambitious invasion, led by Xerxes I, which saw the famous stand at Thermopylae, the naval battle at Salamis, and the decisive Greek victory at Plataea. Well, I'm sure that all the viewers would recognize at least one of these battles, perhaps two of them, Marathon and Thermopylae being very famous. These conflicts not only halted Persian expansion westward, but also catalyzed the development of Greek cultural and political identity, laying the groundwork for the Golden Age of Athens and the spread of Hellenistic culture. The origins of this war can be traced back to the expansionist policies of the Persian Empire under its ruler, Cyrus the Great. By the earliest 
5th century BC, Persia had established itself as the dominant power in the Near East, having conquered a vast territory that stretched from the Indus Valley all the way to the Aegean Sea. However, the western edge of the empire, where the Greek city-states of Ionia, modern-day western Turkey, was restless under Persian rule. The Ionian Greeks, culturally and politically aligned with their brethren across the Aegean, shaft under Persian domination, leading to the Ionian Revolt from 499 to 494. The revolt, though ultimately quashed by the Persians, set the stage for a wider conflict. It drew in support from mainland Greece, most notably Athens, which sent ships and troops to assist the Ionians. This intervention led by Athens incensed Darius I, the Persian king, who vowed revenge against Athens and other city-states that had supported the revolt. This vow of revenge would lead to the first Persian invasion of Greece and the mark of the beginning of a decades-long struggle between Persia and the Greek city-states. Of course, the backdrop of the Greco-Persian Wars is a rather complex tapestry of political maneuvers, alliances, and betrayals. The Greek world was not a unified entity like it is today, but rather a patchwork of city-states with their own governments, cultures, and of course, their own ambitions. The Persian Empire, on the other hand, at this time was a vast, centralized state, capable of mobilizing resources and manpower on a scale unmatched by any Greek polis. The conflict between these two very different worlds was as much a clash of a civilization's as it was a series of military engagements. So in the aftermath of this revolt, the stage was set for a conflict that would define the course of Western history. The Greco-Persian Wars would test the resilience of the Greek city-states, challenge the might of the Persian Empire, and highlight the strategic and tactical innovations that defined ancient warfare. The Persian Empire's first major foray into Greece began in 492, under the command of Mardonius, who sought to subjugate the Aegean islands and punish Athens for its role in providing support to the aforementioned Ionian Revolt. This campaign set the stage for a larger conflict to come. Mardonius's expedition, though partially successful in subduing Thrace and Macedon, ultimately suffered setbacks due to a disastrous naval loss near Mount Athos. Undeterred, Darius launched a more direct assault on Greece in 490, sending a formidable force under Datus and Artaphernes straight to the heart of the Athenian power. Their target was Eretria and Athens, those cities who had provided the most support for the Ionians. Eretria fell rather quickly, but the Persian advance met a different fate at the plains of Marathon. 
the Athenians, under the wise generalship of Miltiades, employed a bold strategy, attacking the Persian forces with a decisive charge that utilized the terrain to their advantage. Despite being outnumbered, the Greek hoplites demonstrated superior discipline and tactics. This culminated in a stunning victory that forced the Persian expeditionary force to slowly retreat. Of course, the Battle of Marathon became a legendary event in Greek history, symbolizing the possibility of victory against overwhelming odds. It also highlighted the effectiveness of the hoplite phalanx and the importance of unity among the Greek states. The marathon run by Pheidippides to Athens to announce the victory has of course been immortalized in the modern marathon race, underscoring the enduring legacy of this battle. However, the victory at Marathon did not mark the end of Persian ambitions in Greece, not by a long shot. Darius I began preparations for a larger invasion, but his death in 486 and the succession of his son Xerxes delayed these plans. Well, Xerxes, the son of Darius, spent several years building a massive invasion force, along with a more modernized navy, intent on subjugating Greece once and for all. It seems that the Persians were recovering from quite an embarrassment at Marathon. Word was spreading about that defeat, and a show of power had to be made. Of course, one needed to remind his people under his control that he was not to be messed with. Well, this period, of course, allowed for the Greeks as well, particularly Athens, to prepare for the impending conflict which they all knew was coming. Now one man from Athens, Themistocles, recognized the need for a strong navy in particular, and persuaded his fellow citizens to invest in a fleet of triremes. And just as well he did, they would become crucial in the upcoming battles, especially Salamis. This interwar period was also a time of political maneuvering, with various Greek city-states forming alliances, and others choosing to submit to Persian demands for earth and water, symbols of submission. The formation of the Hellenic League, spearheaded by Sparta and Athens, marked a significant unity among the Greek states, despite their traditional rivalries. This alliance was a testament to the shared recognition of the Persian threat and the necessity of collective defense. The Greeks had decided to put their differences aside. Well, perhaps they can get back to fighting each other once the Persians are taken care of. The preparations on both sides set the stage for a conflict of unprecedented scale, the likes the world had never seen. The Persians were determined to crush the Greeks and secure their western frontier, while the Greeks were 
more resolved to defend their autonomy and way of life. The stage was set for the second and more extensive Persian invasion of Greece, a campaign that would feature some of the most famous battles in ancient history. The second Persian invasion, orchestrated by Xerxes I, was a colossal military campaign aimed at the complete subjugation of all of Greece. In 480 BC, Xerxes amassed an army and navy so vast that Herodotus, the ancient historian, claimed that it drank the rivers dry. Modern estimates suggest the numbers were exaggerated, as Herodotus is prone to do, yet the force was undoubtedly the largest ever seen in the Greek world. The Persians repaired the bridges over the Hellespont and dug a canal through the Athos Peninsula. This showcased much of their scientific and logistical prowess and a determination to avoid past mistakes and furthermore past embarrassments. The invasion began with the crossing of the Hellespont and the slow march through Thrace and Macedon, with the Persians subjugating city-states along their path. Meanwhile, the Greeks strategized their defense at the Isthmus of Corinth, deciding to make a stand at the narrow passes of Thermopylae, and simultaneously engage the Persian navy at Artemisium. These choices highlighted the Greek strategic use of geography to counter the Persian numerical advantage, and regardless of anything blown out of proportion by Herodotus, they did indeed have a numerical advantage. But this didn't scare the Greeks. Of course, this brings us to Thermopylae, the Hot Gates, that great battle where King Leonidas of Sparta and his force of three hundred brave Spartans faced Xerxes' army. Well, we can't just credit the Spartans. They also did have 7,000 Greek allies with them, but they were still vastly unnumbered. And don't let that ruin the idea for a good movie. Well, despite the vast disparity in numbers, the Greeks held the pass for three days and inflicted heavy casualties on the very frustrated Persians. The stand at Thermopylae, though ultimately a Persian victory due to the betrayal and the encirclement of Greek forces, became a symbol of courage and sacrifice against overwhelming odds, and has its own video, as it deserves one. Go and have a look on my Greek history playlist. Well, at the same time as this, the Greek navy, leveraging the advanced design of their brand new shiny triremes, engaged the Persian fleet at Artemisium in a series of rather indecisive battles. Well, despite not achieving a clear victory, the fleet of the Greeks, under the command of the very intelligent Themistocles, demonstrated its capability to challenge the Persian navy, setting the stage for the pivotal battle of Salamis. 
After Thermopylae, Athens fell to the Persians, who sacked the city. However, the Athenians had evacuated, placing their faith in their fleet. Themistocles devised a cunning plan to lure the Persian navy into the narrow straits of Salamis, where their numerical superiority would be neutralized. The resulting naval battle was a decisive Greek victory, devastating the Persian fleet and significantly altering the course of the invasion. Xerxes, witnessing the defeat and fearing a complete loss of his navy, decided to retreat to Asia, leaving with a substantial force under Mardonius to continue his campaign. The following year, in 479, the Greek forces, now united under the Spartan general Pausanias, met and defeated the Persian army at the Battle of Plataea. This land battle, coupled with the Greek victory at Mycale, effectively ended the Persian invasion, securing Greek independence and demonstrating the effectiveness of the hoplite phalanx and the strategic acumen of the Greek commanders. The aftermath of the Greco-Persian wars marked a turning point in ancient history. The decisive Greek victories at Salamis and Plataea didn't just halt Persian westward expansion, but also established the foundation for a golden age in Athens and the rise of the Delian League, an alliance of Greek city-states led by Athens. This league was initially formed to continue the fight against Persia and to liberate Greek city-states which were still under Persian control. However, it eventually grew and evolved into an Athenian empire, showcasing yet another shift in power dynamics within the Hellenic world. The wars, of course, had profound consequences for the Persian empire as well, who were no doubt at this point feeling a little sorry for themselves. Now although Persia remained a dominant power in the Near East, the perception of its invincibility was at this point shattered. These conflicts showcased that Persian military power had a limit and it highlighted the challenges of managing a vast, multicultural empire. Xerxes' attention turned towards quelling revolts and stabilizing his realm, diminishing Persian involvement in the Aegean affairs. Culturally, the Greco-Persian wars fostered a sense of unity among the Greek city-states. Despite their frequent internal conflicts, the wars were celebrated in Greek art, drama, and literature, and became a source of national pride and a symbol of Greek valor and resistance against tyranny. The concept of democracy particularly the Athenian version, received a significant boost as the wars were seen as a victory for the free over the despot. Moreover, the wars influenced the development of Western civilization's 
foundational themes, including the clash between freedom and autocracy, the value of individual and collective bravery, and the importance of strategic intelligence and innovation. The legacy of the Greco-Persian Wars, therefore, extends far beyond their immediate military and political outcomes. They shaped philosophical, cultural, and political currents for many centuries to come. Not only a clash of empires, but a stage of remarkable individuals like Pausanias and Xerxes, Leonidas, these great characters whose actions and decisions leave us with a great story to tell. Of course, among them, King Darius and his son Xerxes of Persia stand out for their ambition to expand the empire into Greece. So frustrated with the Ionian revolt and the Athenian interference, how dare they? Xerxes, so determined to succeed where his father had not, marshaled one of the largest invasion forces that the ancient world had ever seen. Of course, on the Greek side, the figures like Miltiades, Themistocles, and of course, King Leonidas, became synonymous with bravery, strategic acumen, and of course, the defense of freedom. Miltiades' leadership during the Battle of Marathon demonstrated the effectiveness of the Greek hoplite tactics and the importance of quick, decisive action. Themistocles, the Athenian statesman, foresaw the need for a strong navy, and very good that he did. Otherwise, the victory at Salamis would have perhaps been a defeat. Think about it. How different our world would have looked if the Persians had have taken over Greece. What would we have lost? What would we have gained? It is perhaps one thing to argue whether the situation would be better or worse. But we may agree that it would certainly be very different. Of course, we can't forget about Leonidas. The brave and disciplined Leonidas, the king of Sparta, who embodied that Spartan ethos of courage and sacrifice. His stand at Thermopylae, alongside 300 Spartans and their allies against the overwhelming Persian force, to this day remains a symbol of heroic resistance. Come and take it. This act of defiance and sacrifice highlighted the Spartan commitment to Greece's freedom and set a moral example for the subsequent defense efforts inspiring the entire Hellenic world to take up arms and fight. Other notable figures include Artemisia, the queen of Halicarnassus, who fought for Persia at Salamis and was renowned for her tactical wisdom. On the Greek side, Pausanias, the Spartan general who led the Greeks to victory at Plataea, also played a crucial role in the final defeat of the Persian invaders on Greek soil. 
These individuals, through their leadership, bravery, and strategic insight, not only influenced the outcome of the Greco-Persian Wars, but left us with a lasting legacy in the face of overwhelming odds. Just before we move on, I'd just like to remind you of the elephant in the room. The film 300. Of course I won't deny that I enjoyed the film. But I enjoyed the film for what it was. A retelling of a graphic novel. I believe it was by Frank Hubert, I believe so. And indeed it was a retelling of his story. Not the real story. I'll remind you that the depiction of the Persians in this film and the graphic novel was very much one of the propaganda of the times by the Greeks. Especially the monstrous appearance and the rather flamboyant appearance of Xerxes, which, from what I hear, many contemporary Iranians found to be quite insulting. I don't blame them for taking a certain umbrage of the artistic license that was afforded to one of their greatest historical figures. So, please, separate Hollywood from the history books. Well, moving on, let's continue our retrospective on these wars. They were a crucible for military innovation, of course. The need to defend the homelands led to a lot of new ideas, especially for the Greeks. Well, the Persian military strategy at the time heavily relied on the sheer size of their forces, including infantry and cavalry from across the empire. And don't forget that navy that could project its power all the way across the Aegean Sea. However, the Greeks, particularly the two main characters, Sparta and Athens, introduced revolutionary tactics of their own, leveraging their strengths while exploiting the weaknesses of the Persians. Now the Persian army, with its mix of archers, infantry and cavalry, was designed for large-scale engagements on open terrain, where their numbers and mobility of their cavalry, flanking the sides and riding around the back to harass the enemy, could be utilized in the most effective way. Well, the Greeks, quite a contrast. The Hoplite phalanx, a tightly organized infantry formation, excelled in close combat, and were actually better at fighting when they were stuck in a corner. The Hoplite's heavy armor and long spears, combined with the very disciplined formation, made them formidable opponents in narrow passes, and the rugged terrain of Greece. Well, this is why they wiped the floor with the Persians for the first three days in Thermopylae. Now what about the naval battles? Well, you see, the naval battles of these wars, particularly at Salamis, highlighted the importance of naval power and tactical innovation. One could say that after Salamis, Themistocles was certainly a lot more popular around Athens after his suggestion of expanding the fleet 
definitely paid off. The Greeks using smaller and more maneuverable triremes were able to outflank and ram the larger Persian vessels, demonstrating the effectiveness of agility over size. Themistocles' strategy of luring the Persian navy into the narrow straits of Salamis, where their numbers actually became a disadvantage. Well, all of this marked a turning point in naval warfare that would be studied for years to come. These wars were also emphasized the importance of strategic intelligence and psychological warfare. The Greeks, understanding their numerical disadvantage, employed strategies that maximized their tactical strengths and exploited Persian overconfidence. The use of their terrain, surprise attacks, and feigning retreat were all tactics that the Greeks used to great effect. The military innovations and strategies developed during the Greco-Persian Wars had a lasting impact on ancient warfare, influencing the military thought and tactics for centuries to come. Even the Persians went back and engaged in some retrospection, I'm sure. They left an indelible mark on the cultural and political landscape of Greece and the wider ancient world. You see, in the aftermath, Athens emerged as a dominant naval power, leading to the establishment of the Delian League, which initially sought to consolidate Greek unity against further Persian aggression. This newfound Athenian dominance, however, led to the Peloponnesian War, as tensions rose with Sparta and other city-states wary of Athens' growing power and imperial ambitions. The wars also significantly influenced Greek culture, with the heroic narratives of battles enriching the oral and written traditions. Playwrights, historians, and of course artists, drew upon the stories of Marathon, Thermopylae, and Salamis, embedding the Persian wars deeply into the collective memory and identity of the Greeks. Politically, the wars accelerated the development of democratic institutions in Athens, with increased participation of the citizenry in military and civic life. The experience of collective struggle and collective victory bolstered a sense of democratic pride and identity setting a precedent for future generations in Greece and beyond. The concept of a united Hellenic identity, transcending local loyalties to face a common enemy, was a powerful legacy of the wars. Well, this legacy extends far beyond the immediate historical context, of course. These conflicts have been celebrated as the first victory of the Western world against Eastern despotism, a narrative that has shaped the East-West dichotomy, prevalent in later historical and cultural discourse. The works of Herodotus, often called the father of history, provide a comprehensive account of the wars, blending historical facts with myth and legend to capture the essence of Greek victory. Of course, the history of antiquity, depending who's writing it, often walks that 
thin line between myth and reality. The philosophical and political implications of these walls, particularly in the ideals of freedom, democracy, and resistance against tyranny, have of course resonated through the ages. These themes have been invoked in various contexts, serving as inspiration for political movements, literature, and art. The wars are seen as a triumph of democracy over autocracy, contributing to the idealization of Athens and its democratic system as the foundation to Western political thought. Reflecting on the Greco-Persian walls, it's clear that their significance extends far beyond simple military victories and defeats. The conflicts represented a clash of ideologies, a battle of civilizations. The legacy of the wars, embodied in the stories of heroism, evolution of democratic principles, and an enduring struggle for freedom, well, it continues to inspire and inform contemporary society. It reminds us of the collective power of action, and the importance of defending our core values against external threats. It highlights the capacity for human societies to unite and work together in the face of adversity. Achieving a seemingly impossible victory through courage, strategy, and innovation. Well, perhaps as we navigate the challenges of the modern world, the lessons of the Greco-Persian wars remain as relevant as ever. Offering insights into the complexities of human conflict and the potential for our own courage. And never forget our enduring quest for freedom. Well, thank you very much for listening today or tonight. Wherever you are in the world, facing whatever struggle you are facing, perhaps you can rally your courage too form up in the phalanx, utilize your terrain, you too can defeat that enemy trying to steal your freedom. I'll see you in the next video. Good night everybody. Hello everyone, welcome back. It's once again a pleasure to have you here as we explore the ancient world together. And of course today we arrive at a very deep and complex topic, that being the Peloponnesian War. Have you heard of it? Well if you haven't, by the end of the video you'll definitely know everything there is to know. So, relax, get comfortable, and we may begin. The Peloponnesian War, a titanic struggle that unfolded over 27 years, from 431 to 404 BCE 
stands as a defining episode in ancient Greek history. The monumental conflict pitted Athens, the preeminent naval power and beacon of democracy, against the might of Sparta, the unparalleled land force with its oligarchic government, each leading vast alliances that enveloped the Greek world in war. Beyond its military engagements, the war is indeed a clash of ideologies and ways of life, challenging the very foundations of what it means to be a Greek. Its scale and duration, involving nearly every Greek city-state at the time, and influencing the course of the entire Mediterranean region, further underscore the war's significance. Well, let's start right from the beginning. How did this all happen? Well, if we want to know that, we have to go all the way back to the Greco-Persian Wars. Well, we're briefly going to talk about them. But if you want to know in detail, then check out my video about the Persian Wars. The roots of the Peloponnesian War can be traced back to the aftermath of the Greco-Persian Wars, a series of conflicts that saw the Greek city-states unite together against the Persian Empire's encroachments. In the wake of these victories, Athens emerged as a formidable naval power, spearheading the formation of the Delian League, a coalition of city-states aimed at securing the Aegean Sea and deterring Persian aggression. However, Athens' leadership soon evolved into an imperial enterprise, with the city imposing its will on League members and using the collective resources to embellish itself and fortify its dominance in the Greek world. Meanwhile, Sparta, the dominant power on land, watched Athens' ascendancy with growing concern. The rivalry between Athens' democratic ideals and Sparta's strict oligarchic system mirrored the broader ideological divisions within Greece at the time, with city-states gravitating toward one camp or the other. This, of course, further polarized the Greek world. I suppose we can say there were two types of Greeks, pen-Greeks and sword-Greeks. I'm sure I don't need to tell you which one Sparta was. The establishment of the Peloponnesian League, which was led by Sparta, set the stage for a protracted conflict as mutual suspicions and the competition for hegemony over the Greek peninsula continued to intensify. Tensions escalated further through a series of diplomatic and eventually military confrontations. Notably the Corcarian dispute and the Potidaea crisis, which saw Athens and Sparta supporting opposing factions. These incidents, exacerbated by Athens' aggressive policies, such as the Megarian Decree, which imposed economic sanctions on a Spartan ally, eroded the fragile peace that was established after the Persian Wars. The increasingly hostile environment 
marked by sporadic skirmishes and proxy warfare, culminated in the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, a conflict that would test the limits of Greek unity and resilience, and of course, alter the course of history. Now before we continue, before the Persian Wars, the Greeks were fighting amongst each other. Always had done so, all the way back to the Greek Dark Ages. Well, the Persian Wars provided a brief respite for the majority of Greek states who banded together to kick out the bigger threat from the outside. But it wasn't such a strange change of pace for them to simply go back to business as usual and war with themselves among other Greeks. Of course, Greece was not what we know it to be today, not a unified country under a single Hellenic culture, but of course a series of city-states, all with their own cultures and customs, that rarely saw eye to eye. The path to the Peloponnesian War was paved with a series of provocations, strategic miscalculations, and failed diplomatic efforts that underscored the deep-seated animosity that existed between Athens and Sparta. Central to the immediate causes of the conflict was the aforementioned Megarian Decree, an Athenian embargo that banned Megara from the Athenian markets and ports. Now Sparta saw this as a direct attack on their economic livelihood, and quite rightly so, as Megara was one of their largest trading partners. Imagine if somebody were to ban the United States from trading with Mexico, for example. Where would you get all of those lovely Mexican things from, hmm? Of course you would be devastated. Well, this is kind of how Spartan felt. Citation needed. Well, this Megarian decree, often viewed as an overextension of Athenian power, was not just an economic sanction, but a political maneuver aimed at isolating and weakening Sparta's position within the Greek world. Athens knew exactly what they were doing, and using their politics struck a blow that was mightier than any phalanx. The diplomatic landscape of the period was of course marked by intense maneuvering, with both Athens and Sparta seeking to consolidate alliances and assert their influence over the neutral city-states. The shifting alliances and series of provocations, including Athens' involvement in disputes that pitted Sparta against allies, members of the Dillian League, heightened tensions, eventually to a breaking point. Well, efforts to resolve these disputes through diplomacy were repeatedly undermined by mutual distrust and the demands of hardliners on both sides, who saw war as the only means to definitively settle the struggle for supremacy. Some things never change. Have a look at our modern world. Say no more. The breakdown of peace efforts was epitomized by the failure of the so-called Thirty Years' Peace, a treaty that intended to establish a lasting detente 
between the rival coalitions. Of course, it did not go as planned. The treaty's collapse, hastened by Athens' aggressive policies, and Spartan fears of Athenian expansionism, led directly to the declaration of war. The final spark was the dispute over Potidaea, a Corinthian colony and fully-fledged member of the Delian League, where Athenian intervention prompted a Spartan ultimatum. Athens' refusal to rescind the Megarian decree, despite Sparta asking them very, very nicely, coupled with its continued support for Potidaea, well, Sparta was left with no choice, and called its allies into a war, marking the beginning of this conflict that would engulf the Greek world for over two decades. The first phase of the Peloponnesian War, known as the Archidamian War, after the Spartan king Archidamus II, was characterized by a series of invasions into Athenian territory and the latter's reliance on its naval strength. Sparta's strategy hinged on directly challenging Athens on land, hoping to bring it into a decisive battle that could exploit the Spartan superiority in hoplite warfare. Conversely, Athens, under the strategic guidance of Pericles, adopted a defensive stance, outright refusing to engage the Spartans in open battle, and instead using its naval power to raid the Peloponnesian coastline and interrupt the Spartan supply lines. In this period saw Athens grappling with a devastating plague that swept through the city in 430, drastically reducing its population and straining its resources certainly did not help the situation. The plague, which ultimately claimed the life of Pericles among thousands of others, also had a profound impact on Athens, demoralizing its citizens and weakening its military capabilities. Despite this, Athens managed to achieve several strategic victories maintaining its dominance at sea, and securing vital grain supplies from its allies. The war's early years were also marked by significant battles, including the siege of Plataea by Spartan forces, and the Athenian naval victories at Pylos and Sphacteria which resulted in the capture of Spartan hoplites. These victories, however, were not decisive enough to shift the balance of power, leading both sides to seek a respite from the conflict. The Peace of Nicias, named after the Athenian general who negotiated the treaty, ostensibly brought an end to hostilities in 421. The agreement which called for the return of territories and prisoners of war was fraught with issues and failed to address the underlying tensions between Athens and Sparta. It was a precarious peace, ultimately serving as a mere interlude in the protracted struggle for supremacy in the Greek world. The Peace of Nicias, brokered in 421, marked the precarious halt to the hostilities. Yet the peace was anything but stable. Neither side trusted the other. 
and it did not last for very long. It was against this backdrop of uneasy peace that Athens embarked on one of the most ambitious and ultimately disastrous military campaigns in its history, the Sicilian Expedition. Urged on by the charismatic and ambitious Alcibiades, the Athenians set their sights on Sicily, envisioning a campaign that would extend their empire, secure vast new resources, and check Spartan influence in the western Mediterranean. The decision to invade Sicily, particularly the powerful city-state of Syracuse, was fueled by a combination of overconfidence, strategic miscalculation, and the allure of glory and wealth. In 415, Athens dispatched their massive fleet and army to Sicily, under the command of Alcibiades, Nicias, and Lamarcus. The expedition was fraught from the outset. Shortly after their departure, Alcibiades was recalled to Athens to face charges of sacrilege. But instead of going there, he decided to turn coat and go over to Sparta, leading Nicias and Lamarcus to lead the campaign. The Athenians underestimated the resolve and the resources of Syracuse and its allies, including Sparta, which sent aid to the Sicilian city. They knew what was coming. The siege of Syracuse turned into a protracted and bloody stalemate. With the Athenians suffering heavy losses, and ultimately failing to secure a decisive victory. All in all, it was a complete waste of time, and this was affecting the soldiers' morale. The turning point came in 413, when a massive Spartan-led relief force arrived in Sicily. Things were already bad enough for the Athenians without the Spartans showing up to crash the party. In a series of fierce engagements, the Athenian forces were routed, their fleet destroyed, and the survivors, well, the ones that weren't taken prisoner, had their careers cut short. The Sicilian expedition ended in a complete disaster for Athens, significantly weakening its military strength, morale, financial resources, and of course, emboldening its enemies. The catastrophic defeat marked the beginning of the end for the Athenian dominance of the Greek world. And remember, Dear listener, you're not winning unless somebody else is losing. Anyway, the final phase of the Peloponnesian War, known as the Ionian or the Decalian War, saw a renewed and intensified conflict that would ultimately lead to Athens' downfall. Sparta, seizing the opportunity presented by Athens' failure in Sicily, forged an alliance with Persia of all people, securing financial support that enabled the construction of a powerful navy. This marked a significant strategic shift as Sparta, for all of this history, 
had relied on its superior land forces. The war then expanded into the eastern Aegean and Ionia, where many of Athens' subject states, encouraged by Spartan victories and a little bit of gold from the Persians, decided to revolt against the Athenian rule. Sparta established a more permanent garrison at Decelia in Attica, further straining Athens' resources and morale. The Athenians, despite this dire situation, weren't willing to give up quite yet. They mounted a spirited defense, achieving several naval victories that briefly stemmed the Spartan advance. However, the relentless pressure from Sparta and its allies, the ongoing financial and manpower strains and internal political turmoil weakened Athenian resolve, and thus their capability to continue the war. The decisive blow came in 405 at the Battle of Aegospotami, where the Spartan fleet, under the command of Lysander, launched a surprise attack that annihilated the Athenian navy. This defeat cut off Athens from its overseas grain supply and left it vulnerable to siege. In 404, starved and unable to fight, Athens finally decided to surrender. Well, Spartans generally did not hold too much respect for people who surrendered. Not a good way to make friends with the Spartans. The terms of surrender imposed by the Spartans on the Athenians were more than a little bit harsh. They demanded the dismantling of the walls of Athens, restricting its navy to a mere twelve ships. Twelve. Well, this effectively marked the end of the Athenian Empire. And if it wasn't the final nail in the coffin for them, I'm sure it felt like the lowering of the coffin in the hole, and having cement poured all around it. The imposition of a oligarchic regime known as the Thirty Tyrants on Athens was a final indignity that underscored the complete reversal of fortunes, for what had once been the preeminent power in the Greek world. The Ionian or Decelian War concluded the Peloponnesian War, a conflict that had ravaged the Greek world for nearly three decades, leaving a legacy of destruction, political upheaval, and a profound shift in the balance of power. Well, let's go and talk about some of the key figures that made the Peloponnesian War what it was, because history is nothing if not the sum of the parts of its characters. So this war was shaped and influenced by a number of key figures, whose personal ambitions, leaderships and strategies played pivotal roles in the course of the conflict. From Athens, Pericles stands out as the visionary statesman, who guided the city at the war's outset. His strategy of avoiding land battles with Sparta, relying instead on Athens' naval power and protective walls, 
set the tone for the early years of the conflict. However, his death from the plague in 429 left Athens without its most steadying influence. The captain of the ship was gone, and the city was plunged into a period of political infighting. Poor old Pericles must have been turning in his grave to see what Athens had become without him. Cleon, a prominent Athenian general and politician, emerged as a key figure following the death of Pericles. Known for his aggressive military stance, and his support for the democratic faction. Cleon pushed for a more offensive strategy against Sparta. His leadership at the Battle of Sphacteria resulted in a significant Athenian victory, but his later death in battle marked the end for Athens' initial military ascendancy. It did not last very long for them, didn't it? Now Alcibiades, with his complex legacy, we can say, was a charismatic and controversial leader. Initially an advocate for the Sicilian expedition, that one that went horribly for the Athenians, his subsequent defection to Sparta then Persia, and finally his return to Athens, exemplify the volatile politics of the era. Alcibiades' strategic insights were crucial in several Athenian victories upon his return, yet his ultimate failure to secure a decisive advantage underscores the limitations of individual charisma against the broader realities of conflict. Now, on the Spartan side of things, there is, of course, a few important characters we can mention. Brasidas emerged as one of Sparta's most capable commanders. His campaigns in the north of Greece, particularly his capture of Amphipolis demonstrated Spartan military prowess beyond the Peloponnese, and earned him a reputation as a hero. Unfortunately for him, his death in battle in 422 robbed Sparta of one of its most effective and beloved leaders. Lysander no doubt you've heard of him, the Spartan admiral, played a crucial role in the final phase of the war. His leadership and strategic acumen, coupled with his ability to secure Persian financial support, were instrumental in Sparta's naval victories that ultimately forced Athens into surrender. Lysander's influence extended far beyond the battlefield alone, as he played a key role in the political reorganization of Athens following its defeat. Well, what happened after the Peloponnesian War? Surely the aftermath was quite poignant, don't you think? Well, there were profound social and economic impacts on all of the Greek states, and society was reshaped in rather fundamental ways. The protracted conflict drained the resources of the warring parties, leading to the economic hardship across Greece. Some things never change. Athens, in particular, faced severe financial strains as it poured resources into maintaining its navy and fortifications. 
while the Spartan invasions of Attica devastated the agricultural base of the Athenian economy. The social fabric of the Greek city-states was also significantly affected. The war led to widespread displacement and suffering among citizens. With many Athenians crowded within the city walls during Spartan invasions, contributing to the conditions that led to the outbreak of the plague. Too many people, too much filth. Not a good combination, especially in the warm Greek sun. Imagine the smell. The loss of life, both from plague and from combat, resulted in demographic changes that would have long-lasting effects on Athenian society and the polis system more broadly. The conflict also precipitated changes in societal norms and attitudes. In Athens, the strain of war contributed to political upheaval with the radical democracy of the early war years giving way to the oligarchic rule by the thirty tyrants in the conflict's aftermath. The war's impact on the Greek economy was e equally significant. With the destruction of property, disruption of trade, and the cost of military expenditure undermining the economic foundations of many city-states. Of course, all of those smaller city-states that perhaps didn't have the resources that Sparta or Athens had, well, they had to pull their weight in the war if they were allied with Athens or Sparta, didn't they? There was no slacking, and everybody had to give a little bit more than they perhaps could afford to give. Moreover, the war exacerbated class divisions in Athens and elsewhere, as the burden of military service and the economic impacts of the war fell unevenly across society. The erosion of traditional values and the rise of cynicism and disillusionment in the war's wake marked a significant cultural shift, with implications for the development of Greek philosophy and drama. The war thus not only reshaped the political landscape of the ancient world, but also had deep and lasting effects on its social structure economies and cultural norms, changing Greece forever. Thus the conclusion of the war was heralded as a seismic shift in the Greek world. Athens, for all this time, was the preeminent naval power, but it was now left humbled and weakened, a shadow of its former self, laying in the ruins of its own city walls. The stringent terms of surrender imposed by Sparta completely decimated the city. It was never the same again. Well, Sparta, how did they do after the war? Surely they were partying and celebrating the victory, don't you think? Well, not quite. They rather found the victory somewhat pyrrhic. Its military prowess, unchallenged on land, was ill-suited to managing the complex network of alliances and dependencies that constituted the Greek world. The financial support from Persia, whilst instrumental in securing victory, also marked the beginning of Persian influence in Greek affairs, undermining the very autonomy Sparta had fought to protect. 
Moreover, despite a harsh treatment of defeated city-states, including Athens, well, that didn't go unnoticed, and it sowed the seeds of resentment and discord that would plague its leadership. Instead of being scared of the Spartans, many people instead were rather disdainful of them. No one really wanted to be under Spartan rule, because they knew exactly how they treated the Helots, their slave underclass. While the broader implications of the war were profound, it decimated the population, and Greece was not doing well economically after this for sure. The collective strength of the entirety of Hellenic culture was completely decimated. External powers certainly took note of this, and the vulnerability would be exploited by Macedon under the leadership of Philip II and later Alexander the Great. Utilizing the divisions and weaknesses brought by the Peloponnesian War, Macedon was able to achieve dominance over all of Greece, marking the end of the classical city-state era and the beginning of the Hellenistic period. The legacy of the Peloponnesian War is indeed complex, don't you think? Its most enduring account provided by the Athenian historian Thucydides, offers a meticulous and unvarnished narrative of the conflict, emphasizing the themes of power, hubris, and the tragic consequences of human folly. Thucydides' work, hailed for its analytical rigor and philosophical depth, continues to be studied through the ages not only as a historical document, but as a treatise on the nature of political power and the inevitability of conflict. The war's portrayal in subsequent historical narratives and its impact on political theory do serve to reflect its multifaceted legacy. It has been cited as a cautionary tale about the dangers of imperial overreach, the fragility of democratic institutions in the face of external threats and internal divisions, and the timeless nature of human ambition and conflict. Moreover, the conflict's examination of the moral and ethical dilemmas faced by individuals and states alike continues to resonate. The speeches and decisions of its key figures, from Pericles' funeral oration to the Melian dialogue, offer profound insights into the complexities of justice, duty, and our fragile human condition. The Peloponnesian War, through Thucydides' lens and the myriad of interpretations it has expired, remains a vital source of lessons on the conduct of war and the enduring struggle for power in the international arena. Well, what do you think? When I reflect on the Peloponnesian War, I always go back to the situation that the Greeks had faced the external threat from the Persians. Not long before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, indeed. They managed to band together to fight away the Persians. And this is a story that we all remember the Greeks for. We don't remember the Greeks for fighting amongst each other. We don't remember them for stabbing each other in the backs. 
It's not the best attribute to have to your name, don't you think? From fighting each other, to fighting together, back to fighting each other, and getting absolutely murdered by the Macedonians. Well, it all culminates into a story that is more tragedy than comedy. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, it's been a pleasure. I hope that you are enjoying the new visual format of the videos. I'm enjoying making them, as I always have, and will continue to do so. I'm the ASMR Historian. I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone. In the ancient Greek world, slavery was the norm, just as it was in other societies of the same era. Slaves were primarily employed in agricultural sectors, but their roles extended to working quarries, mines, and serving within households. There is a nuanced understanding in modern scholarship between chattel slavery, where the slaves were seen as merely property rather than part of society, and those who were bound to land, such as Thessaly's Peneste or Sparta's Helots. These groups resembled medieval serfs, adding value to the lands they were tied to, unlike chattel slaves who were completely at the mercy of their owners, who could trade, sell, or even rent them out, as they would with personal property. Hello everybody and welcome to the video. If it's your first time here, it's good to have you, and if you're returning, it's great to see you again. Today our topic is slavery in ancient Greece. So, without any further ado, get comfortable, relax a little, and we can begin. Now, first of all, we must say that studying slavery in ancient Greece presents unique challenges for historians. The records are sporadic and largely incomplete, with Athens being the primary focus of surviving accounts. There is a lack of comprehensive texts dedicated to slavery, and legal texts only mention slavery insofar as it was a source of income. Additionally, Greek literature often resorts to stereotypes, and the visual depictions fail to distinguish clearly between slaves and free craftsmen. Now with this in mind, we are going to do our best with the information that we have to provide a rather brief but general picture of what it was like to be a slave in the ancient Greek times. In the intricate tapestry of ancient Greek language, a multitude of terms were used to denote the concept of slavery, each bringing its own shades of meaning and contributing to a complex textual landscape. This diversity in terminology often leads to ambiguity in modern interpretations, especially when these terms are extracted from their original contexts some 2,000 years ago. 
In the epic narratives of Homer, Hesiod, and Theogenes of Megara, slaves were referred to as dmos, a term generally used but specifically denoting war captives, considered as spoils of war, essentially viewed as the property of their owner, a conquered people. Now, during the classical era, the term andropodon, meaning one with the feet of a man, was contrasted with tetrapodon, or quadruped, signifying livestock, to distinguish human slaves from animals. The predominant term for slaves was dolos, juxtaposed with the term for free man, Eleutheros. An archaic version of this, found in Mycenaean inscriptions, appears as Doero for male slave, or Doera for female slave, highlighting very early linguistic evidence of slavery. Now, the term doera, persisting into modern Greek, meaning work, was metaphorically extended to describe various forms of subjugation, including the dominance of cities or parental authority over offspring. The term oiketes, meaning one who lives in the house, specifically referred to household servants. Additional terms offering more nuanced understandings of slavery, contingent upon their contextual use, of course, include thereupon, meaning companion in Homeric times, as in the companionship between Patroclus and Achilles, or perhaps Meriones and Idomeneus, which evolved by the classical period to mean servant. So remember that, thereupon, meaning companion, and by the classical period, servant. Akolothos, translating to the follower, or the one who accompanies, and its diminutive form, typically used for page boys. Pais, meaning child, applied similarly to houseboy, or used derogatorily for adult slaves. Soma, literally body, used in discussions of emancipation, further illustrating the varied and context-dependent vocabulary related to slaves in ancient Greece. Now, Mycenaean society, which is really going back to the old, old times, in this society, slavery was seen as simply a fundamental aspect of the culture of a whole, as revealed by numerous tablets found in Pilos, which distinguish between the two types of slaves, the slaves of the people and the slaves of God, with the latter likely serving Poseidon. These divine slaves were unique, often mentioned by name and possessing their own land. Their status, nearly akin to that of free individuals, but just not quite there. The origins of their servitude to the deity remain a mystery. Evidence suggests that many slaves, particularly those without divine association, originated from places like Kythera, Chios, Lemnos, or even as far as Halicarnassus, likely captured through acts of piracy.
These records also highlight that relationships between slaves and free people were not uncommon, with slaves having the capability to work and own land. The primary social distinction in Mycenaean times was not between the free and enslaved, but rather their affiliation with the palace. Moving on now and transitioning to the Homeric era, we can observe a notable shift in social structures and terminology for slaves, reflecting the conditions of the Greek Dark Ages. The term for slave evolves from doero, or dolos, to demos, and in works like the Iliad, slaves are predominantly war-captured women, while the men faced ransom, or if they were very unlucky, death. The Odyssey continues to portray slaves mainly as women, serving as household servants or concubines, though it also introduces male slaves, such as the loyal swineherd Eumaeus, who is integrated into the household's core. Despite the intimate integration into the household, however, Slavery was still considered as a great dishonor, as Eumaeus himself laments the loss of virtue upon becoming a slave. Now where did it all start? Well, that's kind of hard to tell. Slavery has been around for as long as warfare and subjugation of the conquered has. The origins of slave trading in the Archaic period are therefore murky, with the 8th century BC poet Hesiod mentioning the ownership of Demoes, though their status remains ambiguous. The existence of Doloi is further confirmed by later poets and the draconian laws of the 7th century BC which permitted violence against slaves. By the time of Solon in the late 6th century BC, laws were in place that restricted the activities of slaves, marking a period where references to slavery became more frequent and its practice a lot more widespread. Now this era saw the concurrent rise of democratic processes and the expansion of slavery, highlighting a paradox within Greek history where the advancements of freedom and the institution of slavery progressed hand in hand. In ancient Greece the realm of politics was exclusively reserved for citizens and seen as the most noble of pursuits, with all other vocations being delegated to non-citizens whenever it was possible. This delineation emphasized the significance of status over the nature of one's work. Agriculture stood as the cornerstone of the Greek economy where slavery played a critical role. Even the most modest of landowners might possess one or perhaps two slaves, with the holdings of the affluent boasted scores, employed as either basic laborers or overseers. The debate continues over the extent of slave labor in agriculture, but it is widely acknowledged that rural slavery was a significant aspect of Athenian life, distinctly different from the vast slave populations on the Roman Latifundia. Mining and quarrying sectors 
also heavily relied on slave labor. With substantial numbers of slaves often rented out by wealthy individuals. For instance, the Strategos Nicias leased a thousand slaves for work in the silver mines of Laurium in Attica. The income from such an investment was of course considerable, with Xenophon noting a return of one obulus per slave per day. They were making very good money. He even proposed that Athens could enhance its citizens' welfare by purchasing a large number of slaves to be leased out, suggesting a ratio of up to three state-owned slaves per citizen. Of course, this is probably not a good idea. There's only so far you can take slavery. If the slaves begin to outnumber you, well, for obvious reasons, this could begin a few problems. Craftsmanship and trades were other areas where slaves made significant contributions. Workshops, unable to rely solely on family labor, employed a large number of slaves. For example, one shield factory of Lysias operated with 120 slaves. And the father of Demosthenes utilized the skills of 32 cutlers and 20 bed makers in his own enterprise. Of course, domestic slavery was also widespread, with the roles of slaves extending into the households of their masters. Male domestic slaves often served as stand-ins for their masters in their trades, or as companions on journeys, and in times of war. They might serve as assistants to the Hopolites. Female slaves were primarily engaged in household duties, such as cooking and weaving textiles, illustrating the diverse and integral roles slaves held in ancient Greek society across various sectors. Now, how many slaves were there? Was it one to every wealthy house? Two to every wealthy house, and one to every modest one. Well, it's a little difficult to say. Quantifying the slave population in ancient Greece is challenging due to the absence of precise consensus and the fluctuating definitions of slavery across the different periods. Athens, however is widely recognized for having the largest concentration of slaves, with estimates suggesting up to 80,000 slaves in the 5th and 6th centuries BC, averaging 3 to 4 slaves per household. Thucydides notes a significant event in the 5th century BC where 20,000 slaves, mostly artisans, deserted during the Decalia War. The minimum figure mentioned around 20,000 slaves during Demosthenes' era suggests a ratio of about one slave per Athenian family. That's a lot of slaves. A more formal attempt to tally the population was made by Demetrius Valerius between 317 and 307, who reported 21,000 citizens, 10,000 metics, or resident foreigners, and a staggering, and I must laugh, 400,000 slaves in Attica. It is, of course, no laughing matter, but, my God, to have that many slaves to that many citizens, it is really ridiculous. 
Now this figure, translating to 13 slaves per free man, is of course viewed with scepticism by some scholars, who argue that such a ratio is of course implausible given the economic indicators of the time, such as wealth distribution and food supply logistics. 400,000. Absolutely hectic. Well, literary and historical sources indicate that owning slaves was commonplace among free Athenians, and of course it was so common that it was seen as completely normal, it was simply a part of life to go down to the market, pick yourself up a shiny brand new slave. Aristophanes' depiction of impoverished peasants with several slaves, and Aristotle's definition of a household including both freed men and slaves, underscore this norm. The absence of slave ownership marked an individual as more or less impoverished, as illustrated by a crippled man in Lysias's speech pleading for a pension because he couldn't afford a slave for assistance. Comparatively, the vast slave holdings seen among the wealthiest Romans were quite rare in Greece. Instances like Manasson, a contemporary of Aristotle, with a thousand slaves, were exceptional. Even Plato, considered wealthy, owned only five slaves at his death. Only five? Can you believe it? Ownership of up to fifty slaves was deemed indicative of significant wealth. So you see that the more slaves you had, well, it was a status symbol. It makes me think that perhaps you'd rather be with a person who owns quite a few slaves. Perhaps you could blend into the background and maybe not do too much work. Or perhaps if you were to abscond in the night, they may not notice your absence. Something to think about. Well, Outside of Athens, Thucydides highlights Chios for having the highest proportional number of slaves, suggesting that the phenomenon of slavery was widespread, but varied throughout ancient Greece. This diversity in slave ownership underscores the complexity and centrality of slavery within the social and economic fabric of ancient Greek societies. So, how do you get them? How do we get so many slaves? Well, you see, the acquisition of slaves stemmed from four primary sources. Warfare, piracy, banditry, and international trade, each contributing to the slave population in different measures across various periods and regions. Let's go through a few of them. Now first up, of course, is warfare, a significant source of slaves. The victors in battle had the right to enslave the defeated a practice that, while not systematic, was certainly widespread. For instance, here's an example. Thucydides documents the enslavement of 7,000 inhabitants of Hikara in Sicily, who were sold for 120 talents in Catania. Similarly, the populations of Olynthus, not Olympus, Olynthus, this, in 348 BC, Thebes in 335 BC by Alexander the Great, 
and Mantinea by the Achaean League were all reduced to slavery. And I mean all of them. Even the kids. Of course, they could be slaves when they grow up. The enslavement of entire cities could, of course, be contentious, leading to some cities and generals to reject the practice or negotiate accords to prohibit it, or at least reel it back a little bit. Piratry and banditry also offered a continual supply of slaves. Pirates and bandits captured individuals and sold them if ransoms were not paid, or there was nobody to contact for the ransom, of course. Certain areas, like Arcanania, Crete, and Aetolia, were notorious for such practices, with piracy described as just a traditional way of life, just another job. The role of piracy in slave trading expanded with the Roman Republic's demand for traves, slaves rather, leading to intensified piracy until the Romans curtailed it in the first century BC. Slave raids, a form of banditry, were especially prevalent in places like Thrace and the Eastern Aegean where locals were captured and sold through slave markets, which became the primary source of slaves from the 6th century BC onwards. The slave trade involved the exchange of slaves between kingdoms and states, with significant trading centers like Ephesus, Byzantium, and Tanaeus. Slaves were often war captives or victims of the aforementioned localized piracy, but some were very unfortunately sold into slavery by their own families. Imagine that. Well, evidence of the slave trade includes the specific nationalities present within the slave population. The use of ethnically descriptive names for slaves in comedies, and the strategic avoidance of concentrating too many slaves of a single nationality in one place to prevent revolts. They continued that tradition on for a very long time. You don't want them communicating, don't you? You just want them talking. The value of slaves varied based on their skills and the market demand, with prices reflecting both the abilities of the slaves and the market conditions of the time. Think supply and demand. Buyers at slave markets were also protected by guarantees against latent defects, allowing for the annulment of a sale if a slave was found to be crippled, and this had not been disclosed. The spectrum of enslavement encompassed a vast array of statuses, from full citizenship to outright chattel slavery, including intermediate categories like the penaste or the helots in Sparta, disenfranchised citizens, freedmen, bastards, and metics, resident aliens. The common denominator among these varied statuses was the lack of civic rights, painting a complex picture of social stratification. Now one expert in the field, Moses Finley, has outlined specific criteria to differentiate degrees of enslavement, focusing on various rights and possibilities, such as owning property, authority and power over others, legal rights and obligations, familial rights, the potential for social mobility, religious duties and military obligations, 
These criteria highlight the nuanced differences between the many levels of societal standings within ancient Greece. Now back to Athens. Athenian slaves considered property of their masters or the state as a whole had their lives dictated by their owners. Their owners, of course, had the authority to sell, rent, or even give them freedom. Despite the ability to form familial bonds, these relations held no legal recognition, leaving families vulnerable to separation at the master's whim. The judicial system offered slaves fewer rights than citizens, obviously, with their testimonies often admissible only under torture, a reflection of their loyalty to their masters. So if your master was charged with something, you would be brought in and they would not believe you because of course you wouldn't you wouldn't tell the truth you would lie to protect your master so the next step would be to put you on the rack or whatever other torture device they would have now despite this harsh reality certain protections existed depending on the time albeit indirectly such as the ability for a master to sue for damages if a slave was mistreated, or the public's right to prosecute a master for excessive cruelty, aimed more at curbing societal violence than protecting a slave. Therefore, the Greeks maintained complex laws regarding the treatment of slaves including the prohibition of their execution without a trial, reflecting a societal concern for maintaining order and preventing the escalation of crimes that could harm the community as a whole. Regardless if it was a slave or not, you didn't want to hear somebody screaming and being beaten. Well, that could put down the value of the neighborhood, of course, Nobody wants that, regardless of who it's being done to. Slaves were integrated into their master's household, and participated in civic and family cults, enjoying certain protections, like the right to claim asylum in temples, highlighting a degree of humane treatment not universally afforded to slaves in other ancient cultures, of which we will get to in upcoming videos. We look forward to that, don't you? While slaves were generally barred from owning property, some managed to operate businesses, or even save money. What for? Well, to buy their freedom, of course. Well, this illustrates a level of economic agency. Athens, notably, had laws protecting slaves from indiscriminate violence, and even allowed them to fight alongside freed men in critical battles, recognizing their contribution to the city-state's defense. Sexual relations and obligations for slaves were strictly regulated with severe punishments for transgressions, underscoring the control masters and the state exerted over the most personal and intimate aspects of the slaves' lives. Nonetheless, instances of compassion and justice, such as the liberation of slaves from exploitative conditions, coexisted alongside the harsher realities of their status. This intricate system of enslavement in ancient Greece reveals a society deeply entrenched in the nuances of status and rights, 
where the line between freedom and bondage was both stark and permeable. Reflecting the complexities of human relations and societal organization. Manumission, or the practice of freeing slaves, was present in Chios as early as the 6th century BC, indicating a tradition of emancipation in ancient Greece. Initially, emancipation was an oral process, requiring only witnesses and sometimes a public ceremony at places like theatres or tribunals. Athens, however, banned public emancipations in the 6th century BC to prevent disorder. Obviously, the other slaves make it a little bit jealous and have some ideas of their own freedom if they were to see it so publicly flaunted. And we couldn't have that, couldn't we? By the 4th century BC, this practice of manumission had become more widely spread, leading to the creation of inscriptions on stone at sacred sites like Delphi and Dodona, dating mainly from the 2nd and 1st centuries BC and the 1st century AD. Sometimes manumission was collective as recorded on the island of Thassos in the 2nd century BC, often as a reward for slaves' loyalty during wars, or some other kind of outstanding service. Typically, slaves had to buy their freedom, sometimes with loans from their masters or others. Emancipations often had religious aspects, with slaves sold to deities to guarantee their freedom. Though civil emancipations through magistrates were also quite common. Freed slaves could gain complete or partial freedom, with the latter sometimes involving ongoing obligations to their former masters. However, if a freed slave was sued by their former master and found innocent, they could in this way achieve complete freedom. Well, even if they did, despite gaining their freedom, emancipated slaves did not enjoy the full rights of born citizens, and were hitherto subject to various obligations, akin to the status of metics or resident foreigners, highlighting the complex nature of social mobility and freedom in ancient Greece. Now, understanding the life of Greek slaves presents us with a lot of different challenges, with their existence often described through the lens of labor, discipline, and sustenance. Aristotle advocated for a more humane treatment of slaves, akin to raising children, suggesting that slaves could comprehend and respond better to reason than to force alone. Quite a radical idea for the time, to talk to your slaves rather than just beating them. Xenophon compared the management of slaves to domestic animals, with punishment for disobedience and rewards for good behavior. A drastic departure from Aristotle's more humane ideas. Greek literature frequently depicts the harsh realities of slave life, including routine beatings, a method used alongside the control of basic needs to compel work. Scenes from Aristophanes' plays illustrate this brutality, even going so far as to mock 
the misfortunes and conditions of slaves. All of this highlights how normalized this cruelty was within society. The experiences of slaves varied widely depending on their roles. Those working in the mines of Lorion, or in brothels, faced particularly severe conditions. While public slaves and those in professions like crafting or banking had more autonomy, sometimes even managing to save enough to buy their freedom without having to take loans. The potential for emancipation served as a significant motivation for many slaves. Despite the harsh conditions, some ancient texts remark on the comparatively better condition and treatment of Attic slaves, noting that their liberties and protections against arbitrary violence. However, the mass desertion of 20,000 slaves during the Peloponnesian War indicates the limits of this perceived leniency, especially among skilled workers who were perhaps among the better treatment in the slave hierarchy. The phenomenon of slave escapes was notable enough to inspire comedy plays in ancient Greece. Yet, there's no record of large-scale revolts akin to Rome's Spartacus uprising, likely due to the dispersed nature of the slave population, which hindered collective action. Instances of individual defiance, including attempts on masters' lives, though rare, punctuate the narrative of slavery in ancient Greece, underscoring a complex picture of submission, resistance, and the human struggle for dignity and freedom. Thank you very much for listening today. What a horrible thing to learn about. Well, Unfortunately, the practice of slavery continues into our modern world. Indeed, it still exists, and is certainly an evil that we should probably do a little bit more to root out. Well, all that we can do at the moment is learn about it and be aware. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm the ASMR historian, and once again it's been a pleasure. Always is. Always will be. I will see you in the next video, where we'll have another exciting and perhaps more palatable topic. I'll see you next time. Good night, everyone. So, to begin our story of the Trojan War, we must first visit the gods, as that's where the conflict really began. Zeus, who was foreseeing his downfall, learned from Prometheus that one of his sons would overthrow him. Another prophecy predicted that a son of the sea nymph Thetis would surpass Zeus. To prevent this, Thetis was betrothed to Peleus, a human king. Eris, not invited to their wedding, threw a golden apple inscribed to the fairest. Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite all claimed it. But there was an argument over who was the fairest among the ladies, and this sparked a feud. Zeus tasked Hermes to take the goddesses to Paris, a Trojan prince, 
and he would decide who was the fairest. But behind closed doors, they bribed him, and Paris awarded the apple to Aphrodite. His reward was the most beautiful woman. Thetis and Peleus had a son, Achilles, destined for greatness or an early death. To make him immortal, Thetis attempted various methods, but Peleus intervened, possibly saving Achilles' life. Thetis then bathed him in the Styx, rendering him invulnerable except for his heel, creating the legendary Achilles heel. That's where it comes from. Achilles grew into a formidable warrior, aided by Thetis during the Trojan War by providing divine weapons forged by Hephaestus himself. Helen, renowned as the most beautiful woman, was the daughter of Tyndareus, king of Sparta, and Leda. Zeus, in the form of a swan, was said to be her father. Helen's suitors, of course, were numerous, and to avoid conflict, Odysseus proposed a solution. Tyndarus required all suitors to wear an oath to defend Helen's marriage, regardless of the choice. Suitors reluctantly agreed by swearing on the pieces of a horse. Tyndarius selected Menelaus as Helen's husband, a political choice due to his wealth and power. Menelaus, who had sent his brother Agamemnon to petition for him, won the hand of Helen. However, he forgot a promised sacrifice to Aphrodite, earning her wrath. Menelaus inherited the throne of Sparta with Helen as his queen after her brothers Castor and Pollux became gods. Agamemnon, Menelaus's brother, married Helen's sister Clymenestra and reclaimed the throne of Mycenae. Paris, disguised as a diplomat, visited Sparta to bring back Helen to Troy. Eros, the god of love also known as Cupid, shot Helen with an arrow, causing her to fall in love with Paris, fulfilling Aphrodite's promise. Do remember, Aphrodite had promised that if he would choose her as the fairest and she would be rewarded the apple, he would be rewarded with the most beautiful woman. And of course, she followed through on this promise. Menelaus, Helen's husband, was unaware of what was transpiring, as he was away in Crete at the time. According to one version, Hera, still resentful over Paris's judgment, sent a storm that redirected the lovers to Egypt. There, gods replaced Helen with cloud-made likeness Nephele. This tale, credited to the poet Stestacorus, contrasts with Homer's view that Helen in Troy was the same throughout. Of course, it's mythology. The story is bound to change. So, the ship then landed in Sidon, where Paris spent time resting and recouping before sailing to Troy. Paris's abduction of Helen had precedence in Greek mythology, such as Io, Europa, Media, and Hesion. 
Paris, influenced by these examples, expected little to no consequences for taking a wife from Greece. Perhaps he was thinking he'd get a stern talking to from his father, but the charming Helen would eventually win everybody over. According to Homer, Menelaus and Odysseus went to Troy to diplomatically retrieve Helen, but their efforts were in vain. Menelaus then sought help from his brother Agamemnon to enforce the oath of Helen's suitors. Agamemnon agreed and sent emissaries to call upon all Achaean kings and princes to honor their oath and join in retrieving Helen. After Menelaus's wedding, Odysseus, now married to Penelope, with a son named Telemachus, attempted to avoid the war, feigning madness and salting his fields. Palamedes exposed Odysseus's ruse by placing Telemachus in the plough's path. Odysseus, unwilling to harm his son, of course, revealed his sanity and was thus compelled to join the war. According to some accounts, Odysseus initially supported the military venture from the start, and with Nestor, the king of Pelos, travelled to recruit forces. Meanwhile, at Skiros, Achilles had a relationship with the king's daughter, Deidamia, resulting in the birth of Neopotalemus. Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Achilles' tutor, Phoenix, went to retrieve him. To conceal Achilles, his mother disguised him as a woman but he was revealed either when a horn was blown or when, disguised as merchants, he showed interest in weaponry rather than clothing and jewellery. According to Pausanias, Homer suggests that Achilles conquered Skiros as a part of the Trojan War rather than hiding there. The Achaean forces assembled at Aulis, with most suitors sending their troops, except for King Kinras of Cyprus, who despite promises sent only one real ship, led by the son of Migdalion, and forty-nine ships that were made out of clay, quite useless in battle. Idomeneus agreed to lead the Cretan contingent, but insisted on being co-commander. The final arrival was the fifteen-year-old Achilles. After a sacrifice to Apollo, a significant omen occurred. A snake emerged from the altar and consumed a sparrow and its chicks in a nearby tree turning to stone afterward. Calchas interpreted this as a sign that Troy would fall in the tenth year of the war. Now I personally don't know how to work out the fortune-telling of the ancient Greeks. I don't know how he arrived at the ten-year figure, but I'm not going to argue with him. The Achaeans, initially lost, accidentally landed in Mysia, ruled by King Telephus, son of Heracles. In a battle, Achilles wounded Telephus, leading to a prolonged unhealed wound. Seeking guidance, Telephus consulted an oracle, receiving the cryptic response that the one who wounded him 
could heal him. The Achaean fleet, facing a storm, scattered, and Achilles during this time married Deidamia in Skiros. The Achaeans regrouped in Aulis for a renowned effort. Telephus, either posing as a beggar or holding Orestes for ransom, approached Agamemnon seeking cure for his wound. Achilles initially refused, but Odysseus suggested that the spear causing the wound might also heal it. Scraps of the spear were applied to Telephus's wound, leading to his recovery. In gratitude, Telephus guided the Achaeans to the route to Troy. Some scholars view this Telephus episode as a prelude for the main Trojan War narrative, highlighting themes and events that foreshadow the larger story. Eight years after the fleet had been scattered, more than one thousand Achaean ships reconvened in Aulis. Calchas, the prophet, attributed the stagnation of winds to Artemis's anger, supposedly due to Agamemnon's boastful claim of surpassing her in hunting. To appease Artemis, Calchas suggested sacrificing Iphigenia, Agamemnon's daughter. Agamemnon officially, initially rather, resisted, but under pressure he either relented or sacrificed another in their place. Perhaps he substituted a deer. Various versions of the tale exist, with some claiming that Artemis spared Iphigenia at the last moment, transforming her into the goddess Hecate. The Achaean forces, outlined in the catalogue of ships in the Iliad's second book, comprised of contingents from various regions, including mainland Greece, the Peloponnese, Crete, and Ithaca. The fleet consisted of 1186 ships, each with 50 rowers. Different accounts offer varying force estimates, ranging from 70,000 to 130,000 men altogether. A second catalogue of ships, found in the Bibliotica, aligns with Homer's list, but may differ slightly. Some scholars debate the authenticity of Homer's catalogue, suggesting it could be an original Bronze Age document, or perhaps a later fabrication. The Iliad's second book also details Trojan allies, including the Trojans led by Hector, and various allied groups with distinct languages and culture. The Achaeans and Trojans share the same religion and culture, and their heroes communicate in the same language in the Iliad. However, this may be simply a dramatic choice for the sake of the story. Philoctetes, a friend of Heracles, inherited Heracles' bow and arrows for lighting his funeral pyre. Joining the Trojan War with seven ships, Philoctetes intended to fight for the Achaeans. However, a snake bite on either Crease Island or Tenedos led to a festering wound. Following Odysseus's advice, the Atreidae ordered Philoctetes to remain on Lemnos. During Philoctetes' absence, Medon took charge of his men. Achilles, while landing on Tenedos, 
disregarded a warning and killed Tenes, Apollo's son. Agamemnon then sent an embassy to King Priam of Troy, led by Menelaus and Odysseus. Menelaus, rather. I do apologize for my pronunciation of ancient Greek. They went to the king to request Helen's return, but the plea was ultimately rejected. Philoctetes spent a decade on Lemnos, describing a deserted island in Sophocles' tragedy, but earlier believed to be inhabited by minions, according to tradition. Calchas's prophecy caused hesitation among the Greeks to land, fearing the first to disembark would die. Protesilos, deceived by Odysseus, became the first to leap off his ship, but not the first to touch Trojan soil. Hector killed him in single combat. Achilles defeated Poseidon's son, Cygnus, in the second wave, forcing the Trojans behind their city walls. These walls were believed to be built by Poseidon and Apollo during a year of service to the Trojan king Laomedon. Protesilaus was buried on the Thracian Pish Peninsula, and his brother Podarches assumed command. The Achaeans led by Achilles and Ajax, besieged Troy for nine years. The tenth year saw a reconvening of the army, attributed by financial constraints of Thucydides. During this period, Achaeans raided Trojan allies' lands and farmed the Thracian peninsula. Troy was never fully besieged, maintaining communication with Asia Minor. Achilles and Ajax actively raided Trojan allies' lands. According to Homer, Achilles conquered numerous cities and islands, capturing territories like Lysarnas, Pedasus, Lesbos, and more. Notably, he took Briseis from Leonessus as his prize. Just a quick word on Ajax. In my country, Australia, there is a cleaning product called Ajax, and it's meant to clean grease off. The tagline for the product in question was Ajax, tough on grease. When I was young, I didn't quite understand that. I thought they only meant grease as in the dirt. But as I became older and learned about who Ajax was, I found it to be a rather clever marketing angle. Just a little interesting fact about Australia there for you. <laughs> During these raids, Achilles also captured Lycaon, son of Priam, and sold him as a slave in Lemnos. Patroclus later sold him to Aetion of Imbros, who brought him back to Troy. However, Achilles eventually killed Lycaon after the death of Patroclus. Ajax, the son of Telamon, led a campaign in the Thracian peninsula, devastating the region ruled by the Polymaster, a son-in-law of Priam. In this campaign, Ajax captured Polydorus, one of Priam's children, who was under Polymester's custody. Ajax then attacked the town of Phrygian king Teleatus, defeated him in single combat, and took his daughter Tecmesa. Additionally, Ajax hunted Trojan flocks on both Mount Ida and in the countryside. 
There are various depictions on pottery, suggesting an episode not explicitly mentioned in literary traditions. According to some artworks, Achilles and Ajax were engrossed in a board game, Petia, during the war, unaware of the surrounding battle. The Trojans took advantage of their distraction and approached, but the intervention of Athena saved the heroes from imminent danger. Odysseus tasked with bringing back grain from Thrace, returned empty-handed. When Palamedes scorned him, Odysseus, feeling slighted, challenged Palamedes to do better. Palamedes set out and successfully returned with a shipload of grain. A little embarrassing for Odysseus, no doubt. However, a long-standing grudge existed between Odysseus and Palamedes due to the latter's previous threat against Odysseus's son. In revenge, Odysseus devised a plot involving a forged incriminating letter from Priam to Palamedes and a planted gold in Palamedes' quarters. The discovery of the letter and the gold led to Palamedes being accused of treason and stoned to death by Agamemnon. Not a good way to go, that is for sure. Different accounts exist regarding the details of Palamedes' death. Some sources, including Pausanias, mention drowning, while others, like Deistus, describe a lure into a well and then a subsequent stoning. Palamedes' father, Naupleus, sought justice, but was ultimately denied. In retaliation, Naupleus spread rumors among the Greek wives, leading many to betray their husbands. Clymptonestra, Agamemnon's wife, was particularly influenced and ended up in an affair with Aegisthus, the son of Thyestes. As the ninth year of the war neared its end, the Achaeans, exhausted and lacking supplies, mutinied and demanded to return home. Achilles, however, compelled them to stay, preventing an early departure. To address the supply issue, Agamemnon bought the wine growers, daughters of Aeneas, who possessed the abilities to produce wine, wheat and oil by touch, providing much needed relief for the army. Croesus, a priest of Apollo and father of Croesus, sought the return of his daughter from Agamemnon. Agamemnon, refusing and disrespecting Croesus, led to Apollo afflicting the Achaean army with a devastating plague. To appease Apollo and end the plague, Agamemnon was compelled to return to Croesus, but took Achilleus' concubine Briseus as compensation. Enraged by Agamemnon's actions, Achilles decided to withdraw from the war, refusing to fight any longer. Seeking intervention, Achilles asked his mother, Thetis, to plead with Zeus. In response, Zeus agreed to favor the Trojans in the absence of Achilles, the most formidable Achaean warrior. Following Achilles' withdrawal, the Achaeans initially experienced success. Both armies fully assembled for the first time since the landing. 
and a duel between Menelaus and Paris ensued. The duel ended when Aphrodite intervened, rescuing the defeated Paris from the battlefield. With the truce broken, hostilities resumed, and Diomedes distinguished himself among the Achaeans, killing Trojan hero Pandaros and nearly fatally wounding Aeneas, saved only by his mother Aphrodite. Assisted by Athena, Diomedes then inflicted wounds on the gods Aphrodite and Ares. In the subsequent days, the Trojans pushed the Achaeans back to their camp, but were halted at the Achaean wall by Poseidon. The following day, with Zeus's assistance, the Trojans breached the Achaean camp and threatened to set fire to the Achaean ships. Despite an earlier rejection, Achilles reconsidered after Hector burned Protestileus's ship. He allowed his companion, Patroclus, to enter battle wearing his armor, leading the Achaean army. Patroclus drove the Trojans back to the walls of Troy, but was killed by Hector, who seized Achilles' armor from Patroclus' body. Maddened by grief over the death of Patroclus, Achilles swore to avenge him by killing Hector. The exact nature of Achilles' relationship with Patroclus is a topic of debate. While Homer never explicitly portrays them as lovers, later Greek literature, including works by Plato and Achilles, Achilles rather, depicted them as such. But if you know anything about the ancient Greeks, you wouldn't be very surprised to find out if they were indeed romantically involved. After a reconciliation with Agamemnon and the return of Briseis, Achilles received a new set of arms crafted by the god Hephaestus and returned to the battlefield. He inflicted heavy casualties on the Trojans, nearly killing Aeneas, who was spared by Poseidon. In a divine confrontation with the river god Scamander, Achilles battled the Trojan army. Hector, deceived by Athena, remained outside the city walls, leading to a duel with Achilles. Hector was then killed, and his lifeless body was dragged by Achilles who refused to return it for burial. Despite protection from Apollo and Aphrodite, Hector's body remained unharmed. Funeral games were held in honor of Patroclus. Priam, guided by Hermes, pleaded for Hector's body, leading to a temporary truce for proper burial. The story of the Iliad concludes with Hector's funeral rites. After Hector's burial, Penthesilea, the queen, arrived. Having accidentally killed her sister Hippolyte, purified by Priam, Penthesilea fought for him and, in various versions, killed many, including Machaon, or was killed by Achilles in some other versions. Achilles was also taunted by Tersites, and responded by violently killing him. After a dispute, Achilles sailed to Lesbos, seeking purification from Odysseus. 
during Achilles' absence, Memnon of Ethiopia, wearing armor similar to Achilles, aided Priam. Memnon killed Antilochus, leading to a battle with Achilles. Zeus decided their fate, favoring Achilles, who slew Memnon. Achilles then pursued the Trojans into their city. The gods, displeased with Achilles for killing too many of their offspring, decided it was time for him to die. Achilles met his end when Paris shot a poisoned arrow guided by Apollo, and yes, it hit him in the heel. In another version, he was killed by a knife to the back, or possibly a knife to the heel, by Paris while marrying Polyxena, Priam's daughter, in the temple of the Thimbraean Apollo. Both versions emphasize the lack of valor in the killer, asserting that Achilles remained undefeated on the battlefield. Achilles' bones were mingled with those of Patroclus, and funeral games were held in his honor. In a mythical representation, like Ajax, Achilles is said to continue living after death on the island of Luke, in the mouth of the Danube River. After the death of Achilles, a fierce battle raged around his body. Ajax defended it against the Trojans, while Odysseus carried Achilles' body away. When it came time to decide who should receive Achilles' armor, Agamemnon, unwilling to make the decision himself, referred the matter to the Trojan prisoners. He asked them which of the two competitors, Ajax or Odysseus, had done more harm to the Trojans. Alternatively, the Trojans and Athena were the judges, with spies sent to the walls to overhear the discussions. In one account, a girl stated that Ajax was braver because he physically carried Achilles out of the strife, while Odysseus did not. Another responded that even a woman could carry a load once a man had put it on her shoulder, but she could not fight. Pindar, on the other hand, mentioned a secret ballot among the Achaeans and in all versions the arms were ultimately awarded to Odysseus. Driven mad with grief, Ajax desired to kill his comrades, but Athena intervened, causing him to mistake cattle and herdsmen for Achaean warriors. In his frenzy, Ajax scourged two rams, thinking they were Agamemnon and Menelaus. When he came to his senses the next morning, Ajax took his own life by jumping on the sword given to him by Hector, piercing his armpit, the only vulnerable part of his body. An alternative tradition suggests that he was killed by the Trojans, who, unable to harm him directly, covered him in clay until he could no longer move and died of starvation. After ten years of war, a prophecy emerged that Troy could not fall without Heracles's bow, which was in the possession of Philoctetus on the island of Lemnos. Odysseus and Diomedes undertook a mission to retrieve Philoctetes, whose wound had healed, and Philoctetes subsequently shot and killed Paris. According to Apollodorus, 
Paris' brother Helenus and Deophobus competed for Helen's hand, with Deophobus winning. Helenus, aware of the prophecies about the fall of Troy, abandoned the city and sought refuge on Mount Ida. Under duress, Helenus revealed to the Achaeans that they could win the war by obtaining Pelops' bones, persuading Achilles' son, Neoptolemus, to fight for them, and stealing the Trojan Palladium. Following Helenus's information, the Greeks retrieved Pelops' bones and sent Odysseus to Scyros to bring Neoptolemus into the war. Disguised as a beggar, Odysseus also spied inside Troy, where he was recognized by Helen. Working with her, Odysseus and Diomedes later stole the Palladium, a sacred image believed to protect Troy. The conclusion of the Trojan War involved a final strategic move orchestrated by Odysseus. He devised a plan to construct a massive hollow wooden horse, an animal sacred to the Trojans. The horse, built by Epeus and guided by Athena, was crafted from the wood of a cornel tree grove sacred to Apollo. It carried the deceptive inscription. The Greeks dedicate this thank you offering to Athena for their return home. The hollow interior of the horse was of course filled with Greek soldiers, led by Odysseus. As the Greeks executed this plan, the rest of the army burned their camp and sailed for the nearby island of Tenedos, when the Trojans discovered the apparent departure of the Greeks and found the wooden horse, well, naturally they believed that the war had concluded. In a moment of jubilation and debate over what to do with the horse, some Trojans proposed hurling it down from the rocks. Others suggested burning it, and still others argued for dedicating it to Athena. Despite warnings from Cassandra and Lacon, who were skeptical about the horse, the Trojans ultimately decided to keep it. Cassandra, gifted with the ability to prophesize by Apollo, but cursed to have people never believe her, and Lacon, who was attacked by sea serpents along with his sons, cautioned against the dangers. Of course, the Trojans indulged in a night of celebration and revelry, getting extremely drunk, all while the men inside the horse waited inside. Sinon, an Achaean spy planted among the Trojans, took advantage of the situation. At midnight, under the rising clear moon, he signaled the Achaean fleet stationed at Tenedos. The soldiers concealed within the wooden horse emerged, killed the guards, and opened the gates for the waiting Greek forces. The fall of Troy was imminent before the Trojans even knew it. The fall of the city marked a tragic and brutal end to Troy. The Achaeans, having infiltrated the city with the Trojan horse, launched a surprise attack and massacred the sleeping population. The Trojans, despite being disorganized and leaderless, fought back fiercely in the chaotic street fighting. Some defenders disguised themselves in fallen enemies' attire, launching surprise counterattacks. 
Others resorted to hurling down roof tiles and heavy objects on the rampaging attackers. The city witnessed a great massacre, and blood flew in torrents through the streets. The earth soaked with the blood of the Trojans and their allies. In the midst of the carnage, Neoptolemus killed Priam, who had sought refuge at the altar of Zeus. Menelaus killed Diophobus, Helen's husband after Paris's death and considered even killing Helen. However, he was captivated by her beauty. He spared her and took her to the ships. Ajax the Lesser assaulted Cassandra on Athena's altar, an impious act that led to the Achaeans wanting to stone him to death. Ajax fled to Athena's altar and was spared. Atentor, who had shown hospitality to Menelaus and Odysseus when they sought the return of Helen, was spared along with his family. Aeneas, carrying his father on his back, managed to flee due to his piety. The Greeks proceeded to burn the city and divide the spoils. Cassandra was awarded to Agamemnon. Neoptolemus received Andromache, Hector's wife, and Odysseus was given Hecuba, Priam's wife. In a cruel act, the Achaeans threw Hector's infant son, Astyanax, down from the walls of Troy either out of hatred or to eliminate the possibility of revenge from a surviving male heir. Additionally, they sacrificed the Trojan princess Polygena on the grave of Achilles. Aethra, Theseus's mother and one of Helen's handmaids, was rescued by her grandsons, Demophon and Achamas. Well, in 491 BC, King Darius of Persia sought acknowledgement of submission from Greek city-states, sending emissaries with a request for the symbolic offering of earth and water. While most cities complied, likely out of fear, Athens and Sparta resisted. Athens took a severe stance by putting the Persian ambassadors on trial and executing, while Sparta chose to cast them down a well. This defiance meant that both Athens and Sparta were effectively at war with the Persian Empire. In a gesture to ease tensions, Two Spartans volunteered for execution in Susa as atonement for the death of the Persian heralds. Subsequently, Darius initiated an expedition led by Datius and Aratvanes in 490 BC. The Persians first attacked Naxos and secured the submission of other Cycladic islands before besieging and destroying Etruria. The expedition then moved towards Athens, landing at Marathon Bay. The Athenians, facing a significant numerical disadvantage, confronted the Persians in the Battle of Marathon and achieved a remarkable victory. This triumph had compelled the Persian forces to retreat and return to Asia. In 486 BC, King Darius, aiming to conquer Greece, faced a setback when his province in Egypt 
began a full-scale revolt. This, of course, delayed a lot of his plans for Greece as he had to deal with this issue. Darius, however, died during preparations to quell the revolt, and his son, Xerxes, ascended to the Persian throne. Xerxes swiftly crushed the Egyptian rebellion and resumed preparations for a massive invasion of Greece. This endeavor involved ambitious projects like bridging the Hellespont and digging a canal across the isthmus of Mount Athos. By early 480 BC, Xerxes' vast army had crossed into Europe. This scared the living hell out of most of the Greek cities, and most of them submitted to Persian demands for tribute. Now just a quick note. You probably recognize the names like Xerxes and Leonidas. We've all seen the movie of 300, but do keep in mind that the film of 300 was based on the graphic novels. And while the graphic novels were based on the Battle of Thermopylae and Spartan culture in general, they are entertainment. But do not let that ruin our fun today, because the battle was indeed quite heroic, just not as fanciful as Hollywood would have us believe. Continuing back to the situation in Greece. Anticipating the conflict, Athens, under Themistocles' guidance, had been building a formidable fleet since the mid-480s BC. In 482, Athens decided to resist the Persians through naval power, although manpower limitations necessitated assistance from other Greek city-states. Xerxes, in 481, sought submission from Greek city-states, but deliberately excluded Athens and Sparta. As a response, a congress convened in Corinth in the late autumn of 481 BC, leading to the formation of a confederate alliance among Greek city-states. This alliance could send envoys and dispatch troops for joint defense, a remarkable unity considering the historical conflicts among those states. Now, listener, you must realize that the notion of Greece as a country is a uh, post-medieval invention. Indeed, back in these ancient times, Greek was made up of small independent city-states that warred as much among themselves as they did among others. However, with a power that threatened all of the Hellenic cultures, they found it better to at least attempt to work together. In the spring of 480 BC, the Congress reconvened, and a Thessalian delegation proposed that the Greeks could assemble in the narrow valley of Tempe, impeding Xerxes' advance. Responding to this situation, 10,000 hoplites were dispatched to the Vale of Tempe. However, they withdrew upon learning from Alexander I of Macedon that Xerxes could bypass the Vale through the Sarantoporo Pass, and his forces were overwhelming. Subsequently, news had arrived that Xerxes had crossed the Hellespont. Themistocles, very intelligent man by the way, proposed an alternative strategy. 
forcing Xerxes' army to pass through the narrow Thermopylae Pass in southern Greece. The Greek hoplites could block the Persian advance, while the Athenian and allied navies would obstruct the Straits of Artemisium to prevent a naval bypass. The Congress adopted this plan. In the case of a Persian breakthrough, Peloponnesian cities prepared to defend the Isthmus of Corinth, and the women and children of Athens planned a mass evacuation to the Peloponnesian city of Troezen. The Persian army advanced slowly through Thrace and Macedon, and news of their approach reached Greece in August, thanks to several Greek spies that were doing a very good job at early reconnaissance. During the Festival of Carnea, a period when military activities were forbidden by Spartan law, the Spartans were celebrating. However, recognizing the urgency, the ephors decided to send an advance expedition to block the pass at Thermopylae under King Leonidas, who took the royal bodyguard, the Hippias, consisting of three hundred men. Ah, he said the thing. Yes, indeed, this is where we get the brave three hundred of Leonidas. And just a quick note. The Spartans, during this festival of Cornea, as we said, were busy partying and having a good time. Well, the Olympics was another festival, when all of Greece ceased their military activities, and rather instead competed in the peaceful spirit of competition with one another. They could get back to the wars a little later. Anyway, Leonidas aimed to gather additional Greek soldiers along the way and await the arrival of the main Spartan army. That's right, there was an even bigger group of Spartans that were coming to reinforce. According to the legend recounted by Herodotus, and please do take Herodotus with a little grain of salt, the Spartans had consulted with the oracle at Delphi earlier in the year. The oracle's prophecy warned of the sack of Lacedaemon, or the loss of a king, a descendant of Heracles. In line with this prophecy, Leonidas, anticipating certain death due to inadequate forces for victory, selected only Spartans who had living sons for the mission. As the Spartan force, reinforced by contingents from various cities, approached Thermopylae, its numbers exceeded 7,000. Leonidas strategically camped at the middle gate, the narrowest part of the pass, where a defensive wall had been built by the Phocians. Additionally, intelligence revealed a mountain track that could potentially outflank Thermopylae, prompting Leonidas to station 1,000 Phocians on the heights to prevent such a removal. Maneuver, rather. <laughs> Excuse me. In mid-August, the Persian army, led by Xerxes, approached Thermopylae, and a council of war was convened by the Greeks, some suggesting a withdrawal to the Isthmus of Corinth, but the Phocians and Locrians vehemently opposed, advocating for the defense of Thermopylae and the summoning of more help. Leonidas was very keen on the idea. 
In fact, one could hazard to guess that after receiving this prediction from the oracle at Delphi, he was keen to make a sacrifice and write his name into the books of history, but this is just my personal conjecture. So, Leonidas had agreed to defend the narrow pass of Thermopylae. When a soldier complained about the arrows blocking out the sun, Leonidas, or possibly Dianeces, responded that it would be a favorable advantage to fight in the shade. That's right, that actually did happen. Xerxes attempted negotiation, offering the Greeks freedom, the title of friends of the Persian people, and better land for resettlement. Leonidas refused, and when Xerxes demanded the Greeks to hand over their arms, Leonidas famously replied, Molon labor, having come, take them, but it is usually pronounced as come and take it. With negotiations failing, Xerxes delayed for four days, hoping the Greeks would disperse before sending troops to initiate the inevitable battle. Now do remember that back in those days, it was better to scare your enemy instead of actually fighting them. In fact, if you made a few examples of the conquered cities before by not treating them too well if they uh, did not agree to the peace terms originally, people would generally uh, be a little bit too frightened to battle. If they were going to lose, they were frightened about what would happen to their families and the executions and the salting of their earth, and all the rest of the fun things that happen when one group conquers another. However, the Greeks were very brave, and they were keen to fight for their freedom. The size of Xerxes' army during the second invasion of Greece has been a source of contention with ancient sources providing various figures. Now, remember how I said Herodotus should be taken with a grain of salt? Well, a lot of Greek historians at that time may have made the numbers uh, a little bit inflated. Of course, if you inflate the numbers, it makes the Greek victory look a lot more impressive, don't you think? Herodotus claimed 2.6 million military personnel. And if you think that that's a big number, the poet Simonides mentioned 4 million. Modern scholars, however, consider those accounts to be very unrealistic and suggest figures ranging from 120 to 300,000 taking into account logistical capabilities, sustainabilities, and manpower constraints, that is indeed a little more realistic. Despite all the uncertainty, it is evident that Xerxes aimed for overwhelming numerical superiority, both by land and sea to ensure the success of the expedition. He didn't want to go there for nothing, didn't he? The exact number of Persian troops at Thermopylae remains unclear, and it's uncertain if the entire Persian army marched to that location, or if garrisons were left behind in Macedon and Thessaly, other occupied areas. The count of Greek forces at Thermopylae is also a subject of debate between ancient sources. Diodorus suggests 1,000 Lacedaemonians, 
and 3,000 other Peloponnesians, bringing the number to 4,000. Are you impressed with my maths? Herodotus agrees in one passage, but in another passage tells us that it was 3,100 Peloponnesians before the battle. The difference might be explained by the presence of the helots. 900 helots could account for this discrepancy. A helot was a lower class a person in Spartan society. Kind of like a peasant. The 1,000 Lacedaemonians in Diodorus's count are unclear if they include the 300 Spartans. Pausanias aligns with Herodotus, adding the Locrians, who contributed 6,000 men, for a total of around 11,200. Interestingly enough, modern historians often favor Herodotus, but they do add 1,000 Lacedaemonians and the 900 Helots, which puts them at around a estimate of 7,000 men. Disregarding Diodorus's Melians and Pausanias's Locrians. The numbers changed during the battle, with around 3,000 men remaining later on. Strategically, defending Thermopylae allowed the Greeks to maximize their forces by preventing a further Persian advance, avoiding the need for a decisive battle in the open ground. The Greeks could stay on the defensive, capitalizing on the two constricted passages, Thermopylae and Artemisium, which minimized the impact of their inferior numbers. On the other hand, the Persians, facing logistical challenges with their large army, couldn't remain stationary for long, and had to either retreat or advance, necessitating an assault on the pass of Thermopylae. That's right, the Persians were getting rather hungry, and I don't just mean for the battle. They were literally running out of food. You must remember that supplying such a large army is very, very difficult, even in our modern age. So, you must move on, get food from the places that you conquer, move to new places with new farms and new animals for you to slaughter or hunt. Staying in the same spot for a long time could mean the outbreaks of diseases or just starvation, and this generally has a pretty poor effect on morale. Tactically, Thermopylae was well suited to the Greek hoplite phalanx. The narrow pass prevented easy flanking by cavalry, and the terrain made it difficult for the lightly armoured Persian infantry to assault the phalanx. The Greeks' main vulnerability was the mountain track parallel to Thermopylae, allowing potential outflanking. Don't tell anyone. Leonidas addressed this by positioning Phocian troops to block the path, minimizing the risk of this tactic by the Persians. The pass of Thermopylae, often depicted as a narrow track along the Malian Gulf, was in fact around 100 meters wide wider than what the Greeks could fully defend against the Persian forces. The Phocians had enhanced the defences by channeling hot spring water to create a marsh, restricting the pass to a causeway narrow enough for a single chariot. This marshy terrain provided challenging for both sides, with casualties slipping beneath the mud during a Gaulish attempt to force the pass. 
The battlefield featured three constriction points, or gates, with a wall at the central gate, constructed by the Phocians in the previous century. The name Hot Gates originated from the nearby Hot Springs. The shallowness of the Malian Gulf posed difficulties for the Greek fleet during a later Gaulish invasion led by Brennus. I must say, the presence of a hot spring near the battlefield. Well, I know where I would be going after a hard day's work, if you know what I mean. I'm sure you do. The rugged terrain was, of course, unfamiliar to the Persians, and it presented challenges with torrential downpours for four months, and then of course the scorching Greek summers, limited vegetation to none at all, and all of those horrible brambles. The hillsides along the pass were covered in thick brush, providing an advantageous topographical position for King Leonidas and his men against the Persian invaders. Despite sedimentation shifting the pass inland over the years, it remains a natural defensive position, utilized by modern armies. And would you believe it, the British Commonwealth forces in World War II defended against the German invaders in 1941, quite close to the original battlefield. On the first day of the Battle of Thermopylae, Xerxes initiated the attack with 5,000 archers, but their arrows were ineffective against the Greeks' sturdy shields and helmets. Remember, the Greeks were great with their formations. They had these big shields that they could put up with their left arms, and nothing was getting through them. Now, you must remember that the shields were very heavy, but this was offset by the Greeks being very, very strong. Following this, a force of 10,000 Medes and Scythians was sent to capture the Greek defenders, who fought in front of the Phocian Wall at the narrowest point of the pass. The Greeks, organized in a standard phalanx formation, stood shoulder to shoulder, using their large shields and spears effectively. The phalanx was basically like a ancient form of a super weapon, or rather a super defensive weapon. Good old phalanx. Nothing beats that. The Persian frontal assault launched in waves of around 10,000 men, failed to break through the Greek defences. The Greeks, who were superior in valour and shield size, maintained their solid defensive phalanx, preventing the Persians from effectively engaging. Units from each Greek city fought together, and soldiers were rotated to prevent fatigue. The Greeks inflicted heavy casualties on the Medes, prompting Xerxes to attempt a second assault later that day with his elite troops, called the Immortals. Sounds pretty scary, huh? Despite their elite status, however, the Immortals faced the same fate as the Medes, and many of them did not live up to their namesake. They were unable to make any headway against the Greeks, and went home empty-handed. The Spartans in particular, employing a tactic of feigned retreat followed by a counter-attack, further frustrated the Persians. The Greek defense continued to hold strong, with only a minimal number of Spartans reportedly killed in the engagement. This also had the effect of 
lowering morale against the Persian troops, who were no doubt at this point feeling somewhat annoyed with the whole situation. So that was the first day over. But this wasn't a one-day battle. Well, on the second day of the battle, Xerxes once again sent infantry to attack the pass, assuming the Greek defenders were weakened by wounds. However, the Persians faced the same lack of success as on the previous day. Perplexed by the resilient Greek defense, Xerxes halted the assault and withdrew to his camp to engage in some introspection. Later that day, a Trachinian named Ephialtes approached Xerxes and revealed the existence of a mountain path around Thermopylae. Ephialtes, seeking a reward, offered to guide the Persian army through the path. Xerxes seized this opportunity and sent his commander, Hidarnes, potentially with an enhanced force, including what remained of the immortals, to encircle the Greeks using this mountain path. The path led from east of the Persian camp, along the ridge of Mount Anopea, behind the cliffs of the flanking pass. It branched with one path leading to Phocis, and the other down the Malian Gulf at Alpensus in Locris. At dawn on the third day, the Phocians guarding the mountain path above Thermopylae detected the Persians attempting an outflanking maneuver. The rustling of oak leaves alerted them, and surprised by the expected unexpected, rather, presence of the Persians, the Phocians quickly armed themselves. Hidarnes, leading the Persians, was possibly just as astonished to see the Phocians readying for combat as they were to see him. Ephialtes of Trachis informed Hidarnes that the Phocians were not Spartans, and the Persians opted to shoot arrows at them before bypassing and continuing their encirclement of the main Greek force. Upon learning that the Phocians had failed to hold the path, Leonidas convened a council of war at dawn. Diodorus Sicilus mentions a Persian named Tyrhastiadus, a Chimaean, warning the Greeks about all of this. While some Greeks argued for withdrawal, Leonidas decided to stay at the pass with the Spartans. When Leonidas discovered his army had been encircled, he allowed his allies to leave, and around 2,000 soldiers bravely chose to stay behind, knowing that their fate was inevitable. The Greeks marched into the open field, confronting the Persians head-on. Some contingents chose to withdraw without orders, while others were directed by Leonidas, creating uncertainty about the events. The 700 Thespians, led by General Demophilus, refused to leave and committed to the fight joined by a further 400 Thebans, and likely the Helots, who had accompanied the Spartans. The actions of Leonidas have sparked much discussion. It is often asserted that the Spartans, by not retreating, adhered to the laws of Sparta. The notions that Sparta never retreated, though, may have originated from this event. Some suggest that Leonidas, recalling the oracle's words, was determined to sacrifice his life to save Sparta. 
A widely accepted theory proposes that Leonidas chose to form a rear guard to facilitate the escape of other Greek contingents. If all the troops had retreated, the open ground beyond the pass would have been exposed to Persian cavalry attacks, while remaining at the pass would have led to encirclement and inevitable annihilation. By covering the retreat and maintaining the defense at the pass, Leonidas aimed to save more than 3,000 men who could potentially fight again in better circumstances. The role of the Thebans in all of this had sparked debate. While Herodotus suggests that they were brought as hostages to ensure Thebes' good behavior, Plutarch argues that hostages would have been sent away with the rest of the Greeks. It is more likely that these were Theban loyalists who opposed the Persian domination and joined the battle willingly. Staying to the end as they had no recourse if the Persians did conquer Boetia. The Thespians, resolute in their refusal to submit to Xerxes, faced the potential destruction of their city if the Persians took Boeotia. Yet this rationale alone does not entirely explain their decision to remain. While the rest of Thespia was successfully evacuated before the Persians arrived, the Thespians seemingly volunteered to stay in an act of self-sacrifice. This dedication appears to be a distinctive Thespian trait. As demonstrated on other occasions in later history, when Thespian forces committed themselves to fight to the death. At dawn, Xerxes performed libations, allowing the immortals time to descend the mountain before commencing his advance. A Persian force of 10,000 men, comprising of light infantry and cavalry, charged the front of the Greek formation. This time, the Greeks sallied forth from the wall to meet the Persians in a wider part of the pass, engaging in fierce combat with spears and later short swords. In this struggle, Two of Xerxes' brothers, Abrocomes and Hyperantes, fell, and Leonidas, shot down by Persian archers, also perished. The Greeks managed to take possession of Leonidas' body. As the immortals approached, the Greeks withdrew and took a stand on the hill behind the wall, the Thebans, separating from their companions, raised their hands and advanced towards the Persians. Some were slain before their surrender was accepted, and the surviving defenders fought fiercely until the end, using swords, hands, and teeth for resistance. Xerxes, ordering the tearing down of part of the wall, surrounded the hill, and the Persians rained down arrows until every last Greek was dead. In 1939, archaeologist Spiridion Marinatos excavated Thermopylae, discovering a large number of Persian bronze arrowheads at Colonos Hill. This finding altered the identification of the hill where the Greeks were thought to have died from a smaller one nearer the wall. According to Herodotus, the pass at Thermopylae was open to the Persian army at the cost of up to 20,000 Persian fatalities. The Greek 
Rear guard, on the other hand, was annihilated, with a probable loss of around 2,000 men, including those killed on the first two days of battle. Herodotus mentions a point at which 4,000 Greeks died, but considering that the Phocians, guarding the track, may not have been killed during this battle, this number is likely too high. After the Persians left, the Greeks buried their dead on the hill and erected a stone lion at Thermopylae to honor Leonidas. Forty years later, Leonidas' bones were returned to Sparta with full honors, and an annual funeral games were held in his memory. With Thermopylae now open to the Persian navy, the blockade at Artemisium by the Greek fleet became irrelevant. The naval battle of Artemisium was a tactical stalemate, and the Greek navy retreated to the Saronic Gulf to assist varying Athenian citizens to Salamis. Following Thermopylae, Persians sacked and burned Plataea and Thespiae, proceeded to the evacuated Athens and accomplished the destruction of the city. The Greeks, mainly Peloponnesians, prepared to defend the Isthmus of Corinth, demolishing the road through it and erecting a wall. Themistocles persuaded the Greeks to send a decisive victory against the Persian fleet, leading to the Battle of Salamis, where the Greek fleet destroyed much of the Persian navy. Fearing a Greek attack on the Hellespont bridges, Xerxes retreated to Asia with much of the Persian army, and a hand-picked force under Mardonius stayed to complete the conquest. The Greeks, who were under pressure from the Athenians, eventually marched on Attica, and the Battle of Plataea ensued, resulting in a decisive Greek victory. The simultaneous naval battle of Mycale saw the destruction of much of the remaining Persian fleet, reducing the threat of further invasions. While the Battle of Thermopylae is celebrated for the Greeks' heroism, it was a defeat in the context of the Persian invasion. The Greek strategy was to hold off the Persians at Thermopylae and Artemisium, intending to prevent the surrender of Boeotia and Attica. The Greek position at Thermopylae, though heavily outnumbered, was nearly impregnable, and if held a little bit longer, the Persians might have had to retreat due to lack of resources. Despite the strategic victory for the Persians, the successful retreat of the bulk of Greek troops and the heroism at Thermopylae boosted Greek morale for the rest of the war. The idea that Thermopylae was a Pyrrhic victory for the Persians is another one that is debated. Some argue that it was a successful delaying action, giving time for the Greek navy to prepare for the Battle of Salamis, but the time it bought was negligible. Others emphasize Xerxes' systematic reduction of Greek opposition in Phocis and Boeotia, attributing the gap between Thermopylae and Salamis to his own procrastination. Modern academia treatises often highlight Xerxes' success in breaching the formidable Greek position and the subsequent conquest of most of Greece, labeling Thermopylae as strategically insignificant. Thermopylae's fame 
stems from the inspirational example it set, the heroism of the doomed rear guard. The events at Thermopylae have been praised for the courageous stand against certain death. While the battle wasn't decisive, it demonstrated the advantages of training, equipment, and terrain as force multipliers. The paradigm of free men outfighting imperial subjects was seen as critical moral and cultural lesson, illustrating the strength of freedom over despotism. Greek fire was indeed a highly effective and devastating weapon used by the Eastern Roman Empire, particularly in naval warfare. Its precise composition has been the subject of much speculation and debate, as the recipe was a closely guarded secret, known only to a select few within the empire. Various substances have been proposed as potential ingredients, including pine resin, naphtha, a flammable liquid hydrocarbon, quicklime, calcium, phosphide, sulfur, and nitre, which was possibly potassium nitrate. The exact method of deployment also varied, but one common tactic was for Roman sailors to hurl ceramic grenades filled with Greek fire onto the enemy ships. Additionally, specialized tubes, known as siphons, were used to project streams of Greek fire onto enemy vessels from a distance. You start to see why they wanted to keep this such a secret, didn't you? Definitely a good weapon to have, if you're the one who has it. You certainly do not want anybody else getting a hold of this ancient superweapon. One of the most remarkable qualities of Greek fire was its ability to continue to burn even while on water, making it particularly effective in naval battles. This unique characteristic, of course, gave the Eastern Roman Navy a significant advantage over its adversaries, as rival powers attempted, but ultimately failed to replicate the substance. Also, when we mention Eastern Roman, we also may use the word Byzantine Empire or Byzantium. Greek fire played a crucial role in the defense of the Eastern Roman Empire against various enemies, including Arab fleets during the Arab-Byzantine Wars. There's that word, remember? and it contributed to the empire's naval supremacy in the Mediterranean for centuries to come. Now, despite its formidable reputation, we still have no idea how they made it, and possibly we will never know. Now, what about the name Greek fire. Where'd they get that from? Well, it's not always called Greek fire. The substance known as Greek fire was referred to by various names, such as sea fire, Roman fire, war fire, liquid fire, and sticky fire among other names such as manufactured fire. Do remember that all of these names are translated from the old Greek terms. 
These names, of course, reflected the weapon's characteristics, such as an ability to burn on water, its Byzantine origin, its military application, its liquid form, even its adhesive properties and intentional production. Of course, when we have names like sticky fire, liquid fire, then we would probably start thinking of a ancient form of napalm, that horrible invention that was given to us in our modern era. Indeed, incendiary and flaming weapons do have a long history predating the invention of Greek fire. Various sulfur, petroleum, and bitumen-based mixtures were utilized for their combustible properties. These weapons were employed by ancient civilizations, such as the Assyrians, video on them in a different playlist, who used incendiary arrows and pots containing flammable substances as early as the 9th century BC, though it's very hard to uh, perfect the incendiary arrows, a little bit of trial and error. Similar tactics were also employed in the Greco-Roman world. Thucydides, perhaps you've heard of him, that historian of ancient Greece, described the use of incendiary weaponry during the siege of Delium all the way back in 424 BC. Now that's a long time before the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern-Western Roman split. But we'll get to that later. Now Thucydides mentioned the utilization of a long tube on wheels that blew flames forward using large bellows. This demonstrates the early development and deployment of flamethrower-like devices in ancient warfare. I want you to imagine for a moment being a Arabian soldier, thinking that the Arab world with his renaissance of great thinkers really had everything figured out, until you show up and the Greeks start hitting you with the flamethrower. Definitely unexpected. Additionally, the Greco-Roman treatise, known as the Kestoi, compiled in the late 2nd or early 3rd century AD, traditionally attributed to Julius Africanus, documents a mixture that ignited when exposed to sufficient heat and intense sunlight. This mixture was used in grenades, or for nighttime attacks, showcasing further innovation in incendiary weaponry during ancient times. Now let's not try and think of a grenade in the modern sense, the pull the pin out with your teeth and count to three before you throw it. We're more talking a small ceramic pot that would break easily enough but be able to be safely stored. This is what we're talking about when we mean a ancient grenade. It's all very cool, isn't it? Well, here's a passage from Julius Africanus talking about what may have been Greek fire. And let me read it for you now. Automatic fire also by the following formula. This is the recipe. Take equal amounts of sulfur, rock salt, ashes, thunderstone, and pyrite, and pound fine in a black mortar at midday sun. Also in equal amounts of each ingredient, mix together black mulberry resin and zacinthian asphalt. 
the latter in a liquid form and free-flowing, resulting in a product that is soot-colored. Then add the asphalt, the tiniest amount of quicklime. But because the sun is at its zenith, one must pound it carefully and protect the face, for it will ignite suddenly. When it catches fire, one should seal it in some sort of copper receptacle. In this way you will have it available in a box without exposing it to the sun. If you should wish to ignite enemy armaments, you will smear it on in the evening, either on the armaments or some other object, but in secret. When the sun comes up, everything will be burned. End of the account from Julius Africanus During the reign of Byzantine Emperor Anastasius I, from 491 to 518, there is a recorded instance of the use of sulfur in naval warfare. Chronicler John Malalas reports that the emperor was advised by a philosopher named Proclus, who hailed from Athens, to utilize sulfur as a means to burn the ships of the rebel general Vitalian. However, the deployment of Greek fire, as it is commonly known, occurred around 672 AD. The chronicler Theophanes the Confessor attributes its invention to the Callinicus, also known as Callinicus, an architect originating from Heliopolis in the former province of Phoenice. This area had been conquered by Muslim forces at the time. Of course, the 7th century was uh, the Muslim uh, conquests. We'll use those words. Now, the historical account of the development of and use of Greek fire is subject to debate and uncertainty. While Theophanes the Confessor attributes its invention to Callinicos from Helios in Phoenice, there are discrepancies in the chronology and details of that story. Some historians suggest that Callinicos may have introduced an improved version of an existing weapon, rather than inventing Greek fire from scratch. Additionally, it's proposed that Greek fire could have been the result of collective efforts by chemists in Constantinople, who built upon earlier discoveries from the Alexandrian Chemical School. Constantinople, by the way, is the old name for what we now know as Istanbul in Turkey. Now, regardless of its origins, Greek fire played a crucial role in the defense of the Byzantine Empire, particularly during the Arab sieges of Constantinople near the 7th century. It was instrumental in repelling Muslim fleets and securing victories in naval battles against the Saracens. Greek fire was also used effectively in Byzantine civil wars and conflicts against raiding forces, including Rus raids on the Bosphorus and the Bulgarian War. The weapon's potency contributed significantly to the military successes of the Byzantine Empire during this period. The secrecy surrounding Greek fire was underscored by Emperor Constantine Forfinogenitus, 
who attributed its discovery to divine intervention and warned against revealing its composition. According to Constantine, the formula for Greek fire was revealed by an angel to Emperor Constantine the Great, who was instructed to use it exclusively for the defense of Christians, and only within the imperial city. Well, you can't argue with that. The legend was further reinforced by tales of divine punishment befalling those who attempted to betray the secret. Of course, despite efforts to safeguard the secret, instances occurred where the Byzantine weapon fell into the hands of enemies, such as when the Arabs captured a fire ship intact in 827, and the Bulgars seized siphons and the substance itself in 812 and 814. However, these adversaries were unable to replicate the Byzantine method of deploying Greek fire through siphons, resorting instead to alternative incendiary substances and delivery methods. Greek fire continued to be referenced in historical accounts during the 12th century, with Anna Khomeini providing a detailed description of its use in a naval battle against the Pisans in 1099. However, by the 13th century, reports of its use became a little scarce and during the Fourth Crusade siege of Constantinople in 1203, there is no conclusive evidence of Greek fire ever being deployed. Now there's a few reasons for this. One is the Empire's general disarmament leading up to the siege. Also the loss of access to key ingredients or even the gradual loss of the secret recipe over time. The accounts of Greek fire being used by the Saracens against the Crusaders during the Seventh Crusade are vividly described in the memoirs of the Lord of Joinville. This description paints a dramatic picture of the weapon, liking it to a flying dragon with a tail of fire, accompanied by thunderous noise and casting a brilliant light that illuminated the entire camp. Sounds pretty badass, doesn't it? Anyway, in the 19th century, an Armenian named Kavafian purportedly approached the Ottoman Empire with a new type of Greek fire that he claimed to have developed all by himself. Despite being asked by the government to disclose its composition, Kavafian refused, and insisted on being placed in command of its use during naval engagements. Well, after what must have been a very brief meeting by the authorities, they decided instead just to poison him. So he did not get to command all of the boats. But the imperial authorities never succeeded in uncovering the secret behind his invention. This anecdote underscores the enduring mystery, don't you think? Very intriguing. Now, the secrecy surrounding Greek fire was so stringent that not only the formula for its composition, but also the entire system required for its effective use was carefully guarded. 
This system included specialized Dromon ships designed to carry it into battle. Devices for preparing the substance, the siphons that were used to project it, and the training of the personnel responsible for its deployment. Each component of the system was known only to a select group of operators and technicians, ensuring that no single enemy could gain comprehensive knowledge of the weapon. This compartmentalization of knowledge meant that even if components of the system were captured, enemies would be unable to utilize them effectively. For example, when the Bulgarians seized Mesembria and Debeltos in 814 and captured siphons, along with quantities of the Greek fire substance, they were unable to make any use of them due to their lack of understanding of the entire system. In fact, messing around with such a substance and trying to work it out could end up in self-injury. You play with fire, you get burned. Well, all of this highlights the complexity and sophistication of the system, doesn't it? And adds another layer beyond just the substance itself. Now, how do we know about all this? Well, the information about it primarily derived from indirect sources, including references in Byzantine military manuals and accounts by historians such as Anacomeni and Western European chroniclers. These sources, however, may not always be accurate. In her work, The Alexiad, Anna Khomeini describes an incendiary weapon used by the Byzantine garrison of Dyrrhachium in 1108 against the Normans. This description is often considered to provide at least some insight into the composition or deployment of Greek fire. And here is that description. The fire is made by the following arts, from the pine and certain such evergreen trees, inflammable resin is collected. This is rubbed with sulphur and put into tubes of reed, and is blown by men using it with violent and continuous breath. Then in this manner it meets the fire on the tip and catches light and falls like a fiery whirlwind on the faces of the enemies. Ouch. The reports by Western chroniclers regarding Ignus Gracius, as it is called in Greek, are considered largely unreliable, because they indiscriminately apply the name to various types of incendiary substances. I mean, Ignis Gracius could mean anything. In reconstructing the Greek fire system, the following characteristics emerge from contemporary literary references. It burned on water, and in some interpretations, it was ignited by water. Few substances, such as sand, strong vinegar, or urine, were effective in extinguishing it, possibly due to a chemical reaction. It was a liquid substance, not a projectile, as evidenced by descriptions, and its name, liquid fire. At sea, of course, it was typically objected with a siphon, although earthenware pots or grenades filled with Greek fire or similar substances were also used. Of course, the most interesting part, and adding to the terrifying spectacle, is the sounds that resembled thunder, 
and the significant amount of smoke that the substance produced, certainly enough to make any army lose morale. So, the prevailing theory regarding the composition of Greek fire keeps evolving. We keep finding out new information about it. It's always changing. So, here's a few proposals that have been with us for a long time or even relatively new modern things. Let's go a few, through a few of them. The saltpeter theory. Initially, it was suggested that saltpeter was the main ingredient of Greek fire, kind of akin to a gunpowder. However, this theory was debunked, as saltpeter wasn't used in warfare in Europe, or the Middle East for that matter, before the 13th century. Quicklime theory. Some have proposed that the Greek fire's inextinguishable nature was due to the explosive reaction between water and quicklime. However, literary and empirical evidence seems to contradict this, as Greek fire was often poured directly onto dry surfaces. Think about it. In those naval battles, it's better to pour it directly onto the ship. Especially the, uh, the gangplanks of the ship, which makes it somewhat difficult to walk across. Calcium phosphide theory. Another proposition posited that Greek fire involved calcium phosphide which releases phosphine upon contact with water. Yet, experiments fail to reproduce Greek fire's intensity. The petroleum-based theory. Most modern scholars agree that Greek fire was based on crude or refined petroleum. Sort of like a modern napalm equivalent for the ancient world. The Byzantines had access to crude oil from the Black Sea and the Middle East. Resins were likely added to thicken the substance and increase the intensity of the flames. Arab version of Greek fire Saladin's era saw the use of an Arab version of Greek fire called naft, which also had a petroleum base with added sulfur and resins. However, any direct relation to the Byzantine formula is kind of doubtful. 16th century Italian recipe an Italian recipe from the 16th century resembled Greek fire, consisting of various ingredients, including charcoal, saltpeter, sulfur, incense, tar, camphor, and wool. However, it was intended for recreational use and might not have matched the effectiveness of Greek fire in warfare. Overall, it seems that Greek fire was likely consisted of a petroleum base with additives like resins, but its exact composition remains uncertain due to the guarded secrecy surrounding it. Now, I'm from Australia. And in Australia, we have these trees, called eucalyptus trees. The reason why Australia has so many bushfires is because these trees are incredibly flammable, much because of their resin. 
Now, I'm not saying that these trees are in Greece, as I'm fairly sure they're not. But perhaps in the future, we will have an Australian fire. Maybe I'll figure it out. Well, of course. We don't know exactly how it was made. But we do have somewhat of an idea of its methods of deployment. Of course, that was pretty obvious when people were viewing it on the battlefield. The primary method of its deployment, which distinguished it from similar substances, involved projecting it through the tube known as a siphon. This method was typically used aboard ships or during sieges. Additionally, portable projectors were reportedly invented by Emperor Leo VI. These were known as Kerisiphons. Byzantine military manuals also describe other deployment methods, such as filling jars with Greek fire and caltrops wrapped with tau soaked in the substance, which were then thrown by catapults. Pivoting cranes, known as garania, were used to pour Greek fire onto enemy ships. Very horrifying indeed. The Kerisiphones were especially designed for use in land battle and sieges, where they were employed against siege machines and defenders on the walls. Several 10th century military authors prescribe their use, and their deployment is depicted in the Polyaketia of the hero of Byzantium. Byzantine Dromons, the primary warships of the Byzantine navy, typically had a siphon installed on their prow under the forecastle. However, additional devices could also be placed elsewhere on the ship as needed. For example, during the naval confrontation with the significantly larger Rus fleet in 941, siphons were positioned amid ships and even astern on Byzantine ships. The use of tubular projectors known as siphons is well documented in contemporary sources. Anna Komeni provides a account of a beast-shaped Greek fire projector mounted to the bow of a warship during the time of Emperor Alexios I. These projectors, resembling the heads of lions or other animals made of brass or iron, had their mouths open, through which the fire was directed against the enemy creating the illusion that the beasts were spitting out fire at them. Additional sources offer insights into the composition and operation of the entire mechanism. The Wolfenbüttel manuscript describes how a furnace was built at the front of the ship with a copper vessel containing the ingredients placed on it. A bronze tube, resembling a squirt or pump, was used to spray the fiery substance at the enemy. Another account from the 11th century Ingvar's saga, called Vid Forla, describes a similar scenario where a furnace was used to heat the substance before it was sprayed through a brass or bronze tube directly at the enemy ships. Now from these sources we can arrive at some 
experimental archaeology. And indeed, drawing from these descriptions, two historians and experimental archaeologists, Maurice Byrne and John Halvin, proposed a hypothetical apparatus consisting of three main components. The first being a bronze pump to pressurize the oil, then a brazier to heat the oil, and finally a nozzle covered in bronze and mounted on a swivel. The brazier burned a linen or flax match, producing intense heat and smoke to heat the oil and dissolve the resins into a fluid mixture. The pressurized mixture was then discharged through the nozzle, ignited at its mouth by the flame source. Now, obviously, I don't have to tell you, do not try this at home. Operating such a device was hazardous due to the potential for the heated oil tank to explode under pressure. However, the modern experiments conducted by archaeologists have demonstrated the effectiveness of the design, even with the simple materials and techniques which would have been available to the Byzantines of the, the period when they were using the Greek fire. Crude oil mixed with wood resins was used, and this could achieve a flame temperature of over 1,000 degrees Celsius. That's about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans listening, and an effective range of up to 49 feet. The portable kerosiphon, also known as the hand siphon, serves as an early precursor to modern flamethrowers and is well documented in military texts from the 10th century. Emperor Leo VI is credited with inventing them, as mentioned in his Tactica. These handheld devices were recommended for use both at sea and on land, particularly against siege towers and to disrupt enemy formations. And it certainly would have caused quite a disruption indeed. Although Leo VI and later authors claimed that the substance used in the Cairo siphons was the same as that used in static devices on ships, Scholars like the aforementioned Halden and Byrne suggest that the handheld versions must have been different. They propose that the Cairo siphon was essentially a simple syringe that squirted both liquid fire, possibly unignited, and noxious substances to repel enemy troops. Illustrations from Heroes Polyakertia depict the Cairo siphon throwing ignited substances as well. Initially, Greek fire was delivered onto enemy forces using a burning cloth wrapped ball, possibly containing a flask launched by a form of light catapult. This catapult, likely a seaborne variant of the Roman light catapult or onager, had the ability of hurling light loads, weighing around six to nine kilograms, a distance of up to 450 meters. That's about 500 yards. Indeed, despite its undeniable destructive power, Greek fire did not render the Byzantine army invincible. Naval historian John Pryor noted that the Greek fire was not a ship killer, akin to the naval ram, which had largely fallen out of use by then. Should have stuck with the old-fashioned methods, perhaps. 
Greek fire, of course, had notable limitations when compared to traditional artillery. When deployed via the siphon, its range was limited, and it could only be safely used in calm seas with favorable wind conditions. Otherwise, you may be getting some Greek fire back onto yourself. Muslim navies eventually adapted to Greek fire by staying out of its effective range and using protective measures like felt or hide soaked in vinegar. Nevertheless, Greek fire remained a decisive weapon in many battles. Some historians emphasize its significance in Byzantine history, suggesting that its importance cannot be overstated. Despite its limitations, Greek fire played pivotal roles in numerous naval engagements, and contributed to the Byzantine Empire's military successes, until that one day that it was simply not enough. Alexander III, commonly known as Alexander the Great, was born in Pella, the capital of Macedon, around July 20, 356 BC. He was the son of King Philip and Olympias. Legends surrounded his birth, including his mother's dream of a thunderbolt striking her womb on the eve of her marriage to Philip. Another dream involved Philip seeing himself securing Olympia's womb with a lion-engraved seal. Ancient biographer Plutarch provided various interpretations of these dreams, suggesting that Olympias might have been pregnant before marriage, or implying Alexander's divine parentage, possibly from Zeus himself. The tales sparked debate among ancient commentators about whether Olympias herself propagated the divine parentage story. The intricate details and interpretations added to the mystique surrounding Alexander's birth and childhood. The day Alexander the Great was born was eventful in various aspects. On that day, King Philip II was preparing to besiege Potidaea in Chalcedes. He received news of his victory over General Parmenion and the Paeonian and Illyrian armies, as well as the success of his horses at the Olympic Games. Coincidentally, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, one of the Seven Wonders of the World, was reported to have burned down on the same day. A quick fact about the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. It was burned down reportedly by a man named Herostratus, who did the deed because he wanted to be famous. Subsequently, his punishment was to never have his name said ever again. I digress. Legend has it that Hegasius of Magnesia suggested the temple burned because Artemis was away attending the birth of Alexander. These stories, likely crafted during Alexander's reign, aim to enhance his image as superhuman and destined for greatness from the moment of his conception. During his early years, Alexander the Great was cared for by his nurse Lanike, sister of his future general Cleitus the Black. His education 
later involved rigorous tutoring from Leonidas, a relative of his mother, and Lysimachus of Arcanania. Following the customs of noble Macedonian youths, Alexander learned various skills, such as reading, playing the lyre, horseback riding, combat, and, of course, hunting. At the age of ten, a trader from Thessaly offered Philip a horse for thirteen talents. The horse proved difficult to mount, but Alexander, recognizing its fear of its own shadow, asked to tame it. Successfully accomplishing this task, he rather impressed Philip, who, in admiration, purchased the horse for him. Alexander named the horse Bucephalus, meaning ox head, and rode that very same horse as far as India. When Bucephalus passed away at the age of thirty, Alexander honored him by naming a city after him, Bucephala. At the age of thirteen, Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, sought a tutor for his son and considered figures like Isocrates and Seosippus. Ultimately, he chose Aristotle and provided a classroom at the Temple of the Nymphs in Mieza. In exchange for Aristotle's teachings, Philip agreed to rebuild the philosopher's hometown of Stagiera and repopulate it with freed ex-citizens. Mieza served as a boarding school for Alexander and other children of Macedonian nobles, forming a group known as the Companions. Aristotle educated them in various subjects, including medicine, philosophy, morals, religion, logic, and art. Alexander's passion for the works of Homer especially the Iliad, was cultivated under Aristotle's guidance, who gifted him an annotated copy that accompanied him throughout his campaigns in the future. During this time, Alexander developed a deep knowledge of Persian affairs through interactions with Persian exiles at the Macedonian court including Artabazos, Barsine, and Aminipades. This exposure likely influenced aspects of Macedonian state management. Additionally, Anaximenes of Lampasicus, identified as one of Alexander's teachers, reportedly accompanied him on military campaigns. At the age of 16, Alexander concluded his education under Aristotle as Philip II waged war against the Thracians. During Philip's absence, the Maedi tribe in Thrace revolted, prompting Alexander to swiftly suppress the rebellion, colonize the territory, and found the city of Alexandropolis. Subsequently, he was dispatched to address revolts in southern Thrace, saving his father's life during the campaign against Perinthus. Simultaneously, the sacrilegious actions of Amphisa near Delphi provided Philip an opportunity to intervene in Greek affairs. While Philip was occupied in Thrace, Alexander prepared an army for a campaign 
in southern Greece, creating a diversion by appearing to target Illyria. Amidst this, the Illyrians invaded Macedonia, but were repelled by Alexander. In 338 BC, Philip and Alexander joined forces, marching south through Thermopylae, capturing Elatea, and advancing towards Athens and Thebes. Athens sought alliance with Thebes against Macedonia, leading to diplomatic efforts by both sides. Philip's march on Amphisa, supposedly acting on the request of the Amphidictic League, resulted in the capture of mercenaries and the city's surrender. Despite a peace offer, Athens and Thebes rejected it, setting the stage for conflicts in the future. Marching south, Philip faced opposition near Caronea in Boeotia. The Battle of Caronea saw Philip commanding the right wing and Alexander the left. A strategic retreat by Philip drew the Athenian hoplites into disarray, allowing Alexander to break the Theban lines and initiate a successful rout. After this victory, they advanced into the Peloponnese, receiving a warm welcome in most cities. However, Sparta refused them entry, and at Corinth, Philip established a Hellenic alliance, forming the League of Corinth. Philip was named hegemon of the League, and plans were set to attack the Persian Empire. In 338, upon returning to Pella, Philip II married Cleopatra Eurydice, creating uncertainty for Alexander's heir status. It's not the Cleopatra you are thinking of, by the way. There were many Cleopatras. Cleopatra Eurydice's potential offspring would be a full Macedonian heir, while Alexander was only half Macedonian. This was a big problem for Alexander. At the wedding banquet, the general, Attalus, Cleopatra's uncle, drunkenly prayed for a legitimate heir. In 337 BC, Alexander fled to Illyria, seeking refuge with Illyrian kings. Despite previous battles, he was, at this time, treated as a guest. He returned to Macedon after six months, mediated by family friend Demaratus. In response to Persian satrap Pixadarus offering his daughter to Philip, Alexander objected, suggesting his father intended Archidaeus as heir. Philip then scolded Alexander, halted negotiations, and exiled him with four friends, Harpalus, Nearchus, Ptolemy, and Erigius. King of Macedon In the summer of 336 BC, during the wedding of his daughter Cleopatra to Alexander I of Epirus, Philip II was assassinated by Pausanias, the captain of his bodyguards. Pausanias was subsequently killed by pursuers, including Alexander's companions Perdigas and Leonatus. 
At the age of twenty, Alexander was immediately proclaimed king by the nobles and army. Upon ascending to the throne, Alexander took swift and ruthless measures to eliminate potential rivals. He executed his cousin Amintas the Fourth, and ordered the killing of two Macedonian princes implicated in his father's assassination. Alexander, like Entes, was spared, while Olympias and Cleopatra Eurydice and her daughter by Philip, Europa, were burned alive. This, however, angered Alexander, a little too barbaric. Attalus, in command of the army in Asia Minor, and Cleopatra's uncle, was also murdered for corresponding with Demosthenes and insulting Alexander. Archideus, who was mentally disabled, was spared. Facing revolts in various states, including Thebes, Athens, Thessaly, and Thracian tribes, Alexander swiftly marched south, quelling opposition and adding Thessalian cavalry to his force. In Corinth, Alexander was recognized as the leader of the Amphictyonic League. Athens sought peace, and Alexander pardoned the rebels. A notable encounter with Diogenes the Cynic took place, where Diogenes asked Alexander to step aside as he was blocking the sunlight. Alexander was reportedly quite amused with this, and he remarked that if he were not himself, he would want to be Diogenes. In Corinth, Alexander assumed the title of hegemon or leader, and was appointed commander for the upcoming war against Persia, while also learning about a Thracian uprising. In preparation for his Asian campaign, Alexander secured his northern borders in 335 BC. He suppressed revolts starting from the Amphipolis, defeating Thracians at Mount Hermos and the Tribali village near the Leginus River. After encountering the Gete tribe at the Danube, he forced their retreat. Subsequently, Alexander quelled revolts in Illyria, defeating Cleotus and King Glaucias securing his northern frontier before crossing to Asia. Upon learning of Theban and Athenian rebellions, Alexander swiftly headed south. The Theban resistance proved futile, leading to the city's destruction and territorial division among other Boeotian cities. This decisive action subdued Athens, bringing a temporary peace to all of Greece. With matters in Greece settled, Alexander embarked on his Asian campaign, leaving Antipater as his regent. After the Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC, Philip II had aimed to lead a Greek league against the Persians, seeking to address grievances from 480 BC and free Greek cities from Achaemenid rule. In 336 BC he dispatched Parmenion to Anatolia for invasion preparations. However, the news of Philip's murder and Alexander's ascension demoralized the Macedonian forces. The Achaemenids, led by Memnon of Rhodes, defeated them near Magnesia. 
Alexander, taking charge of his father's invasion plans, crossed the Hellespont in 334 BC with a formidable army and fleet, symbolizing his determination to conquer the entire Persian Empire. He boldly declared Asia as a gift from the gods, showcasing his readiness for military action in contrast to his father's diplomatic approach. Following an initial victory at the Battle of the Granicus, Alexander captured the Persian provincial capital, Sardis, and proceeded along the Ionian coast, granting autonomy and democracy to cities he faced a delicate siege at Miletus, held by Achaemenid forces. Despite Persian naval presence, Alexander successfully besieged Halicarnassus in Caria, marking his first large-scale siege victory. The mercenary Memnon of Rhodes and Persian satrap Orontabates withdrew by sea. Alexander then appointed Ada of the Hectomnid dynasty as the ruler of Caria. Moving through Lycia and the Pamphylian plain, Alexander gained control over coastal cities, denying the Persians naval bases. He then ventured inland humbling the Pisidian city of Thermosus. At Gordium, the ancient Phrygian capital, Alexander famously unraveled the Gordian knot, a task believed to be reserved only for the future king of Asia. Disregarding the method of unraveling it by hand, he elected to simply cut it with his sword, showcasing his determination and audacity. In spring 333 BC, Alexander advanced into Cilicia after crossing the Taurus, facing Darius's significantly larger army. An initial illness caused a pause but he marched towards Syria. Despite being outmaneuvered, Alexander returned to Cilicia and defeated Darius at the Battle of Issus. Darius fled, abandoning his own family and a vast treasure. In response to Darius's peace offer, Alexander asserted his authority as the king of Asia and refused the terms. Subsequently, he took control of Syria and a substantial portion of the Levantine coast. In 332 BC, Alexander laid siege to the island city of Tyre employing strategic ingenuity to overcome its defences after a prolonged and challenging siege. The aftermath saw a harsh reprisal against the city's population, particularly the military age men, who were all put to death, while the women and children were sold into slavery. Encountering resistance at Gaza, Alexander persisted through three assaults before the stronghold fell. In Egypt, Alexander was welcomed as a liberator. He was crowned in the Temple of Ta at Memphis, making sacrifices and consulting the Oracle of Amun-Ra. The Oracle declared Alexander as the son of Amun, and he embraced the title, often referring to Zeus Amun as his true father. During his 
brief stay in Egypt, Alexander reformed the taxation system based on Greek models and organized the military occupation of the country. He also founded Alexandria, the modern-day city. In Arabic, we now refer to it as Al-Aksandria, but still keeps his namesake after all these years. In his pursuit of the Persians, Alexander left Egypt in early 331 BC. The control of Egypt ultimately passed to Ptolemy I, marking the beginning of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Do remember that this is the beginning of Greek rule in Egypt, and the Ptolemaic dynasty was the dynasty of the Cleopatra you are most likely familiar with, not the one that we had aforementioned in this video. Moving on. After leaving Egypt in 331 BC, Alexander turned his attention eastward and marched into Achaemenid Assyria in Upper Mesopotamia, where he confronted Darius once again at the Battle of Gaugamela. The battle resulted in another decisive victory for Alexander, forcing Darius once again to flee the field. Alexander pursued him as far as Arbella, marking the final encounter between the two. Following Gaugamela, Darius fled to Ectabana, modern-day Hamadan, while Alexander captured Babylon. Before entering the city, he sent a message to its people, assuring them that he would not enter their homes. From Babylon, Alexander proceeded to Susa, one of the Achaemenid capitals, where he seized the entire treasury. Splitting his forces, Alexander sent the main army to the ceremonial capital of Persepolis via the Persian royal road. Simultaneously, he led a select group on a direct route to Persepolis, storming the pass of the Persian gates, previously blocked by a Persian army under Ariel Barzanes. Alexander reached Persepolis before the garrison could loot the treasury. Upon entering Persepolis, Alexander allowed his troops to plunder the city for several days. He stayed in Persepolis for five months, during which a fire broke out, destroying a significant part of the city. The cause of the fire is uncertain, but there is speculation ranging from a drunken accident to intentional revenge for the burning of the Acropolis of Athens by Xerxes during the Second Persian War. While watching the city burn, Alexander reportedly regretted his decision and ordered his men to extinguish the flames. An anecdote suggests that Alexander spoke to a fallen statue of Xerxes during the incident, contemplating the merits and the vices of the fallen Persian king. Continuing his pursuit of Darius, Alexander chased the Persian king into Media and then Parthia. Darius was no longer in control of his fate, and was eventually taken prisoner by Bessus, his Bactrian satrap and distant relative. Betrus had Darius fatally stabbed as Alexander approached, declaring himself Darius's successor. He retreated into Central Asia to launch a guerrilla campaign against Alexander. 
Upon reaching the scene, Alexander buried Darius's remains beside his Achaemenid predecessors in a regal funeral. He claimed that, in his dying moments, Darius had named Alexander as his successor to the Achaemenid throne. While the Achaemenid Empire is generally considered to have fallen with Darius, Alexander's rule maintained some aspects of its community life and governmental structure, leading to his recognition as, in the words of iranologist Pierre Briand, the last of the Achaemenids. Considering Bessus a usurper, Alexander embarked on a campaign against him. During this journey, Alexander founded several cities, all named Alexandria, ranging from Afghanistan to modern Tajikistan. The expedition took Alexander through various regions, such as Media, Parthia, Arya, Drangiana and Arakosia, and many more. In 329 BC, Spitamenes, holding an undefined position in the satrapy of Sogdiana, betrayed Bessus to Ptolemy. One of Alexander's trusted companions, leading to his execution. However, Spitamenes later raised Sogdiana in revolt, prompting Alexander to personally defeat the Scythians at the Battle of Jaxartes. Subsequently, he launched a campaign against Spitamenes, defeating him in the Battle of Gabai. After this defeat, Spitamenes was killed by his own men, who then sought peace with Alexander. During his conquests in Persia and Central Asia, he integrated Persian customs into his court. However, Greeks perceived this as an attempt at deifying himself, and it caused a great amount of discord. Expressing a desire to succeed Darius III, Alexander's actions, including the burning of Persepolis, led to rejection by the Persian people, hindering his legitimacy as a successor. Internal challenges emerged, with a plot against Alexander's life resulting in the execution of Philotas. Parmenion, implicated due to his son's involvement, faced assassination. In a tragic accident, Alexander personally killed Cleotus the Black during a drunken dispute in Maracanda, highlighting tensions between the Macedonian and Persian lifestyles. Before embarking on his Asian campaign, Alexander appointed his trusted general, Antipater, to govern Macedon. Antipater, a seasoned military and political leader from Philip II's Old Guard, successfully maintained order in Macedon, notably defeating the Spartan king, Agis III, in the Battle of Megalopolis. The only call to arms from Sparta was swiftly quelled by Antipater, and Alexander, despite some friction between Antipater and Olympias, chose to pardon the Spartans. During Alexander's absence, Greece experienced relative peace and prosperity. Alexander's financial contributions from his conquest stimulated economic growth, 
and increased trade across the empire. However, the constant demands for troops and the migration of Macedonians throughout the empire had a significant impact on Macedon's strength. The depletion of resources ultimately weakened Macedon in the years following Alexander's reign and contributed to its subjugation by Rome after the Third Macedonian War. After dealing with Spitamenes and marrying Roxana to strengthen ties with the new satrapies, Alexander turned his attention to the Indian subcontinent. He invited the chieftains of the former satrapy of Gandhara, including Omphis, the ruler of Taxila, to submit to his authority. When Ambi complied, some hill clans, including Aspasioi and Asakenoi, refused to submit. Ambi, eager to ally with Alexander, met him with valuable presence and offered his full unwavering support. Alexander, pleased with Ambi's cooperation, returned his title and gifts, presenting him with Persian robes, gold and silver ornaments and horses. This alliance allowed Alexander to divide his forces, and Ambi played a key role in constructing a bridge over the Indus. He supplied provisions, demonstrated friendship, and provided hospitality to Alexander and his army in Taxila. In the winter of 327 or 326 BC, Alexander personally led a campaign against the Aspasioi Gureans and Asikanoi. The Aspasioi were defeated, and Alexander faced the Asikanoi in the battle at Massaga, Ora, and Aurnos. The fortress of Massaga fell after days of fighting, during which Alexander was wounded. Ora witnessed a similar fate with the complete destruction of the population and buildings. The Asakenians fled to the fortress of Arnos, where Alexander captured the strategic hill fort after four bloody days. After capturing Arnos, Alexander crossed the Indus and engaged in a significant battle against King Poros in 326. This epic encounter, known as the Battle of the Hydaspes, took place in the region between the Hydaspes and the Akasins rivers, in what is now the Punjab. Despite Poros's valiant resistance, Alexander once again emerged victorious. Impressed by Porus's courage, Alexander made him an ally and appointed him as satrap. Additionally, Alexander expanded Porus's territory towards the southeast, reaching up to the Beas River. This strategic move allowed Alexander to maintain control over these distant lands by having a local ruler. In honor of his horse Bucephalus, who we have already aforementioned, which had died around this time, Alexander founded the city of Bucephala on one side of the Hydaspes River. On the opposite side, he established the city of Nicaea, believed to be located at the modern-day Mong in Punjab. Notably, Alexander's respect for Porus and the integration of local rulers into his administration 
were part of his broader strategy for governing diverse regions within his now sprawling and vast empire. One interesting anecdote from this period, which I must add, involves an elephant in Porus's army that bravely fought against Alexander's forces. Alexander dedicated this remarkable elephant to Helios, the sun, and named it Ajax. The elephant had gold rings around its tusks, inscribed with a Greek message. Alexander, the son of Zeus, dedicates Ajax to Helios. To the east of Porus's kingdom, Alexander faced the Nanda Empire of the Magadha near the Ganges River, and further east, the powerful Gangaridae Empire in the Bengal region of the Indian subcontinent. Apprehensive about the challenges posed by additional large armies, and fatigued after years of continuous campaigning, Alexander's army mutinied at the Hephaestus River, and refused to march any further east. It was this river that marked the easternmost extent of Alexander's conquests. Despite Alexander's attempts to persuade his soldiers to continue, his general, Coenus, urged him to reconsider, emphasizing the soldiers' desire to reunite with their families and return to their homeland. Ultimately, Alexander acquiesced to their plea and decided to turn south, marching along the Indus. During this journey, his forces conquered various Indian tribes, including the Mali in the region, which corresponds to the modern-day Multan. While besieging the Malian citadel, Alexander sustained a severe injury when an arrow penetrated his armor and pierced his lung. In the aftermath of this incident, Alexander divided his forces. He dispatched a significant portion of his army to Karmania, modern-day southern Iran, under the command of General Craterus. Simultaneously, he commissioned a fleet, led by Admiral Nearchus, to explore the Persian Gulf. Alexander, along with the remaining troops, embarked on a challenging southern route through the Gedrosian Desert and the Makran. This arduous journey led to the loss of many soldiers due to the harsh desert conditions. By 324 BC, Alexander reached Susa, having encountered numerous challenges during his return, including the difficult desert terrain that killed so many of his men. Upon his return to Susa, Alexander discovered misconduct among his satraps and military governors, leading to the execution of several of them to make examples. In a gesture of gratitude, he cleared the debts of his soldiers and announced plans to send overaged and disabled veterans back to Macedon. However, the troops misunderstood his intentions, so they mutinied and criticized his adoption of Persian customs and integration of Persian officers and soldiers into the Macedonian units. We may accuse them of being a little bit racist, wouldn't we? Terrible. Facing this mutiny, Alexander conceded by appointing Persians to command posts 
and bestowing Macedonian titles upon Persian units. After a banquet to reconcile with his soldiers, he attempted to foster harmony by orchestrating a mass marriage of senior officers to Persian noble women at Susa, though few of these unions endured beyond a year. I wonder why. During his return to Persia, Alexander learned of the desecration of Cyrus the Great's tomb in Pasagade and promptly executed the guards responsible. Due to his admiration for Cyrus, Alexander had the interior of the tomb decorated by his architect Aristobulus. Upon reaching Ectibano, Alexander aimed to retrieve the bulk of the Persian treasure. However, tragedy struck as his close friend Hephaestion succumbed to illness or poisoning. Devastated by Hephaestion's death, Alexander ordered an elaborate funeral pyre in Babylon and declared public mourning. While planning for future campaigns, including an invasion of Arabia, Alexander's ambitions were cut short by his own untimely demise shortly after his best friend. On May 29th, during a banquet in Babylon to mark the end of the Indian campaign and start of the Arabian invasion, tradition held that Serious drinking would commence only after everyone finished their meals, typically with heavily watered wine. Before his death, when asked about his successor, Alexander responded with, To the strongest one. On June 10th or 11th, 323 BC, Alexander passed away in Babylon at the age of 32. Accounts of his death vary, with Plutarch mentioning a fever that left him unable to speak, and Diodorus recounting pain after drinking unmixed wine. Remember we mentioned the wine would usually be heavily watered. Suspicion of Foul play arose to the Macedonian aristocracy history of assassinations. Various accounts did suggest poisoning, with Antipater, recently replaced as Macedonian viceroy, implicated in the alleged plot. While Aristotle's involvement was also hinted at, the poison theory faced skepticism due to the twelve days between illness onset and death. And I personally think there is no reason for Aristotle to go after Alexander like that. He's much too reasonable to do something. In a modern theory, however, white hellebore poisoning has been proposed, and another theory suggesting poisoning by water containing calicomycin. Natural causes including typhoid, malaria, uh, and other illnesses have also been proposed. Heavy drinking, severe wounds, and emotional distress over Hephaestion's death may have also contributed to Alexander's declining health. The exact cause of his death remains uncertain. Shrouded in the complexities of ancient history and medical speculation. Alexander's body was placed in a gold anthropoid sarcophagus filled with honey and later transferred to a golden casket. Ptolemy had seized the funeral cortege on its way to Macedon and temporarily took it to Memphis later moving it to Alexandria. 
The sarcophagus remained there until at least late antiquity, replaced with glass by Ptolemy the Ninth. The discovery of a tomb in Amphipolis in 2014 sparked speculation about Alexander's burial, but it was dedicated to Hephaestion. Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Augustus visited Alexander's tomb in Alexandria. Caligula took Alexander's breastplate, and Septimus Severus closed the tomb in AD 200. Caracalla, an admirer, visited it during his reign. The fate of the tomb became unclear afterwards. The Alexander sarcophagus in the Istanbul Archaeology Museum depicts Alexander and his companions, but wasn't believed to contain his remains. It was thought to belong to Abdelonymus, but may predate his death. Now if you're wondering where exactly they buried him, where exactly was his tomb, all that was written was that it was at the main crossroads of Alexandria. If you've seen a map of the crossroads of Alexandria, you will realize how difficult it is to find that. Even going back to medieval times and hundreds of years before, there were a great many crossroads. After the death of Alexander, the Macedonian army was flung into disorder. The anarchy among the generals was compared to a blinded cyclops groping about by Leosthenes. And Macedon was never the same again. But the memory of Alexander the Great endures on into our modern era. Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher and polymath, covered a wide array of subjects in his writings, including natural sciences, philosophy, linguistics, economics, politics, psychology, and the arts. He founded the peripatetic school of philosophy in the Lyceum of Athens, laying the groundwork for the development of modern science. Born in Stagira, northern Greece, during the classical period, Aristotle's early life details are scant. Raised by a guardian after his father's death, he joined Plato's academy in Athens at seventeen or eighteen, staying there until the age of thirty-seven. After Plato's death, Aristotle left Athens and tutored Alexander the Great at the request of Philip II of Macedon, starting in 343 BC. He established a library in the Lyceum, producing numerous books on papyrus scrolls. Although Aristotle wrote many treatises and dialogues, only about a third of his original works have survived to our modern day, as none were originally intended for publication. His teachings synthesized various philosophies preceding him and continue to be a subject of contemporary philosophical discussion. Aristotle's influence extended into medieval scholarship, shaping both Judeo-Islamic philosophies and Christian theology. Medieval Muslim scholars revered him as the first teacher, and medieval Christians 
like Thomas Aquinas, refer to him as the philosopher. Dante called him the master of those who know. His works included the earliest known formal study of logic and continue to influence scholars well into the 19th century. His ethics, particularly virtue ethics, experienced a renewed interest in the modern era. The Life of Aristotle Aristotle was born in 384 BC in Stagira, Chalcides, approximately 55 kilometers east of present-day Thessaloniki. His father, Nicomachus, served as the personal physician to King Amintas of Macedon. During his youth, Aristotle learned about biology and medical topics from his father. Tragically, both of Aristotle's parents passed away when he was about 13 years old. Following their deaths, Proxenus of Artoneus became his guardian. While details about Aristotle's childhood are limited, it is suggested that he spent time within the Macedonian palace, establishing early connections with the Macedonian monarchy. These formative experiences likely played a role in Aristotle's later involvement with Macedonian rulers, including his tutoring of Alexander the Great. However, the specifics of his early life are not extensively documented, and historical biographies from ancient times often contain speculative elements. At the age of 17 or 18, Aristotle made his way to Athens to pursue further education at Plato's academy. During this time at the academy, which lasted nearly 20 years, Aristotle likely participated in the Eleusinian Mysteries, as indicated by his writings on the subject. Around 348 or 47 BC, Aristotle left Athens, and the traditional narrative suggests that he was dissatisfied with the direction of the academy under Plato's nephew. Another possible reason for his departure could have been concerns about anti-Macedonian sentiments in Athens. Aristotle then joined Xenocrates in the court of Hermaeus at Aeterneus in Asia Minor. Following Hermaeus' death, Aristotle, along with his pupil Theophrastus, travelled to Lesbos. During their time on the island, they conducted research on its botany and zoology, particularly studying the local flora and fauna in the sheltered lagoon. While in Lesbos, Aristotle married Pythias, who was either Hermias's adoptive daughter or niece. The couple had a daughter named Pythias as well. In 343 BC, Philip II of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, invited Aristotle to become the tutor of his son. This invitation marked a significant turning point in Aristotle's life and set the stage for his influential role in the education of one of history's most renowned conquerors. Aristotle assumed the position of the head of the Royal Academy of Macedon, where he not only instructed Alexander the Great, but also provided lessons to 
two other future kings, Ptolemy and Cassander. During this time, Aristotle actively encouraged Alexander in his ambitions for Eastern conquest. Aristotle's ethnocentric views are evident in his advice to Alexander, where he recommended being a leader to the Greeks and a despot to the barbarians. And by the way, this word barbarian effectively referred to anybody who was not Greek. In this council, he suggested that Alexander should treat Greeks as friends and relatives while dealing with non-Greeks as if they were beasts or plants. Around 335 BC, Aristotle returned to Athens and established his own school called the Lyceum. Over the next twelve years, he conducted courses at this school, covering a wide range of subjects. During his time in Athens, Aristotle's wife Pythias passed away, and he entered into a relationship with Herpilus of Stagira. They had a son, whom Aristotle named Nicomachus after his father. According to the Suda, a compilation from the Middle Ages, Aristotle might have also had an Eromenos, or a beloved, Palifatus of Abydus. Although this claim is subject to historical scrutiny, During his time in Athens from 335 to 323, Aristotle is believed to have composed many of his works. Although he wrote many dialogues, only fragments of them have survived. Most of his surviving works are in treatise form, and it's believed that these were primarily lecture aids for his students, rather than intended for widespread publication. Aristotle's significant treatises include works on physics, metaphysics, ethics, politics, biology, and various other subjects. Some of his most influential works that you may have heard of include Metaphysics, Nicomachean Ethics, On the Soul, and Poetics. Toward the end of his life, Aristotle's relationship with Alexander the Great became strained due to Alexander's actions in Persia. There is a tradition in antiquity suggesting that Aristotle may have played a role in Alexander's death, but the evidence for this claim is quite weak with the accusation arising several years after Alexander died. By the way, Alexander's actions in Persia, what I believe they may refer to is when Alexander got to Persia, he began to act quite Persian. He took on the Persian dress and had quite an admiration for the culture, as Persian culture at this time was very well developed. If you'd watched any of my videos on the Bronze Age, you perhaps would have known this. So Alexander was quite impressed by it. Of course, all of his friends back at home thought this was remarkably cringe and did not like him wearing the Persian outfits, regardless of how good he looked in them. Now, after Alexander's demise, anti-Macedonian sentiments flared up in Athens, and in 322 BCE, Aristotle was reportedly denounced for impiety, much like his predecessor Socrates, who had to drink hemlock as his fate. 
In response, he fled to his mother's family estate in Chalcis, on the island of Euboa. Tradition holds that he said, I will not allow the Athenians to sin twice against philosophy. Now, this is possibly referring to the trial and execution of the aforementioned Socrates. Aristotle died in Chalcis later that same year, succumbing to natural causes. In his will, he named his student Antipater as his chief executor, and expressed his wish to be buried next to his wife. Theoretical Philosophy Aristotle's prior analytics is credited with being the earliest systematic study of formal logic. His work on logic, especially in the prior analytics, laid the foundation for the dominant form of Western logic until the 19th century, when mathematical logic made significant advancements. Immanuel Kant, in the Critique of Pure Reason, acknowledged Aristotle's contributions to logic, stating that, with Aristotle, logic had reached its completion. Aristotle's logical framework, with its emphasis on syllogistic reasoning and deductive methods, had a profound and lasting impact on the development of philosophical and scientific inquiry. Organon Aristotle's logical system, which includes types of syllogism, or methods of logical argument. Once again, that's syllogism, which means a method of logical argument, is now known as Aristotelian logic. Aristotle, however, would have referred to this aspect of his work as analytics. In Aristotle's terminology, he reserved the term logic to mean dialectics. Dialectics, for Aristotle, was the broader study of philosophical discourse and argumentation. Most of Aristotle's works likely underwent editing by his students and later lecturers, so the current state of his texts may not reflect precisely the original form in which he wrote them. The logical works of Aristotle were compiled into a collection of six books known as the Organon, around 40 BCE. The compilation is attributed to Andronicus of Rhodes or other followers of Aristotle. The Organon includes works such as Categories, On Interpretation, posterior analytics, on sophistical refutations, and many more, which together form the core of Aristotle's writings on logic. The order of the books in Aristotle's Organon is not definitely known. However, scholars have derived a likely order from the analysis of Aristotle's writings, and so the Organon comprises of the following works, which I will briefly detail now. Categories This work deals with the analysis of simple terms, discussing the different kinds of entities and their relationships. On Interpretation In this treatise, Aristotle explores propositions and their elementary relations, including the study of affirmative and negative propositions. Prior Analytics This work delves into the theory of syllogisms, which are forms of deductive reasoning involving premises and conclusions. 
posterior analytics. Similar to the prior analytics, this work continues the exploration of syllogistic reasoning, focusing on scientific demonstration. Topics Aristotle examines dialectics, which involves argumentative techniques and methods for discovering and constructing arguments. On Sophistical Refutations This treatise addresses fallacies and sophistical arguments, aiming to provide guidance and on avoiding faulty reasoning. While the rhetoric is not conventionally included in the organon, it is worth mentioning that Aristotle states it relies on the topics as it deals with persuasive and rhetorical argumentation. Metaphysics The term metaphysics was not used by Aristotle himself. No, indeed, it seems to be have coined later on, possibly by the first century CE editor who compiled various small selections of Aristotle's works into the treatise known as Metaphysics. Aristotle referred to this branch of philosophy as First Philosophy and distinguished it from mathematics and natural science. In his Metaphysics, he described it as contemplative philosophy, that is, theological and study to the divine. The name Metaphysics was later applied to this work and the broader field of it that it represents dealing with abstract concepts and fundamental principles beyond the physical world. From Aristotle's Metaphysics, we'll read a short passage now. If there were no other independent things besides the composite natural ones, the study of nature would be the primary kind of knowledge. But if there is some kind of motionless, independent thing, the knowledge of this precedes it and is first philosophy, and it is universal in just this way because it is first, and it belongs to this sort of philosophy to study being as being, both what it is and what it belongs to just by the virtue of being. Substance. In Aristotle's Metaphysics, he introduces the concept of substance and essence. He proposes hylomorphism, a theory stating that a substance comprises both matter and form. In Book 8, he distinguishes the matter as the substratum or the substance's composition, such as bricks in a house. The form is the actual substance, defining its characteristics, like being a house. So see the house for the bricks, is what he's saying. The formula providing components is the account of matter, while the one detailing differentia is the account of form. Imminent Realism Aristotle, following Plato's lead, directs his philosophy towards the universal. In Aristotle's ontology, the universal resides within particulars in the world. Unlike Plato, who posited a separately existing form, Aristotle views the form as 
instantiated in a specific substance. Plato argued for universal forms existing independently, such as the universal form of an apple. Aristotle, however, disagreed with Plato's assertion, asserting himself that all universals are instantiated in existing things over time. He rejected the idea of universals detached from reality. Aristotle also differed on the location of universals. While Plato saw them as separate entities, Aristotle believed universals exist within each thing to which they apply. According to Aristotle, the form of an apple exists within each apple, not in a separate realm of forms. I know, it's a little complicated, isn't it? But let's continue. Potentiality and Actuality Aristotle, in his works Physics and On Generation and Corruption, distinguishes coming to be Genesis from other types of change. For example, growth and diminution change in quantity, locomotion, a change in space, and alteration, a change in quality. Coming to be involves a change in the substrate itself. Aristotle introduces the concepts of potentiality, what a thing can become, and actuality, fulfillment of potentiality. Potentiality is the capacity for change if conditions permit. For instance, a seed has the potentiality to become a plant. Potential beings can either act or be acted upon, either inherently or through learning. Actuality is the realization of potentiality and is linked to the end, the telos, of purpose and of the change. In summary, once more, actuality is the fulfillment of potentiality, exemplified when a plant engages in activities typical of its nature. Let's read from Metaphysics. For that, for the sake of which a thing is, is its principle, and the becoming is for the sake of the end, and the actuality is the end, and it is for the sake of this that the potentiality is acquired. For animals do not see in order that they may have sight, but they have sight that they may see. And now let's move away from some of the scientific aspects of Aristotle's beliefs and look at some of his practical philosophy. Aristotle's practical philosophy covers areas such as ethics, politics, economics, and of course, rhetoric. So let's begin with ethics. Aristotle's ethical philosophy, exemplified in works like the Nicomachean Ethics, focused on practical rather than theoretical aspects. He asserts that virtue is related to the proper function ergon, of a thing, just as an eye's proper function is sight. Aristotle argues that humans themselves have a specific function tied to the soul and guided by reason. The old Greek word for reason is logos, by the way. You will hear that a lot when we're talking about Greek philosophy. So do remember, reason, logos. 
For Aristotle, the ultimate aim of human action is eudaimonia, often translated as happiness or well-being. This state requires the development of a virtuous character, characterized by the virtuous mean, a balance between excess and deficiency. Now remember this is the antithesis to hedonia, which is that joy that we receive through short-term pleasures. For example, we may talk about consumption of substances such as alcohol and uh, drugs, heaven forbid. Things like this that um, give us that state of short-term happiness that is not a result of cumulated virtue. If we are to talk about eudaimonia, we can think about the achievement that we get after we have gone through some great struggle or achieved the end goal of a challenge we've set for ourselves. For example, I may say that this YouTube channel itself is a eudaimonic process, as the joy I receive from reading your comments and gaining new subscribers is a result of the many hours of work that I put into creating these videos for you. Many hours of work that are indeed a labor of love. So, let's continue. Aristotle outlines a two-stage process to achieve virtuous character and potential happiness. Initially, individuals must be habituated through experience and education. In the latter stage, conscious choices lead to the development of practical wisdom, or as the Greeks call it, phronesis, and intellect, nos. The culmination of the highest human virtue, achievable by accomplished thinkers or philosophers, is indeed these virtues. And yes, I am drinking coffee. Politics. In his work, Politics, Aristotle expands his philosophical focus from individual ethics to the structure of the city as a natural community. He considers the city as a fundamental and organic entity, prioritizing it over the family and the individual. Aristotle famously asserts that man is by nature a political animal, emphasizing humanity's unique rationality among the animal kingdom. Aristotle views the city as an organic whole rather than a mechanical entity, where each part is interdependent and connected. Unlike the modern concept of a state, Aristotle's natural community is the city or polis. You will see uh, many Greek towns and small cities with this uh, suffix polis. Polis means city. Functioning as the political community or partnership. The city's purpose, according to Aristotle, goes beyond avoiding injustice and ensuring economic stability. It actually aims to enable citizens to live good lives and engage in virtuous acts. In contrast to modern social contract theories, Aristotle's perspective doesn't emphasize fear or inconvenience as reasons for forming a political partnership. Rather, he sees the city as a means for citizens to pursue noble actions and live a fulfilling life. In Prototrepticus, the character Aristotle states, For we all agree that the most excellent man should rule, the supreme by nature, and that the law rules and alone is authoritative. But the law is a kind of intelligence, i.e. a discourse based on intelligence, 
And again, what standard do we have? What criterion of good things that is more precise than the intelligent man? For all that is, man will choose. And if the choice is based on his knowledge, our good things and their contraries are bad. And since everybody chooses most of all what conforms to their own proper dispositions, a just man choosing to live justly, a man with bravery to live bravely, likewise a self-controlled man to live with control, it is clear that the intelligent man will choose most of all to be intelligent, for this is the function of that capacity. Hence, it is evident that, according to the most authoritative judgment, intelligence is supreme among the virtues. Aristotle's perspectives on women, while influential in the Middle Ages, have become contentious in modern times. His analysis of procreation involves portraying a dynamic, ensouling male element, bringing life to an inert, passive female element. According to Aristotle, the female body's suitability for reproduction, influencing changes in body temperature, renders women incapable of engaging in political life. Modern critics, especially proponents of feminist metaphysics, whatever that is, have accused Aristotle of misogyny and sexism due to these views. However, it's noteworthy that Aristotle attributed equal importance to women's happiness, stating in his rhetoric that the factors contributing to happiness should be present in both men and women. Economics Aristotle's contribution to economic thought were significant, especially during the Middle Ages when his work was rediscovered. In his work, Politics, he addressed topics such as the city, property, and trade. Aristotle defended private property against criticisms, anticipating later philosophical economic perspectives that emphasized the overall utility of social arrangements. He believed that societal issues blamed on private property actually stemmed from human nature. Aristotle provided one of the earliest accounts of the origin of money in politics, as in the work politics, not politics itself. According to him, money emerged as people became interdependent, engaging in trade by importing what they needed and exporting surplus goods. For practical reasons, they agreed to use something intrinsically useful and easily applicable, like iron, silver, and later gold. A significant influence on medieval economic thought, Aristotle expressed a critical view of retail trade. He argued that retail, driven by profit-seeking, treated goods as a means to an end, rather than an end in itself, therefore making it unnatural. Similarly, Aristotle considered making a profit through interest unnatural, as it involved gaining from the money itself, not its use. And if current day interest rates are anything to go by, I think we should perhaps listen to him. Aristotle's early insights into the functions of money included its role as a universal standard of measurement, allowing the association of different goods and making them consumable. 
Money also served as a form of security for future exchanges, enabling individuals to obtain desired goods when needed. Rhetoric in Aristotle's rhetoric, he presents a comprehensive framework for persuasive communication, identifying three fundamental appeals a speaker can employ to persuade an audience, those three appeals being ethos, appeals to the speaker's character, establishing credibility and trustworthiness, pathos, appeals to the audience's emotions, aiming to evoke feelings and create a connection. Logos appeals to logical reasoning, providing evidence, facts, and sound arguments. Aristotle further classifies rhetoric into three genres. Epideitic ceremonial speeches, dealing with praise or blame. Forensic Judicial speeches addressing issues of guilt or innocence. Deliberative Speeches arguing the audience to make decisions on particular issues. Additionally, Aristotle outlines two types of rhetorical proofs. Enthymeme, proof by syllogism involving logical reasoning and deduction. Paradigma, proof by example, using instances or cases to support arguments. Poetics, in Aristotle's poetics, he explores the concept of mimesis, or imitation, across various art forms, including epic poetry, tragedy, comedy, painting, music, and many more of the arts. Each art form involves imitation through different mediums, objects, and manners. Aristotle sees Mimesis as a natural instinct that distinguishes humans from animals. And he believes that human artistry follows the pattern of nature. Just a few key points about Mimesis in Aristotle's Poetics. Medium, object, and manner of imitation. Different art forms, of course, vary in their imitation through rhythm, harmony, language, and other elements. Comedy imitates men worse than average, while tragedy imitates men slightly better than average. The manner of imitation may involve narrative or character, change or no change, and drama or no drama. Surviving work. Only the portion of Aristotle's poetics focusing on tragedy has survived. Tragedy, according to Aristotle, involves six elements. Plot structure, character, style, thought, spectacle, and lyric. Aristotle emphasizes that the chief focus of tragedy is the plot, not the characters. Tragedy aims to arouse pity and fear and achieve the catharsis of these emotions. Comparison with Epic Aristotle discusses the superior of tragedy over Epic Mimesis pointing out that tragedy possesses attributes like unity, spectacle, and music, achieves its aim more efficiently, and therefore can be considered superior to the epic. Beyond his exploration of mimesis, 
Aristotle had a keen interest in riddles, folklore and proverbs, including those from the Delphic Oracle and the fables of Aesop, both of which have videos on the way. Well, that's about all that you probably need to know about Aristotle. If you're still here. The Eleusinian Mysteries, known in Greek as Eleusinia Mysteria, referred to secretive rites practiced in the city of Eleusis. The name Eleusis is believed to have pre-Greek origins and may be linked to the gods Eletheia. In Laconia and Messene, she was known as Elysia, possibly connecting her with the month Eleusinios and the city Eleusis, although this remains a topic of debate. The Greek term from which the English word mystery is derived is mysterion, which denotes a secret rite, or indeed a mystery itself. It is derived from the verb mieo, meaning to teach or to initiate into the mysteries, and the noun mystes, signifying one who is initiated. The term mysticos, from which mystic in English is derived, pertains to things associated with the mysteries, or denotes something private and secret. Before we continue, I will remind you, my Greek pronunciation may be a little bit off, so do have patience with me. The Eleusinian mysteries are closely tied to a myth featuring Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and fertility. As narrated in one of the Homeric hymns, circa 650 BC. According to the tale, Demeter's beloved daughter, Persephone, also known as Kor, or the Maiden, was engrossed in the task of adorning the earth with all of its vibrant flowers. However, her blissful undertaking was interrupted when Hades, the formidable deity who ruled the underworld, seized her and whisked her away to his shadowy domain. Overwhelmed by grief and anxiety over her daughter's sudden disappearance, Demeter embarked on an arduous quest to locate her. In her anguish, she wrought havoc upon the earth, inducing a devastating drought that plunged humanity into suffering and deprivation. This dire situation prompted Zeus, the king of the gods, to intercede and negotiate for Persephone's release. During her relentless pursuit of Persephone, Demeter traversed vast distances and imparted her agricultural wisdom to Triptolemus, among other ventures. Eventually, Persephone was permitted to reunite with her mother. However, a fateful twist awaited her. Having consumed food in the underworld, a deed that bound her to its realms, Persephone was obligated to spend a portion of each year in Hades' realm. The duration of her stay, which varied across accounts, 
coincides with the dry and parched Greek summer, a period of potential drought and barrenness. Persephone's cyclic sojourn between the underworld and the earthly realm carries profound symbolism. Her annual return to the surface heralds the onset of spring, a season synonymous with rebirth, rejuvenation, and the resplendent flourishing of plant life. Conversely, her descent into the underworld during the colder months represents a period of dormancy and decline in the natural world, mirroring the eternal ebb and flow of life and death in nature. This alternate interpretation posits that Persephone's cyclical movements serve as a poignant allegory for the rhythm of the seasons, underscoring the interconnectedness of life's myriad facets and the perpetual cycle of renewal inherent in our natural world. What about the origins of the mysteries? We know about the myth, but what about the mysteries themselves? Well, they are believed to trace their origins to a bygone era steeped in antiquity. Evidence unearthed at the Eleusinian temple in Attica suggests that the foundation of these enigmatic rites lay in an ancient agrarian cult, possibly predating even the Greek Dark Ages. Remarkably, some aspects of these mysteries appear to have been influenced by religious practices dating back to the Mycenaean period, hinting at a lineage stretching across millennia. Excavations at Telesterion, the sacred hall where the mysteries unfolded, have unveiled traces of a private structure dating back to the Mycenaean era, suggesting that the cult of Demeter may have initially been confined to select initiates. References in the Homeric Hymn to Demeter hint at the royal palace of King Kelios, providing further tantalizing glimpses into the mystery's ancient pedigree. Modern scholars have postulated that the Eleusinian mysteries were designed to transcend the boundaries of the mortal realm, elevating participants to divine status and bestowing upon them the promise of immortality. Some even speculate that these rites may have evolved from a Minoan cult, with Demeter herself believed to have originated as a poppy goddess hailing from the shores of Crete. Insights gleaned from the Mycenaean period shed light on precursor deities such as Despoina, an early manifestation of Persephone and Eletheia, the goddess of childbirth. The Megaron of Despoina at Lycosura bears striking resemblance to the Telesterion of Eleusius, suggesting a continuity of sacred traditions across disparate epics. Inscriptions discovered at Eleusius invoke the goddesses, alongside the agricultural deity Triptolemus, possibly the progeny of Gay and Oceanus, while the god and goddess Persephone and Ploton 
are accompanied by Eubuleus, the guide from the underworld. The mythological narrative unfolded in three distinct phases, the descent, the search, and the ascent. Eliciting a gamut of emotions from sorrow to exultation, ultimately stirring the mystery to ecstatic revelation. Thus, the mysteries emerge as a tapestry woven from the threads of ancient rites, mythological lore, and sacred traditions. A testament to humanity's perennial quest for transcendence and divine communion. Now, as we had mentioned, at the heart of the mysteries lay the poignant tale of Persephone's ascent to the underworld, or from the underworld, and her joyous reunion with her mother Demeter. The essence of the rituals was captured in the symbolic gesture of pouring out vessels towards the heavens and the earth as the assembled faithful intoned a magical chant invoking rain and conception, a potent invocation of fertility and renewal. Central to the mysteries was the ritual of the divine child, symbolized by the initiation of a youth from the hearth, the sacred flame representing the divine fire of creation. In ancient inscription, the term pays or child is invoked, echoing the mythological significance of the ritual, which finds resonance in the Homeric hymn through its connection with the agricultural deity Triptolemus. A climactic moment of the celebration was the solemn cutting of an ear of grain in silence, a poignant symbol of the burgeoning force of new life and the cyclical rhythms of nature. While the concept of immortality may not have initially permeated the mysteries, initiates believed in the promise of a better fate in the underworld, a transition akin to the growth of a plant from a buried seed, symbolizing death as a prelude to renewal. Ancient depictions from sites like the Palace of Faustos vividly capture the imagery of Persephone's ascent portraying a deity emerging from the earth with outstretched arms, reminiscent of course of a blooming flower, an enduring symbol of resurrection and regeneration. The mysteries were celebrated in two distinct phases. The lesser mysteries held annually in early spring, and the greater mysteries occurring once a year, with special grandeur every fourth year in the Penetiris. Initiation into the mysteries was a gradual process, with candidates admitted to the greater mysteries only in the following year, in September. That's quite a long waiting list, of course. Under the patronage of Pesistratos of Athens, the mysteries evolved into a pan-Hellenic phenomenon. That means all over Greece, by the way. Attracting pilgrims from across Greece and beyond. Around 300 BC, 
state control over the mysteries led to a surge in initiates. With membership open to all who met the criteria of freedom from blood guilt and proficiency in Greek language. Affirming the inclusive nature of these sacred rites, which welcomed men, women, and even slaves into their fold. The participants of the Eleusinian Mysteries comprised four distinct categories, each with its role and significance within the sacred rituals. Priests and priestesses and hierophants. These individuals held the esteemed position of guiding and officiating the ceremonies. They were entrusted with the sacred rites and the interpretation of the mysteries, serving as the custodians of the ancient traditions and knowledge. Initiates those who underwent the initiation ceremony for the first time belonged to this category. Initiates embarked on a journey of spiritual transformation, symbolizing rebirth and renewal as they delved into the profound mysteries of Demeter and Persephone. Experienced Participants Individuals who had previously participated in the mysteries at least once were classified in this group. Having already undergone the initial stages of initiation, they were considered eligible for further enlightenment and deeper understanding of the mysteries. Epoptea attainees, the highest echelon of participants, those who had attained epoptea or contemplation, represented the culmination of the initiatory journey. Having learned the secrets of the greatest mysteries of Demeter, they were granted profound insights into the eternal truths and the divine order of the cosmos. Each category of participants played a crucial role in the unfolding of the Eleusinian mysteries, contributing to the collective experience of spiritual enlightenment and communion with the divine Though their participation and dedication, they sought to unlock the secrets of existence and attain a deeper understanding of the mysteries of life and death. The priesthood itself of the Eleusinian Mysteries was structured into various offices, each tasked with specific responsibilities and duties. These officers were vital in conducting the sacred rituals and ceremonies of the mysteries. So here are the six categories of priests who officiated over the event. Hierophantes this was the highest ranking male priest, serving as the male high priest of the sanctuary. The office of Hierophantes was typically inherited within the distinguished Philidae or Eumolopidae families, ensuring a lineage of priestly authority and knowledge. High Priestess of Demeter, or Priestess of Demeter and Kor. Similarly, this was the highest ranking female priest, 
tasked with overseeing the sacred rites and ceremonies dedicated to Demeter and Persephone. Like the Hierophants, this office was inherited within the Philidae or Eumolpidae families. Dadokos Men who served as torchbearers held this esteemed position, considered the second highest male role in the priesthood hierarchy. Their role involved carrying and lighting torches during the ceremonies, symbolizing illumination and guidance through the mysteries. Dadokosa Priestess This female priestess assisted the Dadokos in their duties, providing support and participation in the ceremonial activities. Like the High Priestess, this office was also inherited within the Philidae or Eumorbidae families. Well, it looks like those families had quite the monopoly on the event, didn't they? Hierophantides This category consisted of two married priestesses, one dedicated to serving Demeter and the other to serving Persephone. Their role was to embody the divine aspects of the goddesses and contribute to the enactment of the mysteries. Panageus, the Holy, or Melisse, the Bees. This group of priestesses lived a secluded life away from men devoting themselves entirely to the sacred duties and rituals of the mysteries. Their role was to maintain the purity and sanctity of the sanctuary environment. The officers of the Hierophant, High Priestesses, and Dadokosa Priestess were exclusively inherited within the aforementioned Philidae and Eumolpidae families. They wanted a hereditary lineage of authority and continuity, passing down the knowledge from father to son and mother to daughter. Now, the High Priestess played a particularly significant role, impersonating the goddess Demeter and Persephone during the enactment of the mysteries, and events at Eleusis were often dated by the name of the reigning high priestess rather than the high priest. Now, while they were shrouded in such secrecy, they held a profound significance for those who were initiated into the rites. Of course, much of the concrete information about these mysteries remains undocumented, hence the name. Certain glimpses into their sacred practices have been preserved through historical accounts. I bet you've been looking forward to this. Well, let's get well and truly into it then. Hmm? Now one such account actually comes from a Roman named Hippolytus, a church father writing in the early 3rd century AD. In his work titled Refutation of All Heresies, Hippolytus reveals a tantalizing detail about the highest grade of initiation in the mysteries. He discloses that during the initiation process, 
the Athenians revealed to the initiates a mighty and marvelous and most perfect secret suitable for one initiated into the highest mystic truths. The secret is described as an ear of grain in silence reaped. What is that secret? Well, it seems they were very good at keeping this secret, as we don't really know. Perhaps one day we will find out, akin to that question of asking what is the meaning of life. Perhaps it is just one of those questions we are not meant to know. The enigmatic revelation hints at the profound symbolism embedded within the mysteries. The ear of grain, a potent symbol for fertility and growth, and the cycles of life and death, was harvested in silence, emphasizing the sacred and mysterious nature of the act. To the initiated, this ritual likely held deep spiritual significance, embodying themes of renewal, transformation, and the eternal mysteries of existence. Furthermore, the secrecy surrounding the contents, uh, such as the quiste, which was a kind of sacred chest, and a lidded basket called the calathus, underscores the exclusive nature of the mysteries. Only those who were initiated into the highest grades were privy to the mysteries contained within these revered artifacts, adding layers of intrigue and reverence to the ancient rituals. In essence, while the specifics of the mysteries may remain to this day veiled in secrecy, fragments of their profound wisdom and symbolism continue to captivate the imagination and intrigue of scholars and YouTube listeners alike, offering a tantalizing glimpse into the ancient rites that once held sway over the hearts and minds of these initiates. Well, if I'm holding sway over you today, perhaps you'd like the video, subscribe to the channel, and, as a bonus for the algorithm, leave your comments down below. I always reply, say something nice, and I'll say something nice back. So, what did the mysteries encompass? Well, there were two distinct ceremonies, being the lesser and the greater mysteries, both holding the promise of profound spiritual insight and transformation for those who initiated themselves into them. According to the philosopher Thomas Taylor, the lesser mysteries symbolically represented the struggles of the soul while bound to the physical body. In contrast, the greater mysteries offered initiates mystical visions that hinted at the soul's ultimate bliss and enlightenment beyond the material realm. The lesser mysteries held in the month of Anthesteria during midwinter, served as a preliminary stage for the initiation into the deeper truths of the greater mysteries. Initiates seeking entry into the greater mysteries would first sacrifice a piglet to Demeter and Persephone, and then undergo ritual purification in the sacred waters of the river Ilissos. 
upon completion of the lesser mysteries, participants were deemed worthy of progressing to the greater mysteries, which took place in Boedromion, the third month of the Attic calendar, during late summer. Remember that this is somewhat before the Julian calendar, the solar calendar that we are familiar with. This elaborate ceremony spanned ten days and encompassed various rites and rituals, each of profound significance. The festivals commenced on the 14th of Boedromion, with the transportation of sacred objects from Eleusis to the Eleusinion, a temple situated at the base of the Acropolis of Athens. The following day, known as the Gathering, marked the official commencement of the rites, accompanied by solemn sacrifices and declarations by the priests. The initiates, known as the Halade Mystae, embarked on a symbolic journey on the 16th of Boedromion, washing themselves in the sea at Phaleron as part of their purification ritual. The subsequent days saw elaborate processions, feasts, and rituals, culminating in the all-important procession to Eleusis on the 18th. Along the sacred way to Eleusis, participants engaged in various symbolic acts, including the swinging of branches and shouting of obscenities in offer, honor rather, to the mythical figure Iambe. This sounds like a typical Friday night in my city, actually, particularly with the shouting of obscenities. Upon reaching Eleusis, Initiates participated in an all-night vigil, perhaps symbolizing Demeter's search for her missing daughter Persephone. Central to the mysteries was the consumption of a special drink known as Kikion, made from barley and fenroyal. Speculation abounds regarding the potential psychotropic effects of this concoction, with some theories suggesting the presence of ergot, a fungus containing psychedelic alkaloids. Recent archaeological finds, including the discovery of ergot fragments in a temple dedicated to the Eleusinian goddesses, have lent credence to the hypothesis of Ergot's inclusion in the Kikeon. Such discoveries underscore the intricate and mysterious nature of the mysteries, offering tantalizing clues to their profound spiritual significance and the transformative experiences they offered to initiates. Well, I'm sure it would have been quite profound and quite spiritual after you had drank so much Kikeon that you couldn't remember where your elbows were. Very spiritual, very new age indeed. On the 19th of Boedromion, a pivotal moment arrived for the initiates of the Eleusinian Mysteries as they entered the revered Telestrion, a grand hall surrounded in mystery and sanctity. At its center stood the Anactoron, the palace, constructed from ancient ruins dating back to the Mycenaean age, accessible only to the highest ranking hierophants. Within this sacred space, Precious objects of divine significance were carefully stored, guarded by the initiated priests. 
before gaining entry into the Telesterion. Initiates would solemnly recite a declaration, affirming their readiness for the sacred experience. This declaration included acknowledgement of fasting, consumption of the Kikaeon, and respectful interaction with the sacred objects housed within the Kiste, box, and the Calathus, the open basket. It is widely believed that the rituals conducted within the Telesterion comprised three essential elements, collectively known as the unrepeatables, or in Greek, aporheta. These elements included dromena, the enactment of sacred dramas depicting the mythological narrative, deknumena, the display of sacred objects as symbols, with the Hierophant assuming a central role, and Legomena, the spoken commentaries and explanations accompanying the ritual actions. Now you've got to remember, the secrecy surrounding these rituals was paramount. And of course, the one rule about Eleusinian Mysteries Club is that you don't talk about Eleusinian Mysteries Club. Therefore, the penalty for divulging its core rituals was quite severe, i.e. they would kill you. You can't get much more severe than that. Historical accounts mention individuals who faced dire consequences for breaching the oath of secrecy. Diagoras of Melos, for instance, was condemned to death in Athens for revealing the mysteries, while Aeschylus, the renowned playwright, was purportedly tried for similar offences. But luckily for him, he was ultimately acquitted. The absolute ban on disclosing the inner workings of the mysteries underscores the profound reverence and sanctity with which they were regarded. Consequently, very little is known about the precise details of the rituals conducted within the Telesterion, as the secrecy surrounding them was rigorously upheld all throughout antiquity. Regarding the climax of the Eleusinian Mysteries, modern scholars have two main theories. One perspective suggests that the culmination of the mysteries involved the priests revealing profound visions of the holy night to the initiates. These visions included symbolic representations such as holy sacred fire, symbolizing the promise of life after death, along with other sacred objects. According to this view, the priests played a central role in guiding the initiates through the revelatory experiences. However, some scholars find this explanation insufficient to fully account for the profound impact and enduring significance of the mysteries. They argue that the experiences of the initiates during the climax of the rites were likely internal and subjective, possibly mediated by the ingestion of that Kikaeon drink with all of its lovely goodies inside. This theory, known as the entheogenic theory, posits that the psychoactive properties of the Kikaeon induced altered states of consciousness, 
facilitating mystical or transcendent experiences among the inmates. And think about it. If there was a cult down the road from you, a group of people in strange colourful clothes, all with goatees, chanting around a fire and whatever else they do, claiming that they would have some sort of spiritual insight during their rituals, of course you would view this with some kind of suspicion. Indeed, even the people in the world of antiquity would most likely have some questions to ask. Now added to this, if this cult down the road from you in your town said that they gained these spiritual visions and wisdom, this enlightenment, after they drank this magic potion that was made by the cult leader, would you not approach that with even more skepticism? Now. I don't want to ruin anybody's fun, because indeed the mysteries are something interesting for us to look at, but we have to engage in some analysis of what was or could have been happening. Well, enough about that, as it is just modern speculation. Now, following that pivotal section in the mysteries, participants engaged in an all-night feast known as the Panicus, characterized by lively dancing and joyful celebration. Now, that sounds like my kind of cult. Unlike the secretive rituals held within the Telesterion, this part of the festivities was open to the public, allowing for communal revelry and shared camaraderie among participants. A big party for completing the pilgrimage. The dancers of the Panicus were performed in the Rarian field, a location also steeped in myth and symbolism. It was actually, in Greek tradition, believed to be the site where grain was first cultivated. Now that is some mythological significance. Additionally, a bull sacrifice typically occurred late into the night, or early the next morning, further emphasizing the sacred and ritualistic nature of the event. On the 22nd day of Boedromion, a day following the conclusion of the Panicus, initiates paid homage to the deceased by offering libations from special vessels, symbolizing reverence for the cycle of life and death. Finally, on the 23rd of Boedromion, the Eleusinian Mysteries would officially conclude, and participants all shook hands, said goodbye, and returned to their respective homes, having undergone a profound transformative experience that transcended the boundaries of their ordinary and perhaps mundane by comparison existence. Now, jumping forward a little bit. In 170 AD, the Temple of Demeter suffered devastation at the hands of the Sarmatians, who sacked the sacred site. However, the temple was reconstructed under the patronage of Marcus Aurelius, my boy, a Roman emperor known for his philosophical pursuits. Go onto Amazon or perhaps a more ethical bookstore and buy his book The Meditations. You will not regret it. 
Remarkably, Marcus Aurelius was granted the rare privilege of being the only lay person permitted to enter the Anactoron, the inner sanctum of the temple. But things were about to change. Just as the Roman world was changing, Greece was changing, everything was going to change. As Christianity gained ascendancy in the 4th and 5th centuries, the prestige of Eleusis began to fade away. The burgeoning influence of Christianity led to a decline in interest and participation in the Eleusinian mysteries. However, a brief resurgence occurred during the reign of the Roman Emperor Julian from 361 to 63 AD. Hmm, quite a brief reign indeed. Julian, who was also known as Julian the Apostate, due to his rejection of Christianity, sought to revive the Eleusinian mysteries, recognizing their cultural and religious significance. Julian became the last emperor to undergo initiation into the mysteries before their eventual demise. The final blow to the Eleusinian mysteries came in 392 AD during the reign of the Christian Emperor Theodosius I. Theodosius, known for his fervent promotion of Christianity and suppression of paganism, ordered the official closure of the mysteries. This edict marked the end of an era signalling the demise of one of antiquity's most revered religious traditions. Eunapius, a historian and biographer of Greek philosophers, chronicled the demise of the Eleusinian mysteries. He reported that the last legitimate hierophant, entrusted with the task of preserving the mysteries, was a figure commissioned by Emperor Julian. However, by the time of Eunapius's account, the mysteries had fallen into disrepair, and the last Hierophant was regarded as a usurper, lacking the true authority to uphold the ancient tradition. In 396 AD, Further devastation befell Eleusius when Alaric I, the king of the Goths, launched a raiding campaign in Attica. Accompanied by Christian monks, Alaric and his forces pillaged the remnants of the sacred shrines, symbolizing the final chapter in the decline of the Eleusinian Mysteries. I'm not crying. You're crying. Well, despite the destruction of the formal Eleusinian Mysteries, of course, remnants of the cult persisted in rural Greece, away from the prying eyes of those city slickers local peasants and shepherds, seeking continuity with their ancient religious practices, gradually incorporated elements of Demeter's rites into their worship of Saint Demetrius of Thessaloniki. Over time, Saint Demetrius became revered as the local patron of agriculture inheriting aspects of both the legacy of the pagan mother goddess, Demeter. This syncretism reflects the enduring resilience of religious traditions 
in the face of cultural transformation and upheaval. Well, perhaps the Eleusinian mysteries still continue out there to this day, in the far-off parts of the Greek countryside. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure, once again, to talk about the ancient world with you. Of course, at the rate of the content coming out, we will be moving on to later periods. But the exploration of history continues to march on on this channel. Epicurus, 341 to 270 BC, was a Greek philosopher who founded the school of Epicureanism a significant school of philosophy. Born on the island of Samos to Athenian parents, Epicurus established his own school in Athens. The school was known as the Garden. Influenced by Democritus, Aristippus, Pyrrho, and potentially the Cynics. He diverged from contemporary Platonism. Epicurus and his followers recognized for simple meals and diverse philosophical discussions welcomed women and slaves into their school. While over 300 of Epicurus's works are now lost, surviving materials include three letters, two collections of quotes, and some fragments. Knowledge about his philosophy primarily comes from latter authors, such as Diogenes Laertius, Lucretius, and Philodemus, as well as accounts by Sextus Empiricus and Cicero. Epicurus, an ancient Greek philosopher, emphasized the pursuit of happy and tranquil lives, characterized by ataraxia, peace, and aponia, absence of pain. He believed that living a self-sufficient life, surrounded by friends, was key to practicing philosophy. Epicurus taught that the fear of death, rooted in the assumption of its horror, causes unnecessary anxiety and selfish behaviors. According to him, death is the end of both body and soul, and hence should not be feared. Epicurus asserted that ethical actions should be driven by internal guilt rather than external rewards or punishment from the gods. Drawing on Democritus's ideas, Epicurus developed a physics and cosmology asserting that the universe is infinite and eternal, and all matters is composed of tiny, invisible particles called atoms. These atoms, according to Epicurus, move and interact in empty space, causing natural events. He introduced the concept of the atomic swerve, suggesting that atoms may deviate from their expected paths, allowing for human free will in an otherwise deterministic universe. While Epicureanism gained popularity during the late Roman Republic, it faced opposition, particularly from early Christianity, leading to its decline in late antiquity. Epicurus was 
mischaracterized during the Middle Ages, but experienced a revival in the 15th century with the rediscovery of important texts. In the 17th century, Pierre Gassendi revived modified Epicurean ideas, gaining acceptance and influencing major Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, Jeremy Bentham, and even Karl Marx. Right, now, what an introduction. I think we can now discuss the philosophy of Epicureanism, but before we do, I'll remind you that if you enjoy this content, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. I have a new channel here on YouTube, and while trying to get one video minimum out per day, I hope that I can grow the channel and reach more people. Well, with that, let us digress to our topic for today, and discuss the philosophy of Epicurus. Epicureanism, founded around 307 BC, is of course based on the teachings of Epicurus. It was a philosophical system rooted in materialism, inspired by thinkers like Democritus. Epicureanism emphasized religious skepticism, rejecting superstition and divine intervention, while often associated with hedonism due to its pursuit of pleasure. Epicureanism distinguished itself by asserting that the absence of pain and fear constitutes the greatest pleasure. The philosophy advocated for a simple life, seeking tranquility, ataraxia, and the absence of bodily pain, aponia, through knowledge and limiting desires. Epicurus, influenced by Aristippus, believed that the greatest good was to find modest and sustainable pleasure. He encouraged understanding the workings of the world to achieve tranquility and freedom from fear. Epicureans generally withdrew from politics, viewing it as a potentially conflicting with their pursuit of virtue and peace of mind. Only a few writings by Epicurus have survived, including three letters and a list of principal doctrines. The epic poem, De Rerum Natura, by Lucretius, serves as a comprehensive presentation of Epicurean ideas. Additionally, scrolls from the Villa of the Papyri in Herculaneum contain works by Epicurean philosophers like Philodemus, and Zeno of Sidon. The philosophy thrived in the late Hellenistic and Roman eras, with Epicurean communities established in various locations. However, by the late 3rd century CE, Epicureanism declined, opposed by philosophies like Neoplatonism. It did, however, experience a revival during the Age of Enlightenment, and it remains a subject of interest to the modern era. Epicurus established teaching centers in Mytilene and Lampascus before acquiring a property in Athens known as the Garden, which became the namesake of his school. Members of the school, including Hermarchus, Idomeneus, Colotes, 
Polyanus and Metrodorus formed a community that embraced friendship as a crucial element of happiness. The school, although moderately ascetic, rejected political prominence in Athenian philosophy and welcomed individuals from diverse backgrounds. As we aforementioned, everybody was welcome in the garden. Women and slaves would often show up to give their opinion or even learn something new. Of course, we at ASMR Historian welcome everybody. So tell your friends. Epicurus's teachings gained popularity, and his school, along with other philosophical schools like Stoicism, Platonism, and Pyrrhonism, became dominant in Hellenistic philosophy. The Garden School endured through the later Roman Empire, as evidenced by carbonized scrolls found in the villa of the Papyri in Herculaneum, containing works by Philodemus and Epicurus himself. Epicureanism found favor with notable figures, such as Julius Caesar, who leaned considerably towards its philosophy. Caesar's father-in-law, Lucius Calpurnicus Piso Chesedoninus, was also an adept of the school, and had a very difficult name to pronounce. Pardon me. In the 2nd century CE, comedian Lucian of Samosata and wealthy philosopher Diogenes were prominent Epicureans. And by the way, that's not the Diogenes that you know, that's the uh, Diogenes of Aeonanda. However, by the late 3rd century CE, Epicureanism experienced that decline with the rise of Neoplatonism and later Christianity, which, after being severely oppressed themselves, took the opportunity to start doing the oppressing. After this had happened, there were very little traces of Epicureanism to be found. Physics Epicurean physics posited that the entire universe comprised of two fundamental components, those components being matter and void. Matter, composed of atoms, possessed unchanging qualities of shape, size, and weight. The Epicureans believed in the stability of atoms because they considered the world to be ordered, and any changes needed specific and consistent sources. For example, a plant species would only grow from a seed of the same species. According to Epicurus, the ultimate constituents of the universe had to be unchanging to ensure the universe's persistence. Otherwise, it essentially would end up destroyed. Epicurus asserted the necessity of an infinite supply of atoms, although there could only be a finite number of types of atoms. Additionally, an infinite amount of void was essential for the functioning of this materialistic and atomistic worldview. Epicurus expounded on those principles in his letter to Herodotus. Moreover, the sum of things is unlimited both by reason of the multitude of atoms and by reason of the extent of the void. For if the void were infinite and bodies finite, the bodies would not have stayed anywhere but would have been dispersed in their course throughout the infinite void, 
not having any supports or counterchecks to send them back on their upward rebound. Again, if the void were finite, the infinite of bodies would have nowhere to go, and wouldn't have anywhere to be. Stay with me, I know it's complex. In the Epicurean cosmology, the infinite supply of atoms implies the existence of an infinite number of worlds. These worlds could vary widely, with some being drastically different from our own, and others bearing striking similarities. The separation between these worlds was conceptualized as vast regions of void, referred to as metacosmia. As cosmological framework allowed for a diverse array of worlds coexisting within this infinite expanse of the universe. In Epicureanism, atoms are considered indivisible and incapable of future breakdown because the presence of void is necessary for the movement of matter. Anything comprising both void and matter can be disintegrated, while substances devoid of void and lack the potential for fragmentation. As no part of the substance can be broken down into smaller components, atoms exhibit constant motion in one of four ways. They can collide with each other and rebound, vibrate while joined to form a larger object, move downward at a uniform speed when not hindered by other atoms, and undergo a random swerving motion. This downward motion is considered natural for atoms. However, the swerving motion, their fourth means of movement, introduces an element of randomness into the equation. This swerving is crucial for the formation of the universe, as atoms, by swerving and colliding with each other, lead to the creation of objects. Without this swerving, atoms would remain isolated, perpetually moving downward at a consistent speed. Epicurus attributed the swerve to the creation of the universe, and also connected it to human free will. The swerve, according to Epicurus, allows for a human autonomy by breaking the chain of deterministic cause and effect. This stance served as a critique for Democritus' atomic theory within Epicurean philosophy. Epistemology Epicurean philosophy employs a empirical epistemology, one based on the senses. Sense perception. According to Epicureans, the functioning of the senses also involved atoms. Objects emitted particles continually, which would interact with observers and serve as the basis for all sensory experiences, such as sight, smell, or sound. While the emitted atoms did not possess the qualities perceived by the senses, the manner of their emissions caused observers to experience these sensations. For example, red particles emitted were not red themselves, but were emitted in a way that induced the viewer to perceive the color red. These emitted atoms are not individually perceived, but are instead sensed as a continuous experience due to their rapid movement. The Epicurean perspective held that all sense perceptions were inherently true, 
and any errors arose from judgments made about those perceptions. These judgments could be verified and corrected through additional sensory information. For instance, if somebody initially saw a tower from a distance and judged it to be round, but upon approaching it they realized that it was square, they would recognize the error in their initial judgment and correct their opinion based on the new information obtained through closer inspection. Criterion of Truth Epicurus proposed three criteria of truth, those being sensations, preconceptions, and feelings. Later Epicureans added a fourth criterion called Presentational Applications of the Mind. These criteria served as the foundation for the Epicurean method of acquiring knowledge. For Epicureans, sensations were considered the first and primary criterion of truth, as they believed sensations could not deceive, even in cases where sensory input seemed misleading. Epicureans argued that the input itself was true, and any error arose from judgments about that input. For example, when placing a straight oar into water, it may appear bent. Epicureans would explain that the atoms forming the image of the oar traveling to the observer's eyes had shifted arriving in the shape of a bent oar. The error, according to Epicureans, was in assuming that the received image accurately represented the oar without distortion. To avoid making erroneous judgments about perceivable things, Epicureans emphasized the need for clear vision obtained through closer examination. Clear vision is described as the sensation of an unchanged object, free from judgment or opinions, providing a clear and direct perception that serves as justification for one's judgments about the perceived object. In Epicureanism, an individual's preconceptions refer to their concepts of what things are, formed in the mind through sensory input over time. When words related to preconceptions are used, the mind summons these concepts into the person's thoughts. Preconceptions play a crucial role in making judgments about perceived things. They also serve to address the leaning paradox, learning paradox rather, proposed by Plato in the Meno which argues that learning requires prior knowledge of what is being learned. Epicureans posit that the preconceptions provide individuals with the necessary pre-knowledge for learning. Feelings or emotions in Epicureanism are how individuals perceive pleasure and pain. Similar to sensations, Feelings are a means of perception, but they pertain to the internal state rather than to external things. According to Diogenes Laertius, feelings play a role in determining our actions, with pleasurable experiences prompting pursuit and painful experiences leading to avoidance. The concept of presentational applications of the mind explains how individuals can discuss and inquire about things that cannot be directly perceived. In this context, impressions of such things are received directly in the mind, bypassing other senses. 
This concept may have been introduced to account for how individuals learn about things that are not directly perceivable, such as the gods and spiritual matters. Ethics Epicureanism builds its ethical framework on a hedonistic perspective, considering pleasure as the primary good in life. Epicurus advocated living in a manner that maximizes pleasure over one's lifetime, but recommended moderation to avoid the suffering associated with excessive indulgence in pleasure. The philosophy encourages deriving the greatest amount of pleasure while maintaining a balanced and temperate lifestyle. Epicurus expressed reservations about passionate love and advised against marriage, viewing recreational sex as natural but non-essential desire that is generally best avoided. The emphasis on avoiding excessive desires aligns with the overall goal of minimizing sources of potential pain and maximizing pleasure. Participation in politics was discouraged by Epicurus, as engagement in the political sphere could give rise to desires that might disrupt virtue and inner tranquility such as the craving for power or a desire for fame. Additionally, Epicurus aimed to alleviate the fear of the gods and of death, considering these fears as major sources of turmoil in life. By eliminating these fears, individuals could attain a more peaceful and content existence according to Epicurean philosophy. Pleasure Epicureans had a specific perspective on the nature of pleasure, and their ethical focus centered on the avoidance of pain rather than the active pursuit of pleasure. They argued that nature seems to command the avoidance of pain, a principle observable in the behavior of all animals, as they instinctively seek to avoid pain as much as possible. Epicurean philosophy classified pleasure into two main categories, pleasures of the body and pleasures of the mind. Pleasures of the body involved sensory experiences such as enjoying delicious food, or being in a state of comfort, free from pain. These pleasures are momentary, and exist only in the present. Pleasures of the mind, on the other hand, involve mental processes and states, such as feelings of joy, the absence of fear, and pleasant memories. Unlike pleasures of the body, pleasures of the mind extend beyond the present, existing in the past and future through memory and anticipation. The Epicureans distinguish between kinetic pleasure, involving action or change, and catastomatic pleasure, relating to a stable state. Two key catastomatic pleasures emphasized by Epicurus were aponia and ataraxia, the aforementioned absence of physical pain and freedom from disturbance in the mind, respectively. While kinetic pleasures were associated with actions like eating or fulfilling desires, Catastomatic pleasures were linked to stable states, such as the absence of thirst or freedom from fear. Although the pursuit of pleasure was not 
central to Epicurean philosophy, the primary focus was on the static pleasures, which involved minimizing pain, anxiety, and suffering. Epicureans believed that the greatest pleasure one could attain was the complete removal of all forms of pain, both physical and mental. The ultimate goal of Epicurean ethics was to achieve a state of aponia and ataraxia, signifying the absence of physical pain and mental disturbance respectively. Not a bad goal, I've heard worse. Now we read from the Vatican sayings of Epicurus, one of the sources we have that was written by him himself. And I quote from the manuscript, I learn that your body inclination leans most keenly towards sexual intercourse. If you neither violate the laws nor disturb well-established morals, nor sadden someone close to you, nor strain the body, nor spend what is needed for necessities, use your own choice as you wish. It is sure difficult to imagine, however, that none of these would be part of sex, because sex never benefited anyone. Well, maybe he was doing it wrong. Let's continue. Epicureans emphasize the importance of controlling desires as a means to achieve aponia and ataraxia, the ultimate goals of their ethical philosophy. Desires were categorized into three classes, natural and necessary desires, being number one. These are limited desires that are inherent to human nature and are essential for happiness, freedom from bodily discomfort, or survival. A few examples of this can include the desire for clothing, shelter, and necessary food. These desires were considered legitimate and justified. Number two being natural, but not necessary desires. Think of a want rather than a need, but with some logic behind it. These desires are also innate to humans, but are not really required for happiness or survival. They may include wants such as enjoying delicious food while hungry instead of eating something bland. Epicureans cautioned against indulging in these desires as they were seen as unnecessary and, at times, detrimental to the overall picture of happiness. Pursuing these desires could lead to false beliefs about their necessity and result in efforts that do not significantly enhance one's well-being. Now the final one of these, and way down on the hierarchy, is vain and empty desires. These desires neither innate to humans nor necessary for happiness health, or even survival. They are limitless and can never be fully satisfied. Examples include desires for excessive wealth or fame. Epicureans strongly discouraged these desires, as they were believed to bring about only discomfort and contribute to an unending cycle of unfulfilled wants. According to Epicurus himself, by following only natural and necessary desires, and suppressing unnecessary and artificially produced desires, individuals could attain aponia and ataraxia, leading to the highest form of happiness. The emphasis was on simplicity, moderation, and aligning one's natural desires with what is genuinely essential for a content and tranquil life.
politics. The Epicurean perspective on justice was grounded in self-interest and mutual benefit. Justice was considered good because it is believed to be mutually advantageous. The fear of punishment for unjust actions and the resulting disturbance and unhappiness it would bring discouraged individuals from acting unjustly, even if their actions initially went unnoticed. Epicurus contributed to the development of the concept of justice as a social contract distinct from divine decree. According to Epicureanism, justice is an agreement among people not to harm each other. This social contract serves as the purpose of protecting individuals from harm, allowing them the freedom to pursue happiness. Laws that do not contribute to human happiness were considered unjust in this framework. Epicurus presented a unique version of the ethic of reciprocity, emphasizing the minimization of harm and the maximization of happiness for oneself and others. Epicurean political ideas diverged from other philosophical traditions such as Stoicism, Platonism and Aristotelianism. Epicureans viewed social relations based on perceptions, customs and traditions. Inherent superiority or domination of one person over another was rejected, as all individuals were seen as made of the same atomic material and therefore were naturally equal. While Epicureans generally discouraged political participation, they were not entirely apolitical. Some political associations were considered potentially beneficial if they contributed to the person's individual pleasure and helped avoid physical or mental disease. The emphasis was on individual well-being within the social context. So, let us think about if a person is pursuing wealth for a bad reason. Well, that would be against Epicurean morality, wouldn't it? However, let us say one is pursuing wealth so as they can give a good life to their family and do good things with the resources that they have acquired. Well, this is in line with the virtues of the Epicureans. Everything is going to depend on the context. Friendship Epicurus placed a significant emphasis on the importance of cultivating friendships as a foundation for a fulfilling and satisfying life. The Epicurean ideal was the avoidance or freedom from hardship or fear while it was acknowledged that political means could potentially achieve this goal, Epicurus insisted that involvement in politics would not lead to the desired release from fear. Consequently, he generally advised against pursuing a life in this career path and told people to avoid politics. Epicurus also discouraged the idea of contributing to political society by starting a family. According to his philosophy, the potential benefits of having a wife and children were outweighed by the troubles and anxieties associated with family life. Instead, Epicurus advocated for the formation of a community of virtuous friends outside of the traditional political state. This community would focus on internal affairs and justice. However, Epicureanism was 
adaptable to circumstances, including its approach to politics. This philosophy recognized that the same approaches might not always work in protecting individuals from pain and fear. In some situations, it might have been more beneficial to have a family, while in others, participating in politics might be the preferred course of action. Ultimately, Epicureans were encouraged to analyze their circumstances and take actions that best suited the situation, aligning with the core principle of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain in the pursuit of a content and tranquil life. Now, do remember the allegory of the oar in the water. When we look at the oar in the water, even though it is straight, we may perceive it as bent. So perhaps when we think about things like having a family, or entering a certain career path, we may need to re-examine our perspective to gain a better picture on what direction we should take. And now on to the direction that we all must take. Death. Epicureanism rejects the concept of immortality and suggests a view of the soul as mortal and material, akin to the body that it resides in. According to Epicurus, the soul, like the body, is also subject to mortality. This philosophical perspective extends to the rejection of an afterlife. Epicurus firmly asserted that there is no need to fear death, as it's simply the dissolution of sensation. In his own words, he says, Death is nothing to us, for that which is dissolved is without sensation, and that which lacks sensation is nothing to us. The Epicurean perspective on death is encapsulated in the famous Epicurean epitaph Non fui fui, non sum non curo And I'm very sorry if it sounded like an Asian language then, but I do my best with the Latin. Now it essentially translates to I was not, I have been, I am not, I do not mind. This epitaph reflects the idea that after death, there is no consciousness or awareness, and hence, there is nothing to fear or be concerned about. This sentiment is often inscribed on the gravestones of Epicurus's followers and on many ancient tombstones throughout the Roman Empire, encapsulating the philosophy's perspective on mortality and the acceptance of the natural course of life. Gods Epicureanism does not outright deny the existence of gods, no, but rather it asserts that the gods, if they do indeed exist, do not intervene or interfere with human lives or the natural order of the universe. The philosophy rejects the idea that natural events, such as frightening weather phenomena, are manifestations of divine retribution. The key aspect of Epicurean teachings is to alleviate the fear associated with the actions of the gods. The nature of the existence of the Epicurean gods is a topic of debate. Some scholars argue for the realist position, suggesting that Epicureans conceive of the gods as actual, material beings, existing independently of the human mind. In this view, the gods are immortal, and, once again, composed of atoms, 
residing somewhere in the broader reality. Perhaps out there, flying around in that void that we had aforementioned. However, the gods are completely detached from the affairs of the universe and remain undisturbed by it. Now, according to this perspective, the gods inhabit the Metacosmia, that space between worlds. On the other hand, the idealist position suggests that the gods exist only as idealized forms within the human mind. In this interpretation, the gods are seen as representations or ideals of the best human life, serving as aspirational figures rather than actual independent beings. Scholars like A. A. Long and David Sedley have argued in favour for this idealist position, and it's worthwhile listening to them. While the debate between these two positions continues, the prevailing viewpoint at present leans towards the realist position. Scholars have yet to reach a consensus on this matter within the field of Epicurean studies. And, realistically, perhaps they never will. But what do you think? Do you think that the gods are really out there? Do you think that with all of their power and views to the universe, they would care about the little things that we're doing? Or do you think that they are just made up in the back of the minds of people who want to have some good stories to tell their children among the campfires of early civilizations? Whatever the case is, they serve as an interesting allegory to how humans develop their heroes and how we keep ourselves in line. Well, we have reached the end of our talk on Epicureanism today, but it's certainly not the end of the topic. You may perhaps like to read some Epicurus yourself. I highly advise you do so. You may perhaps grant a, yourself a new perspective on life and learn some ideas that you had previously not thought of. I am the ASMR historian. I'd like to thank you once again for joining me. And I would like to once again wish you good night and sweet dreams. Pericles, born around 495 BC in Athens, was the son of Xanthippus, a politician who returned to Athens after being ostracized and played a role in the Greek victory at Mycale. His mother, Agariste, belonged to the influential Alcmeonide family, who had familial ties to both the Athenian reformer Cleisthenes and the tyrant of Sicyon, also named Cleisthenes. Legend has it that before Pericles' birth, Agariste dreamt of bearing a lion, a symbol of greatness. Some interpretations connect the lion to Pericles' unusually large skull. Mocked by comedians at the time who called him Squillhead. Contrary to Plutarch's claim, the helmet Pericles wore was a symbol of his rank as Strategos, not an attempt to conceal any deformity. Pericles, a member of the Acamantus tribe, spent his early years in relative quiet, avoiding public appearances 
and dedicating himself to his studies. His family's wealth facilitated his pursuit of education, and he studied music under masters like Daemon or Pythocleides. Notably, he was the first politician to emphasize the importance of philosophy and associated with philosophers such as Protagoras, Zeno of Elia, and especially Anaxagoras, who became a close friend and influential figure. Anaxagoras's teachings emphasizing emotional calm and skepticism about divine phenomena, may have shaped Pericles' thought and rhetorical charisma. Pericles' legendary calmness and self-control are often attributed to the influence of his good friend Anaxagoras. In 472, Pericles, showcasing his wealth, presented Aeschylus' play, The Persians, at the Greater Dionysia as a liturgy. Some suggest that Pericles' choice of this play, celebrating Themistocles' victory at Salamis, indicated support for Themistocles over his political rival, Simon. Plutarch claims that Pericles had a prominent position among the Athenians for forty years, suggesting leadership from the early 460s BC, when he was in his early or mid-thirties. Throughout this time, he sought to maintain his privacy and present himself as an exemplary citizen, often avoiding banquets to bring across his portrayal of frugality and self-control. In 463 BC, Pericles took a leading role in prosecuting Cimon, accusing him of neglecting Athens' interests in Macedon. Though Cimon was acquitted, this event exposed his vulnerability as Pericles' major political opponent. Around 461 BC, two years later, under the leadership of Ephialtes, a mentor to Pericles. The Democratic Party targeted the Areopagus, a council traditionally controlled by the aristocracy. Ephialtes proposed reducing the Areopagus's powers, and the proposal was accepted by the Athenian assembly. This marked the beginning of the radical democracy era. As the Democratic Party gained dominance, Pericles adopted a populist policy to appeal to the public. Aristotle suggests that this stance was a response to the generosity of his wealthy opponent, Cimon, who gained favor by distributing his considerable fortune. However, some also argue that Pericles had significant resources to make a political impact privately if he chose to do so. In 461, Pericles used ostracism to politically eliminate Cimon, accusing him of betraying Athens by aiding Sparta. Yes, indeed, Athens and Sparta 
were not the bestest of friends at this time. And that will get a little bit more serious later on. So, after his ostracism, Pericles continued promoting populist policies, such as allowing the poor to watch theatrical plays for free, lowering property requirements for the archonship, and providing generous wages to citizens serving as jurymen. His controversial law in 451 restricted Athenian citizenship to those with Athenian parentage on both sides. Pericles' critics attributed the gradual degeneration of the Athenian democracy to his policies. Modern historians argue that Pericles aimed for the expansion and stabilization of all democratic institutions, but there is no agreement among everybody. He did enact legislation, however, to grant the lower classes access to the political system and public offices which were previously restricted. According to one historian, Lauren J. Semons, Pericles believed in raising the demos, considering it an untapped source of Athenian power and a crucial element of military dominance, especially in the Athenian fleet, which was predominantly manned by lower-class citizens. In contrast, his rival Kimon believed that democratic evolution had reached its peak, and Pericles' reforms would lead to the stalemate of populism. Some argues that history vindicates Kimon as Athens, after Pericles' death, faced political turmoil and demagogy, leading to an unprecedented regression. Another historian, Justin Daniel King, suggests that radical democracy benefited individuals, but harmed the state as a whole. On the contrary, Donald Kagan contends that Pericles' democratic measures laid the foundation for unassailable political strength. Kimon eventually accepted the new democracy and did not oppose the citizenship law upon his return from exile in 451. Ephialtes' assassination in 461 marked a turning point for Pericles, allowing him to consolidate power without opposition. As the unchallenged leader of the Democratic Party, he became the unquestionable ruler of Athens maintaining his authority until his death in 429. During the First Peloponnesian War, triggered by Athens' alliances and Sparta's reaction to them, Pericles undertook military campaigns. In 454, he attacked Sicyon, and Arcanania, followed by an unsuccessful attempt to conquer Onidea on the Corinthian Gulf. In 451, Cimon's return from exile led to a five-year truce with Sparta, indicating a shift in Pericles' political strategy. 
The two may have struck a power-sharing deal. With Pericles handling interior affairs, and came on leading the Athenian army abroad, challenging the perception of Pericles as the guy with all of the good military ideas. Heading into the mid 450s now, which witnessed Athenian interventions in Egypt and Cyprus where Pericles played a significant role. Although debates persist about the nature of the peace of Callias and its impact on the Athena-Persian relations. Some scholars argue that a peace treaty with Persia was first ratified in 463 BC, while others propose a later date, around 450 or 49. It is suggested that Pericles utilized Callias, Himon's brother-in-law, as a symbol of unity, and employed him in negotiating crucial agreements. These events illustrate the complex political landscape and strategic considerations that defined Pericles' leadership during this tumultuous period. In 449, Pericles proposed the Congress Decree, advocating a meeting of all Greek states to address the reconstruction of temples destroyed by the invading Persians. The Congress, however, failed due to Sparta's opposition to Pericles' ideas, and Pericles' motives continued to remain in the debate stage. Some suggest fostering a Greek confederation, while others argued for asserting Athenian preeminence. The latter of these ideas was certainly not one that was popular among the Spartans. One historian, Terry Buckley, proposes the objective was a new mandate for the Delian League and tax collection. Perhaps so. But, like with modern pol politics, usually when they write a new rule, it is generally not without its own baggage. For example, new legislation on tax or some internal policy will have lots of small details snuck into it, which of course leads the other party to reject the proposal. Not a new thing at all. In 446 BC, Euboa and Megara revolted, prompting Pericles to take action. Though Spartan invasion led to his return, Pericles diffuse the situation through bribery and negotiation. An audit of all this conducted later on questioned a ten-talent expenditure, ostensibly for a serious purpose. Serious purpose, of course, being the bribery. And ten talents is quite a good sum. Despite the auditors acknowledging the bribery, the crisis ended with a thirty years peace. Athens relinquished mainland possessions since 460 BC, and both Athens and Sparta agreed to not lure each other's 
allies. Well, it didn't really last as long as they all thought it would. In 444 BC, a fierce struggle unfolded between the conservative and democratic factions in Athens. Thucydides, an ambitious leader of the conservatives, accused Pericles of profligacy, challenging his expenditure on the ongoing building plan. Now, initially gaining favor, Thucydides managed to incite the Ecclesia against Pericles. However, when Pericles addressed the assembly, his resolute arguments turned the tide. Pericles proposed reimbursing the city for questionable expenses from his private funds. That's right. He was putting his hand in his own pocket. There's inscriptions we have with a dedications in his name that we have uh, ready to look at as evidence of this in our modern day. This proposition, of course, was very popular and received a standing applause. Well, Thucydides couldn't compete with that, and he was rather unexpectedly defeated. Better luck next time. In 442 BC, the Athenian public voted to ostracize Thucydides for ten years, restoring Pericles as the unchallenged ruler of Athenian politics. This was when Pericles aimed to solidify Athens' dominance over its alliance and assert its preeminence in Greece. While the transformation of the Delian League into an Athenian empire had begun before Pericles, Pericles was the one who expediated and finalized the process, really put that mint leaf on the side, the icing on the cake that the Delian League needed to become the empire. Now this shift toward an empire may have been prompted by Athens' defeat in Egypt and subsequent challenges to its Aegean dominance, which of course led to revolts by its allies like Miletus and Erythrae. Well, Athens could not tolerate things like this. In response, Athens, either genuinely fearing for its safety, or simply as a pretext to control the League's finances, transferred the treasury from Delos to Athens in 454. By 450, Athens had quelled revolts and restored its rule over all of the allies. Clearchus proposed the coinage degree around 447, imposing Athenian silver coinage, weights, and measures on all of their allies. Pericles then utilized the alliance's treasury to fund his ambitious building plan, including the Periclean Acropolis with the Propylaea, the Parthenon, and the golden statue crafted by Phidias, a friend of Pericles. In 449 BC, Pericles proposed a decree allowing the use of 9,000 talents for the extensive rebuilding of many Athenian temples. 
While some criticize this use of the Alliance's treasury as one of the largest embezzlements in world history, it certainly left us with many remarkable artistic creations of the ancient world. So I'd say that it was probably worth it. Pericles, after the ostracism of Thucydides, was re-elected every year as the de facto ruler of Athens. In 440 BC, the Samian War emerged as a significant event before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Samos and Miletus clashed over Priene's control, leading to a Milesian plea to Athens. When Samos rejected arbitration, Pericles dispatched an expedition defeating Samos in a naval battle and imposing Athenian rule. Subsequent revolts in Samos and Byzantium were quelled by Pericles' forces, who led Athens' fleet in Pontus, fostering friendly relations with other Greek cities. Internally, Pericles fortified Athens with the Middle Wall and established new clerics in Andros, Naxos, Thuri, and Amphipolis between 438 and 36. It was around this time that Pericles faced personal and judicial attacks just before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. His close associates, best buddies that he had, Aspasia and Phidias, were accused of embezzlement and impiety, and Aspasia faced charges of corrupting Athenian women. Phidias died in prison though debate still surrounds his involvement in later projects. Anaxagoras, another friend who we have already mentioned, was attacked for his religious beliefs, which were quite avant-garde. It was not the most popular thing to question the orthodoxy, and that was exactly what Anaxagoras was doing. The Ecclesia also questioned Pericles about his use of public funds. All of this created quite a bitter experience. Despite the acquittal of Aspasia due to Pericles' defense, the accusations left a lasting impact on him. And Pericles, fearing trial, led Athens into the Peloponnesian War, facing an awkward situation as his preeminence was seriously shaken for the first time in over a decade. Now, on to the Peloponnesian War, which was, no doubt, the defining experience of the life of Pericles. The causes of the Peloponnesian War have been debated, with some ancient historians, including Plutarch, outright blaming Pericles and Athens for the whole thing. Plutarch suggests that Pericles and the Athenians incited the war with arrogance and a love of strife. Hmm. Maybe. Thucydides also hints at Athenian power and growth as a reason. 
but he is criticized for potential bias against Sparta due to his admiration for Pericles. As we said, they were best buddies. Pericles believed the war against Sparta, driven by Sparta's envy of Athens' preeminence, was all but inevitable. He sent troops to support Corcyra against Corinth, leading to the Battle of Sibota. Subsequent conflicts at Potidaea and the Megarian Decree further strained relations with Sparta, who were not known for their patience. Pericles, well, he was the one who breached that thirty years' peace with his signing of the Megarian Decree, justifying it as a response to Megarian impious behavior. Sparta, therefore, demanded concessions, including the expulsion of Pericles. Well, all of this led to quite a standoff between the Athenians and the Spartans. Pericles advised against yielding, fearing further demands. War ensued, as Athens was unwilling to submit to coercion, and Pericles prioritized maintaining strength to prevent revolts in the empire. In 431, as peace became precarious, Spartan's king, Archidamus II, sent a delegation to Athens, demanding their surrender and submission. Pericles, having passed a resolution against welcoming Spartan emissaries due to prior hostile actions, denied them entry and told them to go home. What a wasted trip. With negotiations rejected, Archidamus decided to launch an invasion of Attica, but when he got there, he found it completely deserted, and he was quite confused. Pericles, anticipating Sparta's strategy, had evacuated the entire population within Athens' walls. Pretty smart. The move was, however, pretty challenging, requiring rural residents to abandon land and ancestral shrines. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Pericles reassured his compatriots, offering his property to the city if the enemy spared his farms. Expressing concern that Archidamus might refrain from plundering his estate for political reasons. In the face of the Athenian outrage over the pillage of their farms during the Peloponnesian War, Pericles maintained his strategy, despite mounting pressure. And not just from the Spartans, there was a lot of pressure from the Athenian side. He refrained from immediate action against the enemy, and avoided convening the assembly, fearing a rash challenge to the formidable Spartan army. Pericles lacked formal control over assembly scheduling, relying on the respect he commanded from the Pritanis. As the Spartan army lingered on in Attica, 
Pericles dispatched a fleet to plunder the Peloponnesian coasts, and tasked the cavalry with guarding ravaged farms near the city walls. Well, eventually, Spartans got a little tired of all this. After the enemy withdrawal, Pericles proposed a decree earmarking 1,000 talents and 1,000 ships for defense against naval attacks, with any alternative proposal risking death. In the autumn of 431 BC, he led Athenian forces into Megara, followed by his poignant funeral oration the following winter, commemorating Athenians who died for their city. In 430, undeterred by the second looting of Attica by the Spartan army, Pericles insisted on his initial strategy, opting not to engage in direct battle. Leading a naval expedition, he commanded 100 Athenian ships to plunder the Peloponnesian coasts again. Well, prior to the ship's departure, an eclipse of the sun frightened the crews. But Pericles, armed with astronomical knowledge from Anaxagoras, explained the whole thing to them and reassured them. No doubt, some of them still remained quite superstitious. The summer of the same year brought an epidemic, believed to be typhus, or perhaps typhoid fever, causing widespread devastation in Athens. The city's suffering intensified public discontent, compelling Pericles to deliver a final and emotional speech in defense of his own leadership. Now, although he temporarily quelled resentment, his internal adversaries succeeded in stripping him of the generalship and imposing a fine on him, estimated between fifteen and fifty talents. It's very hard to recover from that one. Cleon, a rising figure in Athenian politics, was noted as the public prosecutor in Pericles' trial. What a career move for Cleon! Nevertheless, within just one year, in 429, the Athenians not only forgave Pericles, but also re-elected him as the military strategist. He was reinstated in command of the Athenian army and led all of its military operations during that same year, having once again under his control the levers of power and influence. In that same year, however, Pericles witnessed the death of both Paralus and Xanthippus, his legitimate sons from his first wife, in that epidemic of typhoid. His morale undermined and overwhelmed with grief, Pericles wept copiously for his loss, and not even the companionship of Aspasia could console him. He himself died of the same plague later in the year. 
just before his death. Pericles' friends were concentrated around his bed, enumerating his virtues during peace and underscoring his nine war trophies. Pericles, though very much dead to the world at this point and barely conscious, heard them and interrupted them, pointing out that they forgot to mention his fairest and greatest title to their admiration. He mustered the strength to utter the sentence. No living Athenian ever put on mourning because of me. Perhaps this was a reference to not wanting to engage in direct combat with the Spartans. Looking back, perhaps being the military strategist, if he was to lose a battle against the Spartans, then he would certainly be remembered as the man who was defeated, rather than all of his other accomplishments. Perhaps there's something to that. Pericles lived during the first two and a half years of the Peloponnesian War, and according to Thucydides, his death was a disaster for Athens, since his successors were inferior to him in every which way. They preferred to incite all the bad habits of the rabble, and followed an unstable policy, endeavouring to be popular rather than useful. Well, I'm glad that our modern-day politicians don't do that. I'm joking. With these bitter comments, Thucydides not only laments the loss of a man he admired, but also heralds the flickering of Athens' unique glory and grandeur, which he now thought was flickering dimmer and dimmer. Well, what did you think about our friends Thucydides and Pericles? and all the rest. It was certainly a life worth living. Thank you for joining me again every single day I make these videos. And it's good to see you if you are a returning viewer. If you've enjoyed it, leave your comments down below. Tell me what you thought of Pericles. Like the video for the algorithm and subscribe if you have not done so yet. And most importantly, make sure that you have a day full of peace and you take it easy. Good night everyone. See you next time.